We tried to think about the most primitive information we have. Regarding our, our extraordinary experience is that I think we choose the fact that all humanity has always been born naked, absolutely helpless for months, and though with beautiful equipment, as we learn later on, no experience, therefore absolute ignorance. That's where all humanity has always started. And we've come to the point where in our trial and error, finding our way, stimulated by a designed in hunger, designed in thirst. These are conscious inputs, designed in procreative urge, we have plus an enormous amount of, as we learn later on, designed in automated <laughs> processing of, of the interrelationships of our, all the atoms in our organism. We start in then with the, a consciousness of the hunger, <laughs> giving a drive to go after, <laughs> and to seek, to experiment. Man having then <coughs> no rule book, <laughs> Nothing to tell him about that universe has had to really find his way entirely by trial and error. He had no words, had no experience to assume the other person had an experience. He had at first a very incredibly limited way of communicating. We now know human beings being on our planet for probably three and a half million years, with, as far as we can see, not much physiological change, pretty much the same skeleton. And I, what we can learn of human beings in their earliest recorded communicating in, in an important degree, people in India 5,000 years ago, China 5,000 years ago, were thinking very extraordinarily well, in the terms of what, anything we know about our experience, the way we've been able to resolve the experiences into the discovery of principles that seem to be operative in our universe. I'm, I'm astonished at how well the early Hindu Chinese thinker, how well he was able to process his information in view of the very much very limited amount of information humanity had as of that time com in, in comparison to anything we have today. Just making a little jump on information, as we, as humanity on board of our planet, entered into what it called World War I, <laughs> these scientists around the world have ways of reporting to one another f officially in the, Chemists have what they call chemical abstracts. The chemical abstracts are methodical publication of anything and everything any chemist finds that he publishes information regarding it which comes to chemical abstracts. <coughs> As a world entering World War One in the twentieth what's recorded in the twentieth century, it's a very arbitrary kind of a counting matter, we had some Hundred, I think it was hundred. I'm doing this off the top of my head, my, my memory. About 175,000 known substances, possibly almost a quarter of a million substances by the time the United States came in the war, known to chemistry. But we came out of World War One with almost a million substances known. By the time we entered World War Two, we were up into 10 million. And we've come out of it now where we, the, the figure is really getting me astronomical. <laughs> we can't really keep track of the rate which we're discovering more. Just talk about differentiable substances, <laughs> the chemically distinct from one another. Those, those are typical of the information. Really, it's a, it's a, it's a bursting, bursting rate now in, in, in relation to just 
I'm speaking in relation to my own life. One, one life and the, and, the, and the extraordinary numbers of lives there must have been on board of our planet. That the information is in, in multiplying that rate during just one lifetime <laughs> indicates that something is going on here right now that is utterly unprecedented and we're in such indication of acceleration <laughs> of experiences human beings, the integration of the accelerated, the experienced to produce awarenesses that are indicative of humanity going through some very, very important kind of transition into some kind of new relationship to universe, I'd say. The kind of acceleration that occur after the child has been formed in the womb, <laughs> taking the nine months, and, and, and then suddenly begins to issue from the, from the womb <laughs> out in, into an entirely new world. I think we're, we're apparently coming through out of some common womb <laughs> of designedly permitted ignorance, <laughs> given faculties which we gradually discover and learn to employ by trial and error. <laughs> and we're at a point where I've, I now have what would also seem absolutely incredible to generations before. I've now completed 37 circuits of our Earth, kind of zigzagging circuits, not, not straight around, not tourists, just kind of, kind of responding to requests to, to appear here and there to lecture at universities or to design some structure, whatever it may be. So <clears throat> that, that, that is in the everyday pattern that, that I'm circuiting that earth. Certainly makes it in evidence that we are dealing in a, a totality of humanity, not the, or up to, up to my generation, completely divided humanity spread very far apart on our planet. My father was in the leather importing business in Boston, Massachusetts, the United States. And he ported from two places primarily, the Buenos Aires and the India for bringing in leathers for the shoe industry, of, of, which was set at that time in, in the Boston area. And his mail, or a trip that he would like to make to Argentina, took two months each way. And his trips to India and the mail took exactly three months each way. And it was very, seemed absolutely logical to humanity when early in this century, Rudyard Kipling, the English poet, said, East is East and West is West, and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> the, the very, very rare matter for any human being to make such a travel as that, taking all those months. There were not many ships that could take him there. All that has just changed in my lifetime to where it is a, <coughs> I'm not just one of a very few making the circuits of the earth, but I'm, I'm one of, of probably getting to be pretty close to 20 million now who are making, living a life like that around our planet. And very much the whole young world doing so. I, I keep meeting my students at various universities from around the world, halfway around the world again. They're, they're, they're all getting to be living as world people. So this is a very sudden emergence into some new kind of relationship to our universe is being manifest. None of it was planned. There was nobody in the time of my father, my mother, as I was brought up, the pro prophesying any of the things I just said. The year I was born, Marconi invented the wireless, but it did not get into any practical use until I was 12 years of age when the first steamship had, sends an SOS that's in distress by wireless, to so think of it great many miles and the world began to know the ship was in distress you know, and ships began to rush to its aid. <laughs> Absolutely unexpected. My, my father and mother would say, wireless, such nonsense. And when I was three, the electrons discovered and nobody talked about that. There wasn't in any of the newspapers or nobody's interested in electrons. Didn't know where this electron was been discovered. I was brought up to the humanity would never get to the North Pole. <laughs> absolutely impossible, and never get to the South Pole. And our Mercator maps didn't even show anything up here. The, 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 the northernmost points were very rugged, r r kind of a line, but you didn't see it, know anything up beyond that. When I was 14, man did get to the North Pole, and I was 16, he got to the South Pole, so the impossibles were happening. Like all other little, little boys, I was making paper darts which you could make at school, but boys must have been making them for a very long time. And we were hoping we might be able to get to flying. But the parents, your parents say, 
Darling, very, very, very amusing for you to try that, but it's inherently impossible for a man to fly. So when I was seven, the Wright brothers suddenly flew. <laughs> and I, I'm, I, my memory is vivid enough of seven to remember that the, for about a year, the engineering societies were trying to prove it was a hoax. It was absolutely impossible for a man to do that. So then, not only was that, that radio, but when I was 23, which is, you think, I guess many in this room are not 23 yet. <laughs> when I was 23, the human voice came over the radio for the first time. <laughs> and that's an incredible matter. When I was 27, we had the first licensed radio broadcasting. <laughs> When I was 38, I was asked to go on a, an experimental TV studio program in New York where the Columbia Broadcasting had 70 sets, which were in the in various scientists and their board of directors' homes, and, and they had experimental programs going out, and so I, they didn't have any money for paying anybody. The man who ran it, Gilbert Seldes, a friend of mine, ran the studio, and so I often appeared on his program, but we don't have television operating in the United States until after World War II. So we were talking about, I was, I was 40, 45 when we had our first television. So this was very, could be more recent matter. And yet, and nobody thought at that time we are going to have, they didn't know you were going to have transistors. They didn't know you were going to have Man was going to have satellites going around the earth. We didn't know we were going to have radio relay satellites that we were going to be able to have programs coming to any coming out of any part of the earth, go any other part of the earth. Absolutely. Not one of these steps was ever anticipated by any of the others. So that having experienced that, I also have experienced living with my fellow human beings who I find no sooner has it happened than he said, I knew it all the time. I'm not one of those to be surprised. I was sort of in on it, you know. I was a little bit responsible. There is, a, there is a strange vanity of man, and I think the vanity that he has was essential to his being born naked and helpless and having to make the fantastic number of mistakes he had to make in order to really learn something. And I think he'd been so disgruntled, so dismayed by the, the mistakes and the errors that he would never been able to carry on. He would just been absolutely discouraged, so he was given a strange vanity to say, continually sort of make him a self-exempt, <laughs> and he was, he, he was some kind of privilege and, and or always in. And he was able to then quite clearly deceive himself a great deal. So I find everybody today, so go, get, get in the moon, anybody do that, that's absolutely simple and logical. Now, there, it is obvious and simple and logical, provided you were born, and this has happened in your lifetime, you can see how it happened. I began to realize with that rapid changing going on, which was, I was anti uh, not anticipated, <coughs> that what people call natural when I was young, the natural related to a state before these great changes occurred, where we was, were supposed to stay we were inherently remote from other human beings. No way you could get the other human beings. And all the custom been developed over millions and millions of years of, of tribes and, and com little communities being isolated one from the other. The, how you got on with one another, seeing everybody, you saw everybody a great deal all the time. The conditions that were really brought, brought about by that constant proximity brought about human behaviors, which we have now rules and everybody said that the older people say that's where you carry on that are really no longer germane to the c conditions that are prevailing and i began to realize that this that chris is to me having been born before flying for the wright brothers it to me it was a very extraordinary matter that man could fly <laughs> and certainly his first flying was fraught with a great deal of danger. And you admired very much the people who were able to, to accomplish it without, without fa failing. 
And <coughs> my first automobiles that I had, my first automobile, the, the automobile tires with my first car would probably blow out within 100 miles. You were, you were stopping really very, very frequently getting out and taking off that tire and repairing it, the ways of vulcanizing it and getting back on. We didn't have the easy mounting tires we have today. It was a very great task to do it. The engine continually broke down, brakes burnt out and wore out very rapidly. So that driving a car, doing your own cracking and cleaning your own spark plugs and often taking out the spark plugs and priming it with gasoline so you get the engine going, these, these, you, you're with your machine. <laughs> and because you, if you were in it, you knew how relatively unreliable it was. <coughs> and therefore, you drove with great caution. <coughs> I still drive in the terms of, of brakes that, that fade out. And I allow, allow certain distances. I'm, I find my space that I'm allowing to the next car being and inviting young people who have good brakes and assume that they're going to have good brakes that they can they have to drive into that spot for, with great safety. Now, that would be typical, really, of the, of the difference between people born under one set of conditions and those born under others, what seems safe, what seems logical. It's a very amazing matter to me when my own daughter, Allegra, was born the year that, that Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic Ocean but flying was still a very infrequent experience for the, the average human being to view an airplane actually in flight. You went to air meets, you knew that there were, were, there were battles of, of, of half a dozen planes over Europe during World War I, <coughs> but the Lindbergh flight was great news to everybody. The biplane was still the major ship and I was feeling my child in a baby carriage in Chicago's Lincoln Park in 1927, and she was lying on her back looking at the sky, and suddenly a little biplane went overhead. And it was a very extraordinary matter to have an airplane show up over, over Chicago. And I said, isn't this amazing? My daughter is born with an airplane in the sky. To her, an airplane will seem very logical. Her daughter was born 21 years ago, and she was born in, in New York, and her, her father and mother took her to, this my granddaughter, which took her to their new home on a <coughs> place called Riverdale, just north of Manhattan Island, across, across the bridge in north of Manhattan Island, to get quite high land, it was called Riverdale, it's quite high. And they, there was that old wooden house at about the highest point there, and three-story house, and my daughter and her husband had a, a, an apartment on the top floor of that wooden house. Had old-fashioned glass porches on it, and <clears throat> the, my granddaughter lying in her crib was right the, right, coming right over Riverdale with the LaGuardia field traffic, all the, all the westbound flights flying in the prevailing so southwest or westerly winds took off right over their house so that literally every 30 seconds my granddaughter would hear going over the roof and everybody say airplane to her. It was not surprised the first word my granddaughter said was not mom or dad but air. <laughs> and the parents and, and uncles and aunts and grandparents would take, take her out in their arms onto the glass porch. She was born in the fall, late fall of the year. The, the leaves were off the trees in New York. She saw, and they they get out of the glass porch and point to the airplane, and she saw literally thousands of airplanes before she ever saw a bird. To her, an airplane in the sky was much more normal than a bird. And looking from that glass porch down the the west side drive of New York went by in a, in a, in a came over the bridge and went through a, 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 a valley just below their house. She, she saw millions of automobiles in this first year, and <coughs> the children's books that she was given 
where our farm pigs, horses, ducks, and, and all the things that I was brought up with, which seemed absolutely normal to me, because the grown-ups then, these are outside the house, and they kept pointing at them, but my granddaughter had never seen any such thing. She'd seen all those airplanes, those automobiles, and, and a picture of her was about the same as a picture of a polio, vi polio virus. She saw that the grown-ups were enjoying showing to her, so she would laugh along with them. It was absolutely pure cartoon. Now, this is this is a way in which well, really, his has been changing, and the the publishers hadn't ca caught on to that kind of a change. That they were still publishing what was called a children's child's book. And I'll grant there are plenty of people who, who might have been born where there still were some ducks and pigs, but but it was not the the pre prevalent condition anymore, because during following World War One, the enormous capacity to produce machinery occurred, and farm machinery was developed in a very big way, and began to do the work on the farm more readily than the human beings could with their muscle, and the people used to have to be where the food grew or they, wouldn't, they would perish. But suddenly there was refrigeration, there was canning, the food could reach them any distance, and they weren't needed on the farm to produce the food, so people were all flowing in the city. So this my granddaughter's experience was, pretty, was really the dominant experience, the, by far the majority experience, that she would never have seen these things in that farm book. So I now assume that what, when people say something is natural, natural is the way they found it when they, they, when they checked in to the picture. And this picture has been changing incredibly rapidly, and, and with the society in general going along on, on all the old rules of, of cities and, and customs where you're seeing a whole lot of each other which are really irrelevant and so that's one reason why then the young people of our day began to see things very very differently from the parents and really to realize that the long traditions and customs were really no longer appropriate and wasn't a matter of unfriendliness of a, of a young generation with an older generation just simply that the new, new generation was being born into a new natural, which was absolutely unnatural to, to the, to the grown-ups. That's enough of what, what I'm saying to introduce the concept of there being very large pattern changes affecting the lives of human beings on board of our planet that were not in any way anticipated by any of the humans, Yet they, they are overwhelming and would have to be really read in the terms of being evolutionarily, evolutionary, and that universe apparently had it in universe. This was, if you were the first time you were ever a lily, you might assume that you're just going to be a seed and not realize you're going to then grow up with some green leaves. Then you don't know, all of a sudden you're going to start a white, beautiful bell-shaped flower. And you don't know they're going to have steam in it, and you, each of these things are a surprise. So that I think humanity, as a whole, is going through a great transition, which is probably just as superbly designed as, as is the <coughs> organization of, of the human, the, the human, the human uh, uh, chemistries and, and the sociability, the sociabilities of all the all those atoms that, of which we uh, are comprised, and. I, my whole thinking out loud with you <laughs> from now on is going to relate to seeking for more and more of these large patterns that are operative, which get to become deprecated by human beings very rapidly because they don't like to seem to have been caught by surprise. And because of that vanity factor, and not too easy to make humanity comprehend as possibly readable and significant and predict other such ways to come about. Again, I find human beings really the news that we now are sharing around the world, which all of the world finds disturbing, reporting everybody around the world is aware of troubles of other peoples as they never were before. 
they had troubles before, but they're never so aware of the other people's troubles. So we have an awareness of a total, totality of great trouble. <coughs> and I think human beings' vanity factor, making them really feel, I am, I am solely responsible how this is going to come out. And uh, I can then deputize my, my authority to one political leader, and it's up to him to really get us out, or, or half a dozen that we, that we elect and, and expect performance, as if human beings really can master and understand in a great way that I feel they do not. I think, uh, to me, it's been clearly manifest that we've been very, very innocent, and that we, we do <coughs> respond, we have to respond to the environment, whatever the environment is doing. And and we can only do, I, I say, I, I don't have a word for instance, artificial, I don't have a word unnatural. I say, if nature permits it, it is natural. If nature doesn't permit it, you can't do it. You not, may not be familiar with the fact that nature allows that. But the fact that your unfamiliarity doesn't make, make it unnatural. And if it's unfamiliar to us, we tend to say it's artificial or unnatural. So I'm, I'm going to have, I'm going to, to review two or three ways in which I discipline myself to try to get myself thinking in a little more adequate manner concerning, concerning what we know of, of our universe and what May, what may be going on in a larger way, and to try to get things a little better proportion. As for instance, I would like to have a picture of the of the some uh, uh, Milky Way great galaxy. May I have may I have that this picture, please? And here is we're looking at a an array of stars. You can see the Milky Way running through the stars. The, numbers, the number of stars we're looking at is about 18,000. <laughs> and they, const, they comprise they're approximately one six millionth of all the stars in our Milky Way galaxy. We now know, uh, and we've been able to get our, our great telescopes <laughs> trained on other galaxies and so forth, we now have taken photographs and are aware of a, a billion such galaxies of a hundred billion stars each. This picture are the we're looking at a at a at a galaxy very far away. May I have this, may I have that next picture? And we're looking at a an exploding phenomenon. This looks to all. I spoke about those hundred million, a million galaxies of hundred million stars each. Ninety-nine point nine percent of them are invisible to our naked eye, but their sizes are of great, great magnitude. Get a little idea. Our own star, Sun, <coughs> is a is. Our, our, our own Earth eight, one eight thousand miles diameter, and the diameter of the of the sun is just a hundred times that. And so our little, little little Earth looks very tiny against that enormous big ball. But our star Sun is a small star. We, most of you are familiar with Orion's Belt, and in Orion's Belt, one of the two bright stars is reddish in color, and this is Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse's diameter is greater than the diameter of the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So that's a good sized star. So we are a, a little planet <coughs> of a rather inferior star, <coughs> which is one of a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. And <coughs> we know of a billion such galaxies. So we get an idea. Our little, our little planet, and you, you and I are utterly invisible on it. We take pictures of, of our planet coming in from the, sun, from the moon, when you see through the cloud cover, you can see the blue of the waters and, the, and brown of the land. You can't make a human being. You can't even make out a mountain, let alone a human being. There's absolutely no, no visibility of a mountain because the aberration of the deepest water and the 
five five miles below sea level, five miles above the mountain top, ten miles aberration, and eight thousand miles is so so meager that a polished steel ball would probably be rougher than, than than that. So that we are absolutely invisible on on a really a negligible little little tiny planet of, of a rather negligible star in in which is one a member of a hundred billion. Out of a known billion, billion such to multiply the billion times a hundred billion, get an idea. Now, as we look at things at great distance, and this picture that, that I have of, of the, this is of a bursting phenomena in the heavens, which looks like a tiny little light and keeps remaining like a tiny light, but it's such a distance, and the distances involved are so great. This particular phenomenon is expanding at a velocity of three million miles an hour. This is the distance between the Earth and, and the Sun, 92 million, so that in, in 30 hours, just a little over a day, this expands at a complete distance between the Earth and, and the Sun. And yet it remains to, for, for the thousands of years we may be looking at it, like a little tiny speck there in the sky, to get a little sense of the size and the deceptiveness to us that we, in, the, in the magnitude of the information we're really dealing in today. I'm quite confident in it. We, and this, this is then just as far as you and I have been able to, and I say you and I, I mean all our fellows, the, the human beings have been born naked, helpless, and finally have discovered principles of refraction of light and, and have developed the telescope and, and have been able to make a sweep out. We, we're, able to, we're getting information, tiny as we are. We have information of, of approximate spherical sweep out of, of observation of a 11 and a half billion light year radius. And light year is six and a half trillion miles, so we get to. Eleven and a half billion times six and a half trillion get an idea of the the distance you and I are getting information from reliable information. We get the rate at which this thing is expanding, and we get we through the spectroscope we've learned about refraction of light, and through the spectroscope we're able to take the light from all all those observations, and each chemical element has its unique frequencies when incandescent, and been able then to. Little human beings on our planet have been able to take the inventory, the relative abundance of chemical elements in the sweep out of a 11 and a half billion year observation. That we have that kind of capability, despite our absolutely negligible magnitude physically, that we can deal with our minds in such and such magnitudes and do so quite reliably. Gives a hint that the human being must have some very great significance in our. In, in, in this scheme, because we don't know of any other phenomena that has this mind, the human mind. And because what I talk about is discoverable only by virtue of the mind. All there are a great many creatures that have brains, and all the creatures that have brains. Disclose that the brains are always and only synchronizing, integrating a plurality of information from touchings and smellings and hearings and coordinating those into some composite information that tends to produce images. But the brain is always and only, as each of those senses are, dealing with each special case experience. This is the spell of that one, this is the height of that one, touch, whatever it may be. We find the mind, human mind, able to do something that the brain cannot do. So I differentiate between brain and mind completely. What mind is able to do, human mind is able to do, is from time to time revealing the special case experiences because they are recallable, and the brain is very good about recall. Calling them back, calling them up again. As we review a plurality of those special case experiences, from time to time, mind has 
to it. There's something going on, <coughs> some relationship between the special case experiences that was not being predicted or suggested in any way by any of the special case experiences considered only by themselves. I just take the very strong experience of it while we're dealing in stars of the fact well recorded in the earliest annals of man that he was came aware of there being five lights in the sky, five of those points of light, quite bright ones, much smaller than the sun and the moon. And these five bright ones behaved in ways that all the other myriad of little lights did not. The other myriad of lights stayed in very beautiful constant patterns, as far as human, human beings could see. But five of them moved around, in the, and they were a little brighter than the others, and they moved around in some strange kind of way. And they, would, they, they became, if you kept track of them, they would reappear. And so they, they, had, they had some regularities about them, and so that long, long ago in Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, good recordings were made of these behaviors of what we began, began to call the planets. So there were five special case informations that were doing, there was had some relationship, it seemed, because they were, they were behaving the way nothing else behaved. So they, they were, they differentiated out by this unique behavior. We have the, <coughs> then the human beings gradually acquiring calculating capability. And I'd like to make great note of this. We will go back and talk about it in much more detail later on. But the, if you ever try to do any multiplication or division with Roman numerals, you find you don't get anywhere. So supposing you, you were intrigued by some motions or something like that, you couldn't make any calculation of the Roman numerals. So that no matter how intrigued you might be by the fact that something going on is, well, I'd like to know something about it, you really know where you can calculate. The Arabic numerals came into the Mediterranean world <clears throat> and began to supplant the Roman nobles about 700 A.D. But they would use those at first entirely as shorthand for, say, instead of three marks of the Roman nobles, you just go like that. It was a little quicker. So there was sort of shorthand for, the, for this large, larger scratching. But once you realize that the Roman nobles were used entirely as scoring devices. And a man, you could have a servant who's very ignorant, but you, as you station him, you say, every time one of those sheep go by, I want you to make a scratch. So he kept did it, doing this faithfully, just matching, scoring, matching of experiences. The Arabic nobles, I'm quite confident, were der derived from the invention of the abacus as a calculating device. And if you are familiar with the abacus with having rods and, and beads that slide on them, and you can do it with fours and fives, the different module systems you could use, you would then, if you had handling things, what we call decimally or finger-wise, with five, you'd have fill, fill up a column of five, then you'd knock them back again, empty it, and move one over to, into the next column. And the, the convention is to move the, the, the inc incrementation to leftward. And when you then close out the five and move to, and put the one over the next column to take its place of those five, then you have an empty column. I'm quite certain that the navigators and the, over the great deserts or the navigators of the sea, who did deal in the stars as the only way to give them information about where they are, got, probably developed the first trigonometry and the first important geometrical calculations, did then, <coughs> from time to time, lose their abacus overboard on the ship or in, lost in the sands. But being so familiar with it, they could draw a picture of it. They could see it in their mind's eye very nicely, and they could then manipulate the 
concept of filling up that column and then moving over one, I'm quite certain that the Arabic numerals represented a symbol for the content of the column. And when they moved over and left an empty column, they had to have the cipher. So the, the Arab numerals, Arab, Arabic numerals had the cipher. It's interesting then as the Arabic numerals were first taken over in the Mediterranean world as substitutes for the Roman numerals, the, the cipher had no significance whatsoever because you, didn't, you couldn't eat no sheep, so you didn't have a score for no sheep, so they didn't have any need in the, in the, in the Roman numerals, <laughs> just being strong, for something called nothing. So that the cipher was recognized as being there with the Arabic numerals, but just thought it was a decoration, so it was used like a period at the end of the I'll just put that at the end or something like that. It is a matter of the slowness of, of information gain that there's 500 years between the Arabic numerals coming into the Mediterranean world and taking the, beginning to take the place of the Roman numerals before the significance of the cipher was discovered and published by a Latin in North Africa, in Latin, and showing how it then occasioned the positioning of numbers, the moving of your, of your multiplication over one, one column. And with it came the capability of anybody to calculate. Now calculation had been very much monopolized by the navigator the, the, and the priests who were unquestionably astronomer and navigators who came up on the land. And the, the temporal power had to come to them and they, and they found that the Temple of Power, while it's a strong man, just could not cope with the, the kind of information they, they could uh, obtain by virtue of their calculating capabilities, so they guarded it very carefully. We have the Temple of Power, if you think about a little, something like Italy, where you see all those great castellos, valley after valley, hill after hill, with the castle commanding its particular valley, and you have little kingdoms were all over, the city-state kingdoms were, were everywhere around that Mediterranean world. And the, the, the king or the overlord, whatever he wanted to call himself, would have the people bring in their sheep and their, and their wheat and whatever it may be, their fruits, their, their produce, and they would want to exchange it so they could go home with some of the other produce. And all the exchanging was calculated by the, by the, at the church, the priest would cal did the calculating for them. And he p probably used abacus. But at any rate, the process of having the, the temporal power vested in, in the church, the calculating capability, required then that the church also then, in effect, tax the people for making the calculations. So you, you'd give so many sheep to him and so many bags of wheat to him, but you left bags of wheat and uh, the bags of wheat and sheep out back of the church. So that there was a very large take on the part of the temporal power by, by virtue of controlling the calculation. As a consequence, with the publication of this book explaining the <coughs> way in which you position numbers, the literacy was, was, was rampant, so not too many people could read it. But it became a, very much a threat <coughs> that. Anybody could do their own calculation and not have to go to the authorities to do the calculation for them. So that in many, many of those little kingdoms throughout the, the Mediterranean world, it became a death penalty if anybody caught using the cipher. The word cipher become, has a secret connotation for this reason. Because people use it, they needed to use it. The, the attempt, I've got to do my own calculation, but if I get caught, I'm, I'm, I must be very secretive with it. The, Gradually, the significance of the cipher permeates society, particularly the young student world that was literate. So the students of northern Italy and southern Germany began to realize more and more the significance of that cipher and the positioning of numbers do their own calculation. So <coughs> they, young people's faces are less familiar than the older people's faces, so the young people could get away with what the older people can't. So with approximately <coughs> 500, see, we go... That was, it was 1,200, 500 years after the Arabic numerals come into the Mediterranean world that the treatise had written, that's 1,200, and 300 years later, the, it is impossible to ever again reinforce the prohibition against the use of the cipher. And this 
is a, a wonderful date, 500, we're talking about 1500, 500 years ago. And this is exactly when Copernicus comes in. Here is a Copernicus suddenly with the cap capability to calculate. <laughs> and calculating the positions and, and some of the interrelationships of these, of what we call those planets. He came to the conclusion that our Earth was also a planet and behaving in relation to the Sun the way the other planets were. This opened up a completely new excitation of humanity. Remember now I'm saying, his brain getting all this special case business and mind intuitively stimulated that there must be something going on here. I'd like to find out what it is that is going on. And suddenly we have this calculating capability and Copernicus coming out with a very new, fantastically new idea that we were not standing still with all this show going around us, but that we were one of the planets of that sun. And we have then Tycho Brahe, very inspired by, by, by Copernicus and man of great means and acquired instruments for much better observation. And he had his, his great observer who was, was Kepler. And Kepler then made extraordinary new, much more accurate observations of the planets and began to be able then to say considerable. First place he discovered they were moving in ellipses and not in, in circular orbits. If you yourself have ever made an experiment of just drawing a circle, having a pen and a string and a pencil, you know that you have a single restraint. But if you want to make an ellipse, you have two restraints. So the fact that they were moving in ellipses indicated that there was not only some relationship to the sun, but to some other, possibly some integrated effect of the other of the other uh, of the other planets. And <coughs> Kepler then now had beautiful data which showed that they were a team, all right. They're all going around the sun, but <coughs> they were different sizes. They were different distances from the sun. They all went around the sun at different rates. So the, the team was a very disorderly team. And yet he felt that the, the fact that they were all on one team, it, they, they must have something more about them. But now that he had his calculating capability, he then did what a mathematician can do. He said, I'm going to take, I want to find something common to these. I can't, superficially, there's nothing common to them. They're all different. I'm going to give them an, an amount of time very much less than one orbit <laughs> of, of, this, of the fastest orbiting. So I think, that as, as I remember, the amount of time was 21 days. And now he knew how far they were from the sun, each one. So on the beginning of that 21 days, he's here, and then he knows the exact amount of arc in 21 days. Then he has the radius from the end of that arc back to the sun again. Makes a piece of pie shape. Area. They found the same 21 days. Some of them were short, fat pi, and some were long, thin pi. But because he had the actual mathematical data, he was then able to calculate the areas of the piece of pi. Extraordinary intuition must have made him do such a thing. Must have said, sort of, sort of, well, as long as I have the data, I might as well calculate it. And it was an absolute astonishment. He found the areas were all exactly the same as given amount of time. So while there was superficial difference, I, I, I want you to try to think of yourself being the first human being, having all this stimulation going on for thousands of years, to suddenly realize that hidden in this superficial disorder was the most incredible, elegant mathematical order, absolute coordination. And he would have to reason that if they were touching each other, you could understand how gears could coordinate. But the incredible distance is intervening. How could they possibly coordinate this elegant mathematical manner? But one thing you could say about the, that was that they were these great distances apart, and he knew that if he had a string on a weight on a string and swung it around his head, it was in an orbit. If he let go, it seemed to go off in a line. The fact that they were in orbits indicated there was some kind of a tensive restraint. So he really got down to that. There's a tensive restraint, and it could be that. The other planets got in various positions where there was a there was a composite of their of their their poles to affect bring about this elliptical phenomenon. We have Galileo, like other brains, then 
terribly stimulated by experiences, but suddenly with calculating capability. So he began to measure the rates at which objects would go down inclined planes of different angles and free-falling bodies. And he found these free-falling bodies <coughs> were increasing in their rate of falling. There was an acceleration. And he found the rate at which they were accelerating was actually multiplying the number times itself to the second power rate of acceleration. We have then Isaac Newton, novices stimulated by all the, all the foregoing events of all these other discoverers, and he himself also then with mathematical capability. And he, he, and he had a deep drive to somehow understand that tensive relationship Kepler had discovered. And he, he himself then, like you and I, could swing a weight around his head, and every time he let it go off like that, then the, he sent off a line like that, but the Earth pulled on it and pulled it that way. Quite clearly, the Earth was much more powerful than he was in sending it this way. Isaac Newton then involved his first law of motion. The body would persist in a straight line, except as affected by other bodies. And he said, I see this other body, the Earth, is very, very powerful. Something to do, how much they pull must have something to do with their sizes. And uh, he then said, I am informed by the astronomers and the navigators. We have very good information regarding the interrelationships of the moon and the earth, the tides, the three quarters of the earth that covers the water, how those waters are pulled between by the moon. So that trillions of tons of water being lifted by the moon pull Obviously, a pull between them is something vastly greater than my muscles are involved. So it's something to do with size here. Then Isaac Newton, having evolved his first law of motion, the body would persist in a straight line except it's affected by other bodies. He then conceived hypothetically, uh, which a mathematician can do, with his, he has his calculating capability, the patterns of the heavens were very well charted by now for these, by the astronomers and the navigators. And for any given minute of any, any night of the year, you knew exactly what the patterns would be, what would be in, in zenith over any given point. That's how you can navigate. So Isaac Newton had some very reliable patterns of the heavens to go by for a given time. So he chose a night when the moon would be in the fall, easy to observe, and probably clear clear weather. And then he made an assumption that the Earth would be suddenly stop pulling on the moon. As in effect, he doesn't use those words that you would annihilate the Earth. Therefore, as unless you have that weight and swing around your head, if you let go of it, it goes off this line. So he said, if the Earth suddenly stopped pulling on the moon, it, the moon would go off on a given line. So he calculated what that line would be on that night at that time. And he was able then to pattern it against the heavens. A clearly, a clearly patternable line. Therefore, on that night, at that time, he then measured the rate which the moon was falling away from that line towards the earth. And he found the rate which it was falling was exactly agreed with Galileo's rate of falling bodies. That is, it was, there was an accelerating rate and moving apparently the second power as multiplying the number times itself. Therefore, he said, number one, we will multiply the two masses times each other to get the relative amount of in interpol compared to between any other two objects. And we have the distance between the two will increase the interattractiveness fourfold by the second power. He spoke about he spoke about how it was been in inverse ratio because he spoke about going away. So if you go twice as far away, it's only one quarter of the pull. So he had the inverse ratio of the second power of the relative proximity. There were relatively very few literate people in his day. Very few people really listened to what, what he was saying. But the other astronomers did pay attention. They began then to apply his hypothetical relationship to other astronomical phenomena. Gradually, he began to discover, always in, explain all the astronomical interbehaviors of these remote bodies. So we have then suddenly human mind, all these various minds of the generations, of many generations, stimulated by something going on there between that's not of, 
wasn't in any one of those planets by itself at all. And we have then Isaac Newton finding this interrelationship, which has proved to be absolutely valid and, and holds, as we even get in the microcosm long after when Isaac Newton didn't know we were going to get in there at all, there's no electromagnetics involved. This mass interactiveness is, is operative. Isaac Newton was able to say that these two apples wouldn't pull towards each other. Therefore, you and I on the planet would not tend to think about this inner pull because the, the pull of the earth is so enormous as the friction of the apples on the table complete, prevent any demonstration of any local two bodies pulling towards each other. So one reason to escape maps so long had to be these free, free bodies a great remove that would have to stimulate man to think this way. Now, what I'm coming to then is that there was nothing in the moon in its geometrical dimensions, there was nothing in its chemistry, there was nothing in its electromagnetics that anyway said it was going to attract the Earth. There was nothing the Earth that said the same. It was not until you saw the inner behavior being manifested in free space that you realized something was going on between. Now, this is when, what I said, mind and mind alone has been able to discover relationships that are existing between that are not of any of the special case phenomena. And brain is always dealing in special case. So brains are dealing in special case and mind is dealing in discovering relationships existing between. This is then comes to the word synergy. Synergy means behaviors of whole systems, and a minimum system would be two. <laughs> behaviors of whole systems are predicted by behavior of any of the parts of the system when those parts are considered separately, one from the other. And the word synergy I found going around the world, speaking to, I've, I've spoken to 500, a little more than 500 colleges and universities around the world. The first 300, I checked my audiences, asking how many are familiar with the word synergy, and less than 3%, and popular audiences about 1%. So it became evident to me the word synergy was not popular, but it's the only word that means behavior of a whole system unpredicted by behavior of any of the parts considered only separately. The fact then that the great inner behaviors, in fact, all great generalized principles discovered by science are the our relationships existing between that are not of the parts themselves. That's why these scientific discoveries are few and far apart, because they are, you're always just finding relationships. And these relationships can only and are always be expressed mathematically. They're completely generalizable mathematically. So I find that in the universe is quite clearly the, these important generalized principles which we discover. A, a generalized principle in science is one which no exception has ever been found to the, to, the, to the mathematics of the principle. And a generalized principle then, you, our brains are always dealing in each special case, and each special case is inherently terminal, <laughs> finite, <laughs> centropic, physical. <laughs> Therefore, brain wants to have things begin and end, and brain would like to have a beginning and an end of the universe, a beginning and end of, of, of the world. But mind then discovers principles which are, must have no exception, which means that they're inherently eternal, and not the kind of word that brain is familiar with. <laughs> But it's implicit that they are eternal. They must have never any exception. We find then a plurality of these eternal generalized principles operative. And if you become then preoccupied with the family of known generalized principles, then you become deeply impressed to realize that these being eternal, they're all concurrently operative, and none of them has ever been found to contradict any of the others. In fact, they're all found to be inter-accommodative. Now, they all have absolute regularities, and the regularities are inter-accommodative. When you and I use the word design, we use it to mean a complex in which the, inter the various components are ordered in respect to the one with the other. That's a design in contradiction to randomness. There's a deliberate, deliberate placement and ordering. So I'd say then, Human mind is gradually discovering, if you're looking at a plurality of the generalized principles, a great a priori design of the universe. And that human mind has access to the rules and the, the design of the universe, a little glimpse of it, because we keep pulling the curtain upside, realizing there's a lot more that we don't know. 
what is most impressive really about this whole experience I just gave you of an Isaac Newton or, or, or Kepler is that you ask Mr. Newton what the gravity is, he's able to tell you how it behaves. He said, I can't possibly tell you what it is because there's nothing in any, any data, any, any specification you point to. It says it's going to happen. Absolutely nothing. Therefore, when you come to the great moments, the actual fact of how great generalized principles are discovered, you come to a priori absolute mystery, within which a priori a, a absolute mystery, this most sublime and reliable relationship is, is manifest as existing. So the, 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 uh, to me, the, the, the more intimate you become with the actual working moments of those who made the great discoveries, the more deeply moved you are by an a priori great mystery. I'm, I'm going to uh, have, a, have a break for a little while. I think uh, it's, it's quite hot inside here and, and everybody's getting a, a fairly, fairly affected by, by the heat. So let, let's have a little air. Since the uh, great generalized principles that have been discovered by science are synergetic, I'd like to just think about the word synerg synergy a little more. And I, as I said, I found <coughs> audiences, the university audiences around the world approximately unfamiliar, only 3%, and 1% of the popular audience. Therefore, it's perfectly clear that the word not being popular which would tell me that people are not thinking that there are behaviors of holes unpredicted by behaviors of past because if they did think there were then they would have to find the word to express it and the word synergy is that word the fact is unfamiliar makes it quite clear to me society has become quite content that all you have to know is about parts society has been quite content to be specialized, feeling that the parts are all going to add up, take care of themselves. <coughs> so I'd like to think a little more about that word synergy. The word is the companion of the word energy. En ergi, sin ergi. The ergi, the work, the S-Y-N, and the S-Y-N of synchronization. It's the withness prefix. It's the integrating prefix, as, as the en energy was the separating out, differentiating out. Now, the word energy is very familiar to man, to man because he has been then quite content to separate out. He felt that he gained it by isolating scientifically, discovered. And he has discovered certain amounts by, by, by that. He got a great deal of data by isolating. But he hasn't found these great principles by the isolation. And right. Energy has been a preoccupation of man, and synergy has been really overlooked. But synergy is to energy what as integration is to differentiation. Energy is differentiating out, and synergy is integrating. There is nothing in, in atoms per se that predicts chemical compounding. There's nothing in chemical compounds per se that predicts biological protoplasm. There's nothing in biological protoplasm per se that predicts camel and palm tree and the respiratory exchange of gases between the mammals and, and, the, and the vegetation. In fact, you discover that the larger complex of the universe is never being predicted by the lesser. There's nothing in chemistry of human toenail that predicts human being. So I find then that the, the universe itself is synergetic. It is a great complex of, of generalized principles, each of which is synergetic. So that we really have a synergy of synergy. There is, a, there is, a, there is an exponential synergi synergizing of, of the generalized principles of the universe themselves. Now, quite clearly then, the universe being complex, <laughs> and synergetic, if we were able then to
cope with the totality, <laughs> we might be able to find out about parts. And we have what I call three well-known synergetic strategies of obtaining important information. First is a Greek triangle, where the triangle having six distinct parts, the three angles and three edges. And the known sum of the angles of the triangle, 180 plus, and the any two sides known and, and the included angle known, you can find out you know, half the information, you get the other half. Be able to get half that's all unknown before is a very powerful capability. We find then the <coughs> you can always institute in trigonometry, you can always invent a right triangle in any triangle because you can drop a perpendicular line to a baseline that's going to be 90 degrees. And you can divide any triangle into, into two right triangles. Any other, and with having two rights, you then are able, you know one of those angles is right, therefore gives you a whole lot of information right away, plus 180 degree known. And uh, we'll only have to find out two other items for, in order to be able to, to solve your problems just with the trigonometry. Now, <coughs> there was then the Greek triangle as, as a synergetic strategy, working for the whole, the known behavior of the whole, and known behavior of some of the parts, finding out about other parts. Into the synergetic strategies comes, very sh relatively short time ago historically, Euler. And Euler realized an extraordinary pattern generalization. Euler doesn't phrase it in these words, but, I, but I, I'm, I'm giving you my own phrasing of what Euler said. He said, all visual experiences can be reduced to three fundamental aspects. There are visual experiences of trajectories. Something is in motion, leaves a trail. Or I scratch, that's leaving a trail. Or I leave a deposit of amount of chalk, that's a trail. There are trajectories, and where two trajectories cross, we get a fix. That is a, that is a lo, lo, gives you a lo, lo, location. And if a, then if a line, two lines, a plurality of lines cross, so the same line comes back and crosses itself and has then a perimeter, a closure, then you have areas. And he said lines and areas and crossings or fixes when, are never to be confused one with the other. And all visual experiences are reducible into those three. So you look at any picture you've ever seen, and I will say it does not include the color. It's not, it could be any color. Looking at that picture, you can say, I would consider that a line. That's an outline of a face. Uh, you could decide that this is a point, a crossing and a point would be the same. You say if it's, it's a point, it doesn't have an, it is not an area. But if, it's, if the point is big enough, you think it's an area, you make a line around it. And Euler found that when you then decided what it is you're looking at in the picture, you take inventory, that is a line, that is an area, and that is a crossing. Then he said the numbers of the crossings, which he also, because lines are crossing, they're converging as they cross, they're called, called the vertex. Of their coming towards one another, indicating working towards a point. So he said the numbers of vertexes plus the numbers of areas. If it's a flat picture on the on the wall, will equal the number the number of the lines plus the number one. But if he said if you recognize that a picture on the wall, <laughs> the wall is is a part of some kind of a polyhedral phenomena. <laughs> So if I say then the, the picture, I see the picture then has an edge and a back to it, and these would be very asymmetrical polyhedra, but that whole blackboard and its wheels are such and that. If I then deal in what I'm looking at as a polyhedron, then he said that the numbers of the crossings plus the numbers of areas are equal to the numbers of the lines plus the number two. It would be absolutely constant. <coughs> then he said if you put a 
hold through the system. <laughs> I, I put the hole in a donut, a, a coring an apple. Then the numbers of the crossings are vertexes, plus the number of areas that equal the numbers of the lines. Well, this is a very extraordinary kind of a total capability now. You know, a behavior of a whole, this is all there is, there isn't any more. And if you know, if you know some of that there, you find out the others. Then we have, in chemistry, Willard Gibbs. Willard Gibbs said that crystalline liquids and gases states that these had an interrelationship we call his phase rule, which was very similar then to the Euler. This plus this equals this plus two. And I've now been able, as I will go on with you in, in, in the hours and days to come, I'm going to give you then the topological identification of, of the Willard Gibbs phase rule. That's not the appropriate time for us to do it here, but I, what I'm getting at is I'll give you three grand strategies, synergetic strategies, where you know the behavior of the whole. <laughs> this is everything you observe about the whole, and you know some of the parts, you find out about other parts. Now, this is, this is a very, very powerful matter. I find that our whole education system around the world <laughs> is organized on the basis of the little child being ignorant. <laughs> Assuming the little child that's born is going to have to be taught <laughs> in the sense it's kind of an empty, empty container waiting for information to be given to it from the, uh, 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 the grown-ups. And so the little child demonstrates time and again an interest in the whole universe. The child is very enthusiastic about the planetarium. <laughs> the little child asks most beautiful questions about total universe continually embarrassing the grown-ups who have become very specialized and, and can, can't ask the great comprehensive questions. We find the child then, with his propensity to comprehend to totally, really to be synergetic, that the humans have this proclivity to be synergetic, and yet our education is to say, never mind darling about that universe, come in here and I'm going to give you an A and a B and a C, and then if you learn that, well, I'll give you a D and E and F. You keep adding to the parts. We do what we call building up a body of knowledge, <laughs> a brick on brick. This all both perplexed me and stimulated me into thinking about how we might somehow or other reorganize our self-education. Because education is, in the end, a self-educating. <laughs> the, the experience is stimulate, but then the significance in the experience has to be as, ap, 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 apprehended and then comprehended by the individual. And the synergetic educational system then became of, of great excite, ex, excitation to me, and I wondered where, how we might be able then to it seems logical, if you could, to start with the universe itself. <laughs> Let's start with the whole, <laughs> and then and then then we'll have no 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 variables left out. <laughs> so I felt that I'd have to have a definition of universe. And incidentally, as I disciplined myself along these lines, starting almost half a century ago, I said I must never use a word that I cannot really relate to experience. <laughs> I must be able to define each word that I use. And if I can't, don't have a good definition going back to experience, I must give it up. So I said, I've either got to give up the word universe or define it in a, an experiential basis. Now, the founder, Eddington, defining universe, Eddington defining science. Eddington defining science. And he said, science is the attempt to set in order the facts of experience. The raw material is experience. I found another very great scientist, and I'm quite certain that he was unaware of Eddington's statement. I could not certify this, but, but 
the man was relatively remote, and it was, it was Ernst Mach, the physicist of Vienna. And Ernst Mach, the, phys the physicist of Vienna, is a man who's the name Mach number. <laughs> when we come to ultras ultrasonic speed, was named for, for Mach, Ernst Mach. Mach, the physicist, said, physics is arranging experience in the most economical order. Because the physicist has discovered that absolutely unique to nature is that nature always does things in most economical ways. <laughs> there are many ways of talking about this, the principle of least resistance or whatever, the least effort, but uh, it's, it's always most economical. However, this is not a yes, no, <laughs> stop, go affair. The we find, as you're going to go on with me, that there are a plurality of equi economical <laughs> alternatives uh, op optional to, to every event in the universe. <laughs> There's a plurality of them. But as Marx said, nature will use one, one of those most, e most economical, e equally ec most economical. So the physicist then was concerned with economy of arrangement of experiences, and Eddington, the scientist general, interested in experience, all experiences. And, and he didn't specify, he said, put it, arranging experiences in order. Now, a mathematician such as Boole, Boole developed a concept of mathematicians to a little further degree, where the mathematicians have been able, unable to find any grand strategy approach to gain information from in a logical manner. They find it expedient to then assume the uh, uh, most absurd condition and then gradually eliminate the, the, the improbability of the more, 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 this more absurd, utterly absurd, this is less absurd, to get down to something that might be reasonable, at least as a way of sharpening up this reductio ad absurdum. We have then a bull able to introduce non most not economical orders. <laughs> I just want to understand. The general science might then try to put experiences in order, but they may not be most economical. The difference between the physicist and the, and the mathematician then would be the, the physicist is only interested in those most economical. Because those, those are the only ones who really correspond to the way nature is behaving. The absurd is what nature doesn't do. But it's a good, it's very fortuitous on the part of the, of the mathematician who employs such a strategy. Now, we have Einstein saying the beginning and the end is his experience. The experience is, becomes the, quite clearly, the raw material of all science. And this would mean by, it is experimentally evidenceable. And once you learn how it behaves, you've got to be able to repeat the experiment, and there, there, that behavior is manifest. So that I then felt that it would be very necessary to describe universe in the terms of experience. So I said, what do I mean by the word universe? I said, I must mean the aggregate of all of humanity's consciously apprehended and communicated experiences. That would be the whole raw stuff. What else could I mean? And at first when I said that quite a few years ago, I know I myself and, and many others felt it, maybe it's inadequate. You left something out there. They said you left out uh, dreams. I said no, it's part of. It. I said the aggregate of all of our experience. We we have experienced dreaming. We also experience becoming. We've experienced that the dictionary, the numbers of words in the dictionary increase every day because it's part of our experience. We're continually discovering a further another facet to the information. So. I, I can't find anything that's been really left out of the definition. And if you can find anything, tell me about it. It's already going to be one of our experiences. So that it seems to work pretty well. And having then developed this scientific definition of the universe, I then said, I, I have a way now of dealing in totality. <laughs> it, I know what it is. It, I find it very interesting that Einstein then thought and did define physical universe in contradistinction to comprehensive universe because he differentiated between the physical and the metaphysical. And he said he was only concerned really with the physical.
because the physical is is can be coped with with experimental evidence through re, re, reproduce experiment but i i also say that you and i do have metaphysical experiences he 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 defined science <laughs> about his, his his physical energy physical is energy energy associative and energy dissociative and both turn aroundable <laughs> that the dissociative could become uh, dissociative could become associative the radiation could be reflected re and 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 lands and con reconcentrated and so forth so that uh, Einstein's physical universe consisted entirely of energy, energy associated with matter, energy associated as the radiation, and the and one transformable into the other. We have then the physical universe of Einstein being all energetic. As he said, it used to be called ponderable, that it was weighable. But we find that way, weighing is an effect on of a, of a, of a lever, and there is then gravity can pull, but electromagnetics can pull equally. So when we get in electromagnetics, we simply say that anything that is physical can be identified by moving a needle. <laughs> now we can we can get actually a physical indicator of the presence of the physical, but the. The metaphysical is, 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 does not move needles. <laughs> now, the metaphysical experience is, is, a, is a very profound one. All that's going on in this room with you, between you and I has been metaphysical. <laughs> what we might call understanding is utterly metaphysical. There, there are no arrows, there's no, nothing going on to really to weigh <laughs> or indicate really understanding. I find it's a very extraordinary matter. You're, I can see your eye physically, and your eye will communicate to me as my tongue can wag and, and make sounds in the airwaves, which gives you some kind of words and so forth. But the understanding is not that physical. The, so Einstein did not try to include the metaphysical in his definition of universe, but he defined the physical universe the following way, stimulated by experiences of which had come in great prominence in his time, at the turn of the century, where he was very much impressed by what he called the Brownian movement, this absolute constant motions in the liquids. He was very impressed with black body radiation, but he was particularly impressed by the measurement of the speeds of radiation, both light and, and other forms of radiation, in vacuo, linearly and vacuo, and finding that they were all the same speed. I, I, sign, <clears throat> I want to identify what he thought about these, these, these stimulants that I gave you in the terms of previous thinking proclivities of humans. We have the human beings over great ages seeing smoke, seeing steam in nature, seeing metals melted out of rock, would have a very extraordinary time when priestly, the priest, scientist, undertook to isolate fire under a bell jar because up to this time there had been four mystical elements, the air, earth, water, and fire. And he felt that fire might be a chemical element, and he gave it a temporary working name. And he then set about to isolate this fire under the bell jar. And he weighed the items that he was going to ignite, and then ignited them. And when the fire was over, they found that the products and they are weighed more than the weight of what they'd put in. We have Lavoisier explaining what had happened in the following manner. He said that they had not weighed the air under the jar. Up to this time, all the chemical elements been known to human beings were metals. 
they were iron, copper, silver, zinc, so forth. There were not. There were there were eleven of them, <coughs> and they're very easy to identify. For Lavoisier to say that the nothingness under the bell jar consisted of plurality of invisible chemi chemical elements, and that they, one of them is separated out and joined in with the other inputs of the fire, separating for the other, and he gave it, he gave it the name oxygen. But this was, to me, one of the most extraordinary metaphysical jumps in history for, for a human being to assume that this, the, the, the non-metal nothingness consisted of plurality of something, and something so fundamental as to be actually rated as elements. It was extraordinary conception. He then went on to show the, this exactly, the, the, uh, the oxygen joined with the mercury, you know, mercury oxide. He showed that what we call iron ore was something when the, the oxygen adjoined. You take the oxygen away and there's your iron. He went on demonstrating this uh, oxygen joining. So the combustion really was oxidation. So we have then Lavoisier's explanation then enlightened all those who'd ever had an experience really about metallurgy. <laughs> You'd, you'd had good luck in, in having fire and melting muzzling metals out, but suddenly it gave chemical controls to metallurgy. It also explained what combustion was. It also explained what steam was, because there's water vapor, where he had the associating of, of, of the oxygen. Out of this, you could not have, have avoided inventing the steam engine out, out of the new metal and, uh, and atmosphere of, of, the, of, of science. And the so steam engine came along very shortly. And with the steam engine, the masters of the water-ocean world, three-quarters of it covered the water, with the lands all divided, and the men who had enough power to command the, the carpenters and, and the, the metal workers and so forth, produce a ship and build a great ship, having developed this design of it through in eons of experience with the sea, gradually learning what did constitute a big, sh good, adequate ship, be able to send it to great distances, integrate the resources of the earth, which were very different in the different parts of the world, bring about synergetic interaction of this in one place with another, and suddenly what was at home and didn't seem to have any value at all, suddenly as a very great value. Masters of the water-ocean world that suddenly had steam and didn't have to wait for wind in their sails outperform completely the people who still were just waiting for wind in their sails. We have then the masters of the water ocean world with of great wealth, incredible wealth, saying, you scientists, up to this time, energy had just been some kind of a god. <laughs> some, some, some countries had several kinds of energetic gods, uh, some of speed and, and mercury, whatever it may be, but they have, but they're just gods. And suddenly, you have that energy coming through a pipe with a valve, and you turn it on to do this extraordinary work. What, what other kind of capabilities do you scientists have? This is the first time science really came in, into very important uh, patronage by, by, by great wealth. This really brought about the Royal Society and other equally high-standing scientific organizations in, in the various competing countries of, of Europe to see who was going to control the, the, the water trade. So, so the scientists then giving this money to the scientists, they have been given money, developed then, they identified energy uniquely with the, with the heat, with the fire. Therefore, they developed what they call thermodynamics. And that, with the thermodynamic scientific researching came the great second law of thermodynamics, discovering that the all local systems always continue to lose energy. This phenomenon, entropy. And the energy is given off maybe oddly have been given off in an oddly way in respect to that particular system, but the rate at which it's been given off by another system is a, not another periodicity, and so the two coming together do not necessarily synchronize, so they seem to be producing random randomness in this order. Incidentally, I, I found it very interesting to look up the f first law of thermodynamics as formulated in England. It was that the, the unit of measure of energy should be the British thermal unit, PTU. As a highly political first law, and the the second law was then about 
uh, 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 entropy. Now, we have the time of Newton. So far as the scientists knew, we had instant universe. And, and Newton thought of time as a quality permeating all universe at, 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 at exactly the same, same rate. So that he said, scientists said, as the clouds get out of the way, then the stars are instant stars. There had been a great astronomer, Roma, who, to explain certain astronomical phenomena that he, he observed, had to assume that it could be that light also had a speed the way sound had a speed. And Roma's calculations regarding this were, were very extraordinary. They come in really very close to what was found out experimentally when man on board our planet in vacuo did then, actually with, with mirrors, develop the speed of light experiments. But the scientists were not thinking Roma's way at all. Scientists in general were thinking instant universe. And because the universe was instant universe, then it too was a system. And with the great second law of thermodynamics, then the universe itself must be losing energy. Therefore, the universe is running down. This is the very essence of classical conservatism. The people who thought they were being well informed by science that the universe is but somehow rather had a big bang, and Isaac Newton also, in his first law of motion, said, I, I gave you a body persists in a straight line, but his first sentence, first phrase is, a body persists in a state of rest or in a line of motion, except as affected by other bodies. To Isaac Newton, at rest was norm, and all the, all the motions were abnormal, but somehow rather, Somebody had this big bang, and, and the universe is going to expend its energy, and anybody spends it, it's just going to bring us all to rest a little quicker than rest being death and normal. Uh, it's quicker than dead. We have uh, then, in view of what I've just said to you, Einstein being informed that radiation did have a speed, and astronomers employing us right away discovering that it took light eight minutes to come to us to Earth from the sun. And I'm going to use items that Einstein did not use, but you're very familiar with the Big Dipper, the, the Big Bear. And uh, the, we go in the first star and the end of the handle of the Big Dipper, you're seeing a live show taking place 700 years ago. Excuse me, 75 years ago. We're going to the next hour, at the turn of the handle, you're seeing a live show placing, taking place 100 years ago, and you're getting one more star, and you've got a live show taking place 200 years ago. Is there anything but on the same blackboard? Because 100 years difference at, at six and a half trillion miles each year, you've got an incredible de depth of, of observation where, where the bright brightness makes it seem to be akin in, in that pattern. Then you look at, at Andromeda, and you can see the little few little sparkling lights of a whole of a whole galaxy there. And you're looking at a live show taking place a million years ago. It takes exactly a million years for that light to get here. Come back again to looking at Orion's belt and uh, the Betelgeuse and the other bright star. One is a live show 1,500 years ago, another 1,100 years ago. So Einstein said the universe is an aggregate of non-simultaneous and only partially overlapping energy events. These one, each one of these great energy events, each one has its own duration. They have their beginnings and their endings. So we have then this, to him then, the physical universe was an aggregate of non-simultaneous and only partial, partially overlapping energy transformation events. Now, this is a very interesting kind of a definition because it is also the definition of what you and I would call scenario. In a scenario, we have a man born and then he gets to be daddy and he has children and then he gets to be granddaddy. He overlaps the grandchildren and he dies. There is the introduction of a life and it has it blooms and like there's a star the same and the star has its duration. So there's, there are beginnings and endings of these of these local energy systems. But the energies, Einstein said, I don't think 
that the, in this non-simultaneous universe, that the energies that are being given off by this one might be associating elsewhere. And he said, I see on board of our planet this little, little child is not entropic. This little child gets to be a bigger child, doesn't deteriorate, doesn't come apart. There there's, seem to be organisms where there's a growth and the little, little sapling gets to be the big tree. So I can see then later on when it begins to shrivel and then shrink and it disappears. There's an overlapping. These energies, then he said, there was another great scientist, Boltzmann. And Boltzmann had the feeling, the concept intuitively, that energies then pulsed in our universe. You and I are familiar with our weather, where we we give the weather in the terms of high and low pressures of the atmosphere. And we find that the lows are always exhausting the highs like a vacuum cleaner till they become full, they become the new high and new other lows elsewhere. So Boltzmann had the idea of exporting and importing, that one place becomes exportive, then to find exhaust, then some place was importing all the time, so there's a pulsing of the universe, but the energy is not getting lost. So Einstein said, in contradistinction then, the conservatives who thought the universe was entropic and nothing else, therefore the universe was running down and coming apart. Boltzmann and Einstein then think in the terms of could be that the energies dissociating here are, so, are, are associating there. And so, out of Einstein's expression of, of that uh, powerful working hypothesis, had came very much greater attention to energy accounting. And we have then, as of this century, science having to say there is no experimental evidence of energy either being created or being... We do have the word in science, in physics, of annihilation. And many of the words used by the physicists are ill-chosen, I find. As for instance, the physicist talks about particles and he says, I don't mean about anything at all. This is just an event. But, if, if, but he's so used to a little something being called a particle, he calls it a particle. So I find it's ill-chosen for him to use the word annihilation. His annihilation is, is a, a following kind. I have one rubber glove. There's, not, there's only one rubber glove in the universe here. It's on my left hand. But I start stripping it off my left hand, and finally I'm pulling it, pulling it off like that, just gradually rolling it off. And suddenly it's off my hand, but now the left hand, it fits, it fits the right hand. And so there's the right hand now. You have a right hand, and then the right hand gets an eyelid and has the left hand. One, one is, is, is convex and, and, and assembled and, and focal, <laughs> and the other is, 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 is uh, simply, for, for the moment, invisible. This does not make it annihilated. <laughs> and all, all the annihilations that, that, that physics has are, are of that character, that is, they are reinstatable. In the, uh, you can go from the positive to the negative. So I have Einstein's and thinking and instituting way of thinking, which now, as of the, this point of the, of, of the 20th century, makes it really quite clear, as far as experimental evidence goes, universe is eternally regenerative. Now, uh, we have, as Einstein said, each of the energy events. You know, again, we had this beautiful, the photon, we've gone down to Planck had gone down to a minimum energy package. And it's a finite package. And he said, absolutely discontinuous from the next package. So he said, the universe is an aggregate of finite. <laughs> Therefore, the total is finite. An aggregate of finites is finite. <laughs> but you and I tend to say the the proclivity of man is to say the finite is, is viewable, it is seeable, conceptual. Einstein's definition, which I said comes in the category of scenario, he didn't call it scenario. There have been other scientists who spoke about it as serial universe and so forth, meaning scenario. There was a, there was a very, very fascinating English scientist, uh, philosopher, James Dunn, who wrote this serial universe. Now, scenario, what you think about, is an aggregate of frames. 
and there's nothing in the single frame caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. There's nothing in one single frame butterfly that tells you the butterfly can fly. You have to have a whole lot of frames of butterfly changing and in relationship to the environment to realize they're flying. You find that in scenario universe there's no meaning whatsoever until you get a great many of the special case experiences and there's a little in intuition of some in relationships going on here that's why the scenario is so fascinating because you feel something's there you're looking for those relationships all the time that are being increasingly suggested as as probably present in, in the in the, as one event after another we have then a scenario universe is then non-unitarily conceptual single frames are unitarily conceptual so the universe is defined by Einstein as non-unitarily conceptual so we have him, and it is finite because it's an aggregate of finites, <laughs> and, it, and it is eternally regenerative, <laughs> yet it is non-unitarily conceptual. So when you find yourself asking yourself the question, having heard that uh, the astronomers just found a further out star, when you say, I wonder what's outside, outside, you're asking a sculptural question, a single frame. You, you, you're, the outside means that you do have a, a picture, a single one. And that's like asking which word is a dictionary. It actually is a meaningless question in the terms of scenario universe. Once you realize what it was Einstein was really introducing here. So we have aggregates of finites. Now I felt that I could expand Einstein's scenario of physical universe to also include my metaphysical experiences, because all of those always begin and end. My, my, my information stimulus from the brain are always terminal. So all my inputs are finite. So I said, I'm going to define physical and metaphysical universe, which I'd like to do now if I can, so in order to be able to start with the whole, is then I said, aggregate of all humanity is constantly apprehended and communicated experiences. You communicate yourself or to the others, but the 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 the, the experience is not an, is not in any way it has no meaning until we actually try some kind of communication with it. That is that is its its beginning is a communication. So it is a communication. The experience is a communication. So I said. I think I can combine the metaphysical and the physical by saying it is then the aggregate of all humanities, constantly apprehending communicating experiences, which are an aggregate of non-simultaneous, only partially overlapping events, both metaphysical and, and physical, energetic and, and, and uh, as well as, as metaphysical, weightless. So therefore I said, I see then, universe, all, each one of those metaphysical experiences always begins and ends. It, it, our experience is that way. It's the nature of the special casing that they are t terminal. Therefore, I said, they too are an aggregate of finite. So the universe has to find, both metaphysical and physical combined, is finite but non-unitarily conceptual. So I said, what is then conceptual? And what is thinkable? This brought me then to, I'm now, now pursuing a grand strategy of having been able now at least to get to a definition of universe. So I, which I, I, I got a lot of, of, of actual inputs about what it is, knowing its behavior as a whole, what the whole is, and I'm going to get to learn if I can about some of the parts, about some of the parts. Now, or what other parts do I know something about? Well. I come down, down then to this very extraordinary phenomenon you and I call thinking. Throughout the whole of my thinking out loud with you, you're going to find that I always come back to exper experiential base. I don't have, I don't deal with any axioms. I don't say anything is self-evident. I don't say I, anything I believe. I can't hypothesize <laughs> that this may be what it is the explanation of what it is we're experiencing. But I have to say that is, as a guess, 
is an informed guess. But the, I'll always be dealing in, a, in a, an experiential strategy, and I am now doing everything I can to understand how we can develop a synergetic grand strategy of approaching uh, uh, the approach to problem solving by human mind. Mind. So I said, what is it that I am personally conscious of doing when I say I am thinking? I'm not saying thinking may be a bright light suddenly. We all hear people say, yeah, it's a bright idea. I say, what am I conscious of about this? And all that, so I became, I become really fairly well disciplined in identifying what it is I am experiencing. Now, I call your attention to a common experience of all of us, which is we say, what is the name of that 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 beautiful blonde tall boy, remember? And he did so and so and so and so. Yeah. Great. His name is the tip of my tongue, but it doesn't come right away. And both of us forget we said it. And then tomorrow morning you're very busy with something. In comes your name, Tom Turner, whatever. And you're a little annoyed at the thing. But what we do is ex we both experience that when we ask ourselves questions, we have a, a mechanism that goes back and gets the answer. <laughs> it may be quite difficult to retrieve. You may be hidden, hidden under a lot of other. Other other inf inputs, but it can be. It, we have this mechanism, does it absolutely and expertly. That's a mutual experience. That's one reason why we remember it, because we can check up with each other. It did happen, but we have a, a solo experience. And I also have learned from doing what I'm doing, thinking out loud, and being on the stage many times with large thousands of people out there. And a word doesn't come to me quite right away, because I'm doing that thing out loud, and I have to pull out those word tools that, that I've gradually learned to employ. And one comes so slowly, and I need to say, explain what it is, and I find I can get around it by using quite a few other words to inform you what I'm thinking about. But then just as I'm getting out that way, then suddenly the right word comes to me. I find that there are lags and recall rates which we would not really identify because that name thing seems to come back tomorrow or sometime later on, sometimes today. But such big lags, we haven't been able to say that there's any given identifiable periodicity of lag, a length of lag. lag. However, I've learned that the words that I'm standing on the stage and eating, they're rather frequently used words, and, and uh, every word they use uh, has a little lag, and some of them a little longer lags. <laughs> find the people who are not used to thinking about what it is they're doing when they're thinking and talking tend to go ah, 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 in between, really giving you a periodicity of the lag, of the lag. Now, the point is that I've discovered there's a plurality of lags and rates of recalls, and some of them are really very short, and particularly these ones in relation to the word tools. And the names take longer because the names used to be names of functions, descriptions of, of smite, Smith was smiting and the miller was milling. So you could see that by your experience. It came to very, very quickly. But now when you say miller, he's not doing milling. And it gets to be then just a sound pattern. This Smith is an area of sound. And it's a, a graphing. And so we only have a certain amount of memory cubby holes for this kind of, of non-functional pattern and so they get they get buried very deep like deep like magazines so it takes a long time to go down and pull under on on that stack and, and that that because that cubby hole has been filled up vertically now vertically now now coming then to the idea that there are lags and rates of recall and that there is an inexorable searching that that is is initiated when you ask yourself a question well, I said to you, it's different, but I've asked myself, so I'm going down the street and I say, what is the name of that tree? My mother today gave me the name of that tree. I haven't seen one in a very long time. And then your attention is called to something else, some friend waves from a car and you go on. You ask yourself questions all day long like that.
And when you're trying to go to sleep, sometimes in come maple trees and all that, you wonder why these things keep coming in. And because there's no identified lag of different types, they don't come back on schedule that really makes it possible to say, yes, I asked myself that question yeah, three hours ago. And just look at my clock, sure enough, it's three hours. We don't have that kind of scheduling. So there, there's a heterogene heterogeneity to the rate of recall that does not make us tend to pay much attention to this. We just say, I'm, I'm a little slower. We use such words as that. Now, this is that. Now, I've now discovered what it is what I do when I say I am thinking. I find that I'm, I'm spontaneously, I become spontaneously preoccupied. I don't, I don't do that deliberately. I've suddenly realized that's, that's something I've been thinking about quite a lot. I've, I've put off time and again. I, I really would like to think that out. So I say, I'm going to, I'm now going to accommodate my really pursuing. There's some important relationship going on here, but if I only take a little time, I'm going to find out what understanding means I'm finding the relationships. I'd like to understand what's going on here. So what I do consciously then when I say I'm thinking is that my conscious part is in keep coming messengers with maple trees and things. And I say, that's really very interesting. I, I'm glad to have that. But please wait in the ante room. Don't, don't go away, but wait in the ante room. So my conscious part is sort of holding, holding this interesting but irrelevant information on one side while I parting the grass and finding that path and suddenly that's, I find out what it is I'm looking for. What it is I'm looking for. So my conscious part was dismissing or holding off temporarily irrelevances. Having discovered that my conscious part was then dismissing irrelevances, I then found the irrelevances fell into two main classes. All the experiences which I'm trying to recall and identify to treat in here, all the experiences which are too large and too infrequent to in any way be synchronizable with the magnitude that I'm considering. And all the experiences I've had which are too high frequency, too minute to in any way have mag worthwhile magnitude at the, at, the, at the size of it. So I find that really is tuning. There's a much too greater wavelength and much too smaller wavelength. This is really a discrete one. It's a discrete one. Now, <clears throat> furthermore, about our experiences, I'm dismissing experiences that are irrelevant. So there's a macrocosmic and a microcosmic group. Now, experiences are inherently omnidirectionally observed. That is, our Earth is revolving, you and I are pivoting and revolving, we're looking in all directions. So when I take my total experiences, they are an omnidirectionally position in respect to me. Therefore, the, the irrelevances which are too large and too infrequent, I dismiss outwardly, omnidirectionally. <laughs> and the ones that are too high frequency, too small, I dismiss inwardly. I discover then that the, 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 the consequence of my con conscious subscription intuitively to the, this preoccupation is important and my conscious attempt then to put aside the relevances has then created, taken all my experiences and put them into two main groups, all the experiences outside and all the experiences inside <coughs> and a few of the experiences which are loosely relevant to each other, to each other. I discovered then <coughs> what I call a thought is a relevant set. <laughs> <clears throat> and this relevant set de defines an inside and an outside. -ness. <laughs> and I said, all right, how many stars would it take to produce an inside and an outside? -ness? Oh, two stars do not. <clears throat> they have between us, not inside and outside. -ness. And three stars have between us, but no inside and outside. They're still, they only define a plane, there's no thickness. Not like I got four stars where I have insiders and outsiders. So I said, this is really very, very exciting. <laughs> then, th this, is, this would be, I gave the name then of a conceptual subdivision of universe. <laughs> I called it a system. And a system, I said, subdivides all the universe and all the universe outside the system all the universe is inside the system, and a little bit of the universe, which is a system which does the subdividing. 
That's got to be a very, I'm really terminal condition here, <laughs> absolutely terminal. And this gave me great power of definition. So this is a thinkable set, and the minimum is a tetrahedron. Now, a tetrahedron becomes really very, very fascinating. In, in, in that relationship, I then also went into developing definition of the word structure. <laughs> so I felt that understandings and interrelationships of, incidentally, the four points had six interrelationships. They're not, it's quite a different number. One's a prime number two, the other's a prime number three. <laughs> There's beautiful arithmetical brilliance here. <laughs> The, the number of relationships, which you have to find to understand is finding all the relationships, was something other than the numbers of, of the stars. That's one reason why understanding would not be true. So here's a synergetic, a very important synergetic phenomenon going on. Now, structure. I want to have I found engineers and scientists did not have a definition of structure. They talk about structures, but they don't have a definition of structure. And I want to arrive at my <coughs> structural definition experientially. I'm going to make a necklace. I find necklaces consisting of tubes. The surface may be quite fancy outside of the tube, but inside is a tube through which you have then a continuous cord, and the necklace comes back to itself. It's a finite closure back upon itself, not it. I find that the matter, I'm going to pay no attention to the exterior decoration of the beads. I'm just interested in the tube parts. So I'm just going to deliberately take tubes. And I'm going to take a number of tubes of the same length, which is easy. So I'm going to take a number of aluminum tubes, a quarter inch in diameter and about nine inches long, easy to see in the room here, and run Dacron cord through them. Through them. I'm going to make a very long necklace. We find we can drape it all, all around the room. It is, it is characterized by, by its transformability, <laughs> mutability. And I... Then looking at the necklace, observing very carefully what goes on, I find none of the tubes are changing the length, nor are any of them bending. Whatever's going on here that makes possible all these changes of shape is not to do with the tubes themselves. Something between the tubes are the angles, or the, where the tension cable runs between them. So the cable doesn't have to necessarily go through. I can make it fast from end to end of the, of the tube. It becomes really a fixed push-pull member. With this, with this flexible corner. So it's the angles that are changing. So I, because it isn't the tubes, I begin to take the tubes out one by one deliberately to see what kind of effects they get. This is found that if there are even numbers of tubes in the necklace, it'll make a wave, positive, negative, positive, negative, valley, valley, peak. But if there are odd numbers, then it gets where it's bulky and has, gets up and has a plateau at some point and so forth. Then I keep on taking out beads, and I finally get down to where I only have six beads left, six of these tubes. And I've draped it over my shoulders in nine inches, nine inches, nine inches down front. There's a U in front of me here, a U down my back. All right, I take out one more, I only have five. So I have a V in front here and a U down my back. I take out one more, I only have four. I have a V in front and a V down my back, it drapes over my shoulders. I take out one more, and I only have three. That's the last, the minimum polygon. And for the first time, it does not flex. It, it is it's what you and I call a triangle. Now, there are six parsecs. There's the three independent tensions and three independent compressions. And they are six independents are interacting to produce a stable pattern. So this begins to get, getting pretty close to being able to define a structure. It is a complex of events that interact to produce a stable pattern. Then I find that the only, the only polygon that does stabilize is the triangle. And it is the 
the minimum polygon. They could not have a, a, a two size. So I find that the minimum polygon is is the stable, and it is it is if if it is, exists experientially, it's going it's going to then consist of maybe I drape this something on the board and fasten it, but the board when I get down and find it's a compression member. These constituents in there at the minimum that I give it to is push pulls. So I say a triangle is structure, and a structure is triangle. And that's that. And this, in a sense, was very well known to the ancients, so that we have the the, tress, the trestle, the traceness, the truss. So the, 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 but the, we see men doing lots of things with other kinds of polygons and stabilizing them with little gusset plate triangles with enormous leverage against them. Very unfair to them. Anyway, Nature does things the most economical way, she, so she would not do it in, in that uneconomical un un way of having leverage advantage against a, a joint. Now, next thing. Triangle is structure, structure is triangle, and I come then to the minimum system of universe and consists of four triangles. So not only it is a minimum system, it is a minimum structural system. It's an absolute limit case all the way through. And comes, you don't need, anybody mark your paper, because you really are dealing absolute first hand experientially with the universe. So I now get to what becomes very fascinating here. Find that angle is an angle independent of the length of its edges. I take three triangles, three angles, and get a triangle. And a triangle is a triangle independent of size. I have conceptuality independent of size. That's a very important. And I have then my structural system. I have a structural system, conceptual, independent of size. Not to reading with any size. Then I find. The angle, of course, is part of a cycle. <laughs> so it's a fraction of a circle. And all sizing is cyclic. <laughs> that is, angle is subcyclic. <laughs> it is subsize. So we have conceptuality and dependence. Size is a different kind of phenomenon. It's always going to be in terms of some kind of cyclic re repetition. Hey, this gives me quite quite a important difference between the sizing a special case and the a special case that always so and the and the generalization the conceptuality is generalizable yet, yet conceptual this is to me it was very important and it really breakthrough mathematically where I did not have to have just a mathematical abstraction as, a, as, a, as an equation but I could it was conceptual and Euler had done a very great deal for that, and, and well, it gives that even more, <laughs> and, and identifying with the crystal, crystal, crystallography and so forth. Now, I have a grand strategy. We're looking for a statement of the whole, and the we have the universe identified, and we have a conceptual, a structural system, a minimum thought, isolatable from total universe the thinkable. And so when we're looking for those understanding, we're really looking for a structure. We have to know exactly why the pattern is stabilized that way. Anything you and I ever say, I recognize that pattern with my eye. The recognizability will have be, it has to go back to the stabilization of pattern. And you're going to find it always goes back to the triangle. Now, Tetrahedron. And tetrahedron can be any size. I find that if I take a flat sheet of paper, I wish I had a piece of my hand. Good. Mike, could you give me a hand? Thank you, Dan. Seemingly, this is a flat sheet going out to infinity. It's a plane going to infinity. So people do, have been spoken about that as infinite. I'm going to 
take out some angle like this and, and begin to make a cone. I keep taking out more angles. I can finally bring all the edges back to one another. And when I do, I'll find I've taken out exactly 720 degrees. That is why skin a pig or skin any, any creature, keeping the skin all in one piece, and what get down flat for a rug. Every time there's a little hump in it, you cut a little sinus into it and let that down flat. Finally, it's all down flat. If you count out the sum of the angles of all the sinuses, there will always be 720 degrees. You put all this together again, and you, you take 720 degrees out of the, the angles around the edges. Now, this became very interesting to me because the sums of the angles of a tetrahedron it has four triangles, each 180, four times 180, 720 degrees. So there's something about then the difference between infinity and the finite or, or, the, or the structural system was exactly one tetrahedron. Okay, get that? I wanted them to, I've been trying to get out a universe which was finite but non-unitarily conceptual. <laughs> I want to know what was unitarily conceptual. I go down to the structural system. So I find that the difference between the finite but non-unitarily conceptual universe and the finite <laughs> and, and the definable, I call it, definable conceptual is exactly one finite tetrahedron. <laughs> Now, the tetrahedron has, however, a convex concavity seen from outside, concavity seen from inside. So there's a positive and a negative tetrahedron to give you both the microcosmic and the macrocosmic complementation for the total universe. So the, the difference between the conceptual is really two, one positive, one negative tetrahedron. Now, as I began to get into this kind of scoring, I then got into read the definition of the sphere as defined by the Greeks, because the Greeks' definition of the sphere will not hold up in an empirical science. It's defined as a surface equidistant in all directions from a point. There could be no holes in it, and physics have never found any absolute continuum. They found only discontinuity. But it can't have any holes to define because you come to the rim of the hole, it, the radius would change. So as to find, it would define all the universe, all the universe is outside the sphere, all the universe inside the sphere with no traffic between the two, <coughs> and it would be the first perpetual self sustaining system. Therefore, it would be this is the first perpetual motion machine. Now, you, could, you could do away with the rest of the universe because there's no, no, no loss, there's no holes in this. We find that the physicists have found absolute discontinuity, and the best, the, in the terms of the physics, the, the, the spherical experience can only be defined as an aggregate of events, approximate equidistant, approximate all direction, one approximate event. As the closer you get, because in all the time of making all those measurements, there are going to be aberrations. So we have then this plurality of events approximately equidistant. Now, nature is always most economical, so she will not then interconnect those events by the arcs, because they're, they're that greater distance of the cords. So she would intercord all the, all the points. So we find then every point then has, if we have all of its most intimate in the, in the curve is omnitriangulated. So we simply get to omnitriangulated, spherical, cordially interrelated, which is what we call geodesic structure. And I find then that the, each a chord in contradiction to an arc, the center of the chord is nearer the center of the circle than the RS ends. Therefore, the chord is emerging as it comes out to the surface of the sphere. Therefore, as the chords converge at the, at the spherical, at the radius terminal, where a concave is seen from inside and convex is seen from outside. I found then that the sums of the angles around all the vertexes of any system, it could be a crocodile, they interconnect all the points 
omnicordially interconnected, we find that the sums of the angle around all the vertexes of any system will always be the number of the points of the system times 360 degrees minus 720. As the difference is always one tetrahedron. So what had been the, the, the mathematician had assumed for an infinitesimal moment a sphere was congruent with the plane to which it was tangent, and I find that's not so. This makes a really a very, very great difference. There is actually this discrete 720. Then I also found that the sums of the angles around all of the vertexes of any system is a crocodile, peacock, or sphere, or orange. The sum of the angles is always evenly divisible by the 720. Absolutely even. This is getting to punch, it gets very strong. We'll now come to several more aspects of the tetrahedron, and then I'm going to have, have a break, but I'd like to wind this part up. I'm going to have a set of cheese platonic solids. There's a platonic cheese cube and, and octahedron, tetrahedron, icosahedron, all the whole family. And the I'm going to take the cube and slice parallel to one of its faces. What's left over is no longer a cube. So I take the dodecahedron and slice parallel to those X faces, no longer a dodecahedron. Each one of them becomes asymmetric, with one exception. The, the cheese tetrahedron. So I slice parallel to one of its faces. There's a little smaller tetrahedron, but absolutely regular. So I slice parallel to the second face. Guess so smaller still, absolutely regular. Try the third face, fourth face. Always just so small, but always regular. Tetrahedron, then, is the only one, only symmetrical polyhedron, which is not Whose, whose integrity of symmetry is not violated by accommodating local aberrations. This has a very, very extraordinarily important property. And it is inherently four planes. It's not a three-plane system as, as we have with the X, Y, Z coordinate system. It's, it's inherently a four-dimensional phenomenon. Now I find then the tetrahedron, when I move <coughs> one of its faces, towards its opposite vertex, we say it gets smaller. As it gets smaller, its lines shrink at a velocity, arithmetical velocity, arithmetical rate. The areas shrink at an area of the second, the velocity of the second power, and the volume gets smaller at a velocity of the third power. Three completely different rates. But as it gets smaller, there's always four vertexes, there's always six edges, there's always all these 60 degree angles. These are absolute constants, have nothing to do with size. So I have then this conceptuality independent of size that's absolutely independent of this of the, the three different velocities. Finally, the this, this face of the tetrahedron reaches the opposite vertex. And for this time, then all of the three velocities come to zero at the same time. But because the the tetrahedron symmetries and all the constants were not varying, I can really have then an empty uh, or zero volume size tetrahedron. And that is a very interesting form. And we have, we have it here. Well, we have four planes. There. Here are four planes. See this plane, that plane, this one. And they're all going through the same common center at the same time. Now, I can then get to absolute empty sizeness just to, to, to satisfy very much the, whether we really do, do get to limit case. Next thing.
engineers say <coughs> that the c civilian doesn't realize it, but every action has a reaction. This goes back to our classical scientist. And the that's, that was a statement made before speed of light. But since we have speed of light, we now know we don't have instantaneous universe. Therefore, the action and the there's another vector a resultant. The, there's a every action has its reaction and its resultant, and they're not the same. Now these are all energy behaviors, and they're all expressible as vectors. A vector is a line of, of an energy event taking place in a specific direction, where the length of the line expresses the velocity times the mass, and the angles with respect to the a, a given a axis of, of a observability. And so vectors do not, are not lines that go to infinity. They are absolutely discrete. So we have then, here's, a, here's an energy event, and here's his reaction here, and here's his resultant. And the angles are, are never at 180 degrees like this. They are all something, we have the word precession. Precession is the effect of bodies in motion on other bodies in motion. The whole universe is a complex of bodies in motion, so all the inner effects are precessional. The effect of the sun on the earth is to, the gravitational pull is to make the earth go into orbit around the sun. And 90 degrees, not 180. Though the pull is 180, the resultant is, is, uh, is 90. This is precession. I find this one, this is one of the motion man is not used to. He really thinks about this 180, expects 180 all the time, not realizing this, this other angle, the result of precession. I find then that the, there's an action, and this reaction is at some angle other than 180, <laughs> due to other complex of other forces operating, and this is resultant be done. So this is, is some kind of a Z form like this, not in a, a plane necessarily. This is a typical energy event of a three-vector affair. Nuclear physics today says there never could have been a, 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 a great chaos because we have the proton and the neutron always and only coexist and they are in orderly relationship and actually intertransformable. <coughs> and the proton has its electron and its anti-neutrino. They really are the vectors. <laughs> this is the proton, and this is its electron, and, and this, these are the energy vectors. The neutron has its positron and its neutrino. And each one of those triplets is called one half Planck's constant, one half spin, one half quantum. I take them two. This is the proton. And this is a neutron, with its its action and its, its reaction and its resultants. And I'm going to put these. This is half quantum. This is half quantum. And I'm going to put the two together. I must put them together in an absolutely constant way, where the male comes to the female, as the the, the end of the male must come into it in an angle. Let's come into an angle. Let's come into an angle. It's an angle. This must come into an angle. So I came out. Then suddenly we put one half quantum with one half quantum, we have one one quantum and it's one structural tetrahedron, one structural minimum structural system of universe. <coughs> this really brings conceptuality into very, very important prominence. I now say that I have given you a grand strategy starting with the whole and working down how we isolate what is relevant. I've not been able to really define a system. 
and I'm, I'm able then to really develop my parameters. This is, I find man starting with parts. Where he, can, he has guessed parameters, or hopes he has them all. But this is completely the other way. We're coming in where nothing is being left out. This way you can really, very few bits, zero in, tighter, 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 tighter. That's enough for, the, for, this, for this chapter. Uh, I think, again, we, things are getting warm. It is now 10 after 9. This last one, we've been at an hour and a half. And I think if you take another, another 10 minutes off and, and uh, carry on. I'm very eager this evening to develop a <coughs> sense of, of confidence in a grand strategy of problem solving and to have a feeling of complete integrity of all the interrelationships of everything we introduce here having confidence that we really are getting to the limit case. I'm going to, for instance, now show you that whereas the tet at each vertex of the tetrahedron we have three planes coming together, three, three triangles. You can't have less because it'll then come, this, this triangle has become congruent with that. No, there's no inside this, outside this. So the minimum case is three around a goner. Now I can have four triangles around each corner. We call it the octahedron. So it's omnitriangulated, and it divides the universe into insideness and outsideness. Therefore, it's a system. So it too is a structural system. <coughs> then we find that we can get five triangles around each corner, <laughs> or equilateral. And it is then omnitriangulated, <laughs> and it has inside this and outside this, and there are five triangles in the North Pole, five in the South Pole, and ten around the equator. It has twenty triangles. We call that the icosahedron. The icosahedron, then, is also a structural system, having inside this and outside this being omnitriangulated. I can't get six triangles around a corner because they add up to 360 degrees and be a plane going to infinity. So the, the limit cases are tetrahedron, octahedron, and icosahedron. There are only three structural systems of the universe, tetrahedron, octahedron, and icosahedron. Now they have very interesting relationships one with the other. Whereas the, <coughs> this is the tetrahedron does not fill all space by itself, but the tetrahedron and the octahedron come together. See the plane formed at the bottom here, and they could fill all space. Every time I put this together, the same plane, I keep filling the plane and add one to another. And we can have tetrahedron and octahedron filling all space structurally. Now, The tetrahedron, remember, had six edges, and each of those edges was a vector. So a minimum, a minimum structural system in the universe has six vectors, and those vectors could be push or pull, so they really are, each one has a negative, so there are really 12 basic vectors involved with every event as being a, the, the minimum structural event of universe. Now, <coughs> octahedron has 12 edges. So I, was, I got to call six one unit of quantum. Number three was a half quantum. Six is one unit of quantum. Octahedron has 12 edges. Count them. The, the four in the North Pole here, four in the South Pole, four around the crater, the 12. So it has two units of quantum. Icosahedron has 30 edges. 
in front of the five up here, then five round this way, that's ten, five here, five round the ten, and then the ten round the crater, thirty. There are thirty vectors. Thirty divided by six is five. There are five units of quantum here. This has one unit of quantum, this has two units of quantum, this has five units of quantum. The when the tetrahedron is volume is used as unity. Octahedron has a volume of exactly four. And the icosahedron has a volume of 18.51. It's very close to 20. In this case, we have a structure where I, one, I get one unit of volume for one unit of quantum in structure, six. This one, I get four units of volume for two units of quantum, that's 12. This one, I get approximately 20 for five units of volume. This one I'm getting one for one, one volume for one unit quantum, two for one, and here approximately four for one, just a little short, four for one. So here I'm getting the most volume, if then from a universe viewpoint, so separating universe inside and outside, this would be the maximum macrocosm, microcosm, minimum macrocosm, that's a pulsing affair. This gives me then the most interior with the least with the least structural investment. This becomes then really very interesting where nature would have problems of volumetric enclosure, of, of envi environmental controls, and wants to do so with minimum effort. She would choose the icosahedron. So it becomes very interesting that all the viri, all the viruses, poliviruses, all of them turn out to be based on the, the icosahedron. It has, we have three legs of a tripod. If you let the tripod out like this, it'll sort of flatter and flatter, and less and less force to make it go down like that. When they, when it's very almost vertical, you get three of them really acting together. This way they're acting separately. So that, that the highest advantage, the, the more acute the angle. So the tetrahedron gives you the greatest strength, <laughs> resisting st external forces. And the icosahedron gives you the most volume mm -hmm. with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the same, uh, again, much more volume with the same amount of, of, of uh, quantum of energy investment. So that's what she does. The viruses, these protein shells of the viruses, uh, and viruses are very difficult for man to deal with because they're, they're so structurally powerful that they've been very difficult to destroy. The, this, this is their, this is their structure. We now know this very absolutely specifically as as pattern goes. Now the high, the high, we're getting the hierarchies of, of, of limits of, of all the all the cases of structural system from the from the minimum to the maximum, and find that there are interesting qualities about them. As for instance, the tetrahedron. is such that if his legs are rubbery, if I push on this, it turns inside out. You can make just such a model very readily. If you make a steel rod triangle, well, not, not too heavy, but it has some weight, take three rubber bands, pull them tightly to the center here. You find that it's a diaphragm. You can, you can pump it, the inertia of the, of the rod, like this. Allow you, you punch your hand, punch back and forth. This is, the, is exactly what goes on with the, the atomic clock. This is the atomic clock. The tetrahedron is the only one of the, of the structural system that can turn itself inside out. The, if I push on this vertex of uh, octahedron, it can turn, this half can nest inside the other half like a collapsing a football <laughs> or basketball but it only nests inside itself. The icosahedron, if I push on one of the vertex, it simply dimples locally. At this point, this point, it'll come down to here. So the consequence of forces on one vertex of icosahedron is dimpling. This is nesting within itself, folding, and this is inside outing. Only the tetrahedron has this extraordinary capability to accommodate 
aberrations in all the symmetries, but also to become the only fundamental inside-outing structure, to give you its own negative. That, that, that is enough of the tetrahedron for the moment. I'm going to give you a little in arithmetical accounting, because you find that the, incidentally, the, we make a square of these, these the square, remember, neck, necklace, V in front, goes over my shoulder, V down my back. I make up, for instance, then a cube. These are rather rubbery, rather stiff little joints, but the cube has no structural integrity whatsoever. This flattens down. It doesn't make it into lines, what anything you want. And the dodecahedron flattened right down. No, no, no structural strength whatsoever. Only the triangulators have structural strength. So that when people talk about, say, a dodeca as a structure, or a cube as a structure, it is not so. Is a cube only becomes a structure when it gets a tetrahedron inside of it. Six, it has six faces, hasn't it? So I have a diagonal here, diagonal here. The, these these six faces match the, the six edges of the of the tetrahedron, and that give you the swing. So we can build up the tetrahedron. We build up the the cube from the tetrahedron as as its as its core. Now, looking at octahedron, which has volume of four, it's pretty easy to demonstrate this volume of fourness. These two have the same altitude, and they have the same base here. I can run a line. inside that octahedron from here to here. Can you see that? The octahedron really has what we call the, it has a square cross-section. <laughs> it always has its cross-sections. It gives you what we call the XYZ coordinates. It has six vertexes. Now, I interconnect the six vertexes, and I get the three XYZ coordinates interacting with one another at 90 degrees in the center of each of those squares here. You can see this thing coming this way. Now, octahedron has volume of four. Of, oh, right, I, I could have a tetrahedron form the following way. See that triangle in the base? Then I have a triangle there. And then there's an, uh, there's a, an isosceles triangle formed by the steel rod and, and the blue edges. Can you see one? So this is an asymmetrical tetrahedron. <laughs> going from the base here up to that upper corner. And the steel rod is the, is the backbone of that tetrahedron. And it has an um, tetrahedron, it's tetrahedron set inside it. Base to base, and altitude, uh, same altitude, altitude. So that one is an asymmetrical and the other is a symmetrical tetrahedron. But they have the same volume. And you can see that this consists then of four such such triangles, such, such tetrahedra. One, two, three, four faces. Can you see that? And that. So on each each one of these panels, the four I can get. So this has a volume of four tetrahedra of the, of the regular tetrahedra. Now if I have the X, Y, Z coordinates, 90 degree corners inside here, the center, we can make a tetrahedron, asymmetrical tetrahedron, forming on each one of these faces well, this face goes to the center of gravity of the of the octahedron. Can you see one going from here? The lines reading in, which are the X, Y, Z corners. So it's, it's central angles here are all 90 degrees, 90, 90, 90. It's exterior 60, 60, 60. Internally here, 45, 45, 45. 45, 45, 90, et cetera. So I have eight, what do you call, one-eighth octahedra, tetrahedrons. This, each one coming to the to the common center, formed on each of the fa eight faces. Can you see those? Because this has a volume of four. When eights would have a volume, a volume of four by, by by eight, you get one half. So each one has a volume of one half of the regular tetrahedron. What I do then is to take four one eighth octahedra, each having a volume of one half, 
and each one has an external equilateral triangle face. So I take that equilateral triangle face and make it congruent with this face of the tetrahedron. This leaves the 90 degree corners out at 90, 90, 90. And this corner here, 45, 45, 45. Then I put another one on this face. So 90, 90, 90 out here. And 45, 45. So the 45 and this 45 add up to 90 here. I keep, I put four of an eighth octahedron on the four faces of the tetrahedron and we got the cube with the 90 degree corners. So we've added four times one half is two. We've added two to the volume one of one tetrahedron. We find the cube then, when the tetrahedron is unity, the cube is exactly three. Octahedron is exactly four. These are very beautiful hierarchy going on here. When you use the cube as unity, <clears throat> and use the edge of the of cube as, as your vector <laughs> instead of the diagonal, then all the other platonic solids come out irrational numbers. But when you start with tetrahedron, suddenly rationality begins to persist all the way through. You begin to discover the icosahedron is itself a, a, a condensed twinniness of, of what we call the vector equilibrium. Now, I want to go to the board for a minute and give you a little accounting where the mathematician has said, and the old, old scientists still say this. We have then this, and if I, then two times two is one, two, three, four. We call this, and we call this, they call that squaring. We call this two to the second power square. <coughs> so then we have the, so three to the three is nine, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We call that squaring, three to the three squared. However, I can do this. It's a triangle, then I'm gonna make a triangle double the size. And I, so two times two is one, two, three, four. So that's just an accident. So then you, Three times three is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight, nine. So three times three is nine. That's fine. And then I have to try for one bigger one. Yeah. So I say four times four is one, two, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So you can say, you can say triangling instead of squaring, because obviously, and inasmuch as a triangle is a structure and is stable, and a square is not stable, and nature will only use this as the most economical thing. She obviously will not be fooling around with squares. <laughs> So when man latched on that, he was taking up twice as much space as you need to do your counting as he did by triangles. Every square is two triangles. So then we find that when we do tetrahedral accounting, do we have color? Ready? No, Not to use color. Okay. Here's a tetrahedron looking down on the top of it. And the tetrahedron, you say, I would like to fill all space with tetrahedron. I'm sure the Greeks tried this out. So they put a tetrahedron in this corner, a tetrahedron here, and a tetrahedron here. Then they put another tetrahedron in here. They found the space between these two would not accommodate a full regular tetrahedron. So I think there was very much of a propensity on the, on the part of humanity, which is still operative, <coughs> to try to explain things monologically. Man says, is that the building block? Is that the key? He likes the one thing to explain everything. Whereas just in, in since the, the 20s, we have complementarity, and, and only in 1956, we have the Nobel Prize given for demonstrating that the complementarity was not mirror images, but two 
f fundamentally different. Just the protein and the, the proton and the neutron are always complementing one another. So I find the tetrahedron and the octahedron are always complementing one another becomes uh, utterly satisfactory. We find then that the space that you have here is. Bucky, there's, there's red now. There's another color. Oh, thank you. Very good. We have here then. I put the tetrahedron in here, and then we put the, we find the I interconnect. <laughs> I really, I, I did this in a very peculiar way. If I, if I interconnect this point here and this point here and this point here, then you see an octahedron sitting here. In other words, there's a tetrahedron and the octahedron always complementing the tetrahedron to fill the fill the space, fill all the space. <clears throat> now, I'm going to, to draw that with the, in the following man. I'm going to do tetrahedron. I'm going to give it red legs <laughs> coming up towards us here. And I'm going to now then, <clears throat> I have the, And then we interconnect here. You see that octahedron sitting in there. Now I'm going to make a triangle which we have. Make it a bigger one. Very side. This this sheet is going to start fresh. I'm going to start the single tetrahedron. I'm going to not make it red like that, just like that. Then the next one I'm going to have tetrahedron here, tetrahedron here, tetrahedron here, and I'm going to use the red for the interconnecting the tops of the tetrahedron. Gives me a different plane from the black plane of the, of the base here. Now we have a <coughs> next size Then we're going to connect the tops of the tetrahedra. We find three octahedra here. As these three octahedra come together, this one, this one, this one, they leave a tetrahedral space with a point going into it. Can you see that? So I find that if I make an accounting of what is here, I have one, two, three tetra volume of one each, and one octahedron, which has a volume of four. So the volume there is seven. This has a volume of one, one tetrahedron. Here I have one, two, three, four, five, six tetra point out towards us, one tetra point inwardly, and one, two, three octahedra. Three times four is twelve. Seven. The volume of this, this is a plateau here now. There's a red plateau. There's a red plateau here. The volume of this is seven. The volume of this is nineteen. <coughs> we then make an even bigger one. Now I'm going to put in my octahedra, and we have one. Now I have. 
have one, two, three tetrahedral point inwardly like that formed from this red plateau. We have an accounting of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten tetrahedral point out, and one, two, three tetrahedral point in. We have one, two, three, four, five, six octahedra. Six and four is twenty-four. I have seven, thirty-seven. The volume of this truncated plateau thing is thirty-seven. So we're now going to take the one plus seven equals eight. As we sit this one on top of that one, quite clearly we can do that. Then I take this one sitting on that and sit them all on top of here because this has a base of two and this has a plateau of two. So it fits there very neatly. So we have then, we have add the eight of, of this to the 19. So eight plus 19 equals 27. And I take the one, two, three, sitting on top of there, 27, and add the 27 sitting on top of here. Because the base here is three and the top here is three. So they fit. So we add the 27 plus 37 equals 64. Now that equals 2 to the third power. This equals 3 to the third power. And this equals 4 to the third power. So we can say tetrahedroning instead of cubing. And we find that the cube then takes three times as much space as that tetrahedron. So nature always being most economical should have to do it with tetrahedron. So I, I can then, when, if we're using cubes to do your counting, you can only get eight cubes around a common point. You have four in the base and four sitting on top of it. Eight come together, common center. 90 degree clock in there. So volumetrically, you can only be three dimensional. <laughs> but when you have tetrahedra coming together, you can get 20 tetrahedra, a volume of 20 around one common point. I can get two to the, two to the, Fourth power times times two. You can have you, you, we can we, we can actually do fifth power models of the, now what we're looking at here, for instance. See, that I can reach this. Uh, no, this is a the modular edge here is five. So you have five to the fifth power, uh, four, five to the to the third power. Huh? Just do that, and you'll tell exactly what your volume is. Now, this is a, I can bring together around one common point, six one-half octahedra and eight tetrahedra. They give you what we call the vector equilibrium. And the vector equilibrium is, <coughs> has, here's a, six, here's a square, Triangle, square, triangle. These are the half oct the squares of the half octahedra faces going to the common center. Just remember the four planes going through a common center. Remember that. Now I'm going to make a drawing, a drawing of the vector equilibrium, and I'll also explain why it is called vector equilibrium. You will see here right. 
there's an equatorial plane perpendicular to your line of sight. Here's another hexagonal plane going this way. Here's another hexagonal plane going this way. And there's this, the third hexagonal plane, this one here, going this way. These are the, then the four faces of the tetrahedron all going through the common center at the same time and consisting entirely of hexagons. And hexagons, radii, and its chords are the same length. The six equilateral triangles. This is vector equilibrium because the fourth is outwardly bound here. These vectors are exactly balanced by the external ones. But this is greatly to do with why universe has integrity because these six are disintegrative, trying to come apart and not helping one another. These six vectors are arranged to come back upon themselves in, in critical proximity and close. So the six are in, a, in more effective arrangement than are the, the six explosives. So these, these are the implosive or the contractive or the gravitational. We don't have, as we go on, as you go on with me, physics has found no line, straight line, she has only curves, only waves. So what we tend to call the straight line is really a curvilinear. I want you to think about these <coughs> explosive there for like a coil spring, they're in, in compression. Therefore, their length becomes less than it goes out to here. Doesn't come all the way out. And these, these are intentions, therefore they, they are always more effective, embracing the, at greater distance. When we have these same vectors then omnidirectional, this is in the one plane, we have in the vector equilibrium, we have then the, the, the travel, travel of these vertexes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 11, 12. The 12 vertexes around one, and the 12 radii are exactly the same value as the, the 24 edges out here. We'll say the 24 outside. <laughs> but the, these are where we have two planes crossing each other, the radii become congruent. So you have to be very careful in these vectorial studies to realize whether you've got vector, vectors that are congruent. So this has the same value, both 24 explosive, 24 implosive. <laughs> and, and, the, and the surroundings are all finite closures, and the others are definite. They, 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 they try to come apart. <clears throat> anyway, we call this a vector equilibrium, and it becomes very important because <clears throat> I'm now going to talk about tetrahedron in a little different way from the way I did before. <laughs> I started, you know how I came at it, but I want to <clears throat> think about, again, basic thinking, basic experience, and we come at it in the following manner. I want one single word. Oh, here is vector equilibrium, and, and vector equilibrium where the radii have been removed, that is explosives. And, and his equilibrium is, is a very, a completely unstable condition. <laughs> that is, when, uh, when we first had submarines, we used to fill the water ballast tanks so it was just at equilibrium. <laughs> and then if anybody happened to just drop a monkey wrench over, we could throw the balance out and they would tend to nose over and, and get into radio trouble. When we began flying, then we came to what we call the star. <coughs> star is simply a point when, at the equilibrium, at the star, anything can happen. It can go at any kind of a spin. Mm -hmm. Nature abhors that equilibrium. She always, or everything you and I know, will always be one side or the other of the equilibrium. At any rate, this is the most expansive form of the of these vectors that I gave you. Now here's vector equilibrium. Can can you can everybody see this all right? And I'm going to take this top face and move it lower towards the face on the floor. 
and this top triangle is not allowed to twist. You can only approach the triangle on the floor. You've got two planes approaching each other. Understand? So this means this vertex will always be towards you. Yeah. And the vertex on the floor is towards me. So I'm going to do this. Suddenly, it's collapsed to where the squirrel are changing. They become diamonds, then ridgepole diamonds. Now the distance between the, the vertexes is such that the line is exactly the same as the other vectors. Therefore, I put in six vectors there, and you have the icosahedron. This is the icosahedron. Vector equilibrium then comes down to the first stable form, which is the icosahedron. The vector equilibrium itself consisted of eight tetrahedra, each of the volume of one, six one-half octahedra. Half octahedra is two, so six and two is twelve. Twelve and, and eight are twenty. The vector equilibrium volume is twenty. And so it now collapses. Correct. I want to say that twentiness of the vector equilibrium gets tightened up into the icosahedron with another set of vectors. The, 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 in the, Six more introduced, or one more unit of quantum. <laughs> now I'm going to keep lowering that triangle, tail to the floor, not twisting at all. And now it suddenly contracts to become the octahedron. This is a very beautiful thing you watch. All vertexes approach common center at a, a common rate. It's absolutely symmetrical expansion comes by up here and now contracts the other way. But the the axis in my hands never rotates. Only the only the equator is rotating. Now I can go supposing this is rotating in space, a group of stars, there's a, a mass there's a mass attraction pull of another set of stars, and one then this is trying to turn, and then it restrains this. It, what, what happens when you do that would be then, I move this around, it forces it to contract. If it had been forced to contract that way, then, remember, notice it's rotating this way. This rotates more and plunges right through and becomes the tetrahedron. We've gone all the way from vector equilibrium, icosahedron, octahedron, vector equilibrium. The octahedron is double bonded, tetrahedron is quadruple bonded, quadrivalent we call it. This is where diamonds are in respect to carbon. <coughs> we have no, no point that we break open. So the maximum space employed by unity is, is a vector equilibrium, but all the structures are within it. <laughs> they're, they're contracted form from the whole. Now notice that this can then tetrahedron. I, I had it plunge that through like that. This can then immediately reverse itself, and tetrahedron can turn inside out. <laughs> Doesn't it? Just does it absolutely spontaneously. Just basic pumping. Okay. <coughs> that 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 identifies vector equilibrium, and introduces a hierarchy of accounting. <laughs> which the, everything is rational except for the icosahedron's volume, 1851, which you find plus the, what we call the, the vector edge cube exactly adds up to exactly the volume 27. A, it is a rational, a complementary rational. And it does it in, in, the, in a very interesting kind of a way. And we have the there's the octahedron or the icosahedron inside it. And this does the most extraordinary thing. It rotates inside here. Absolutely congruent with, with its edges. And I'm now gone far enough in the synergetics, as we call this, in the hierarchy of, of accounting and showing you how by using triangulation and, and, and tetrahedroning, you can then accommodate fourth power and fifth power. One reason why power, one reason why science became very remote to the humanists occurred subsequent to the steam event. The humanists could see the steam 
and he could see this pipe and he could understand exactly how it pushed that turbine wheel around, whatever it might be. No trouble about that. But when electromagnetics came, about the middle of the 19th century, the humanist said to the scientists, what's this invisible electricity thing doing here? Uh, you've got to tell us, because we can't see it without our eye, you've got to tell us what the model is doing, because we could see what the steam was doing. <coughs> we can see what water wheel is doing, and we're sure that they must be able to see this thing. And the scientist said, we're very sorry, we, we, we can't. We make a, another winding around the magnet with a, of copper, and what happens here, we have electromagnetics, and, and it'll move a needle. And so we have needle moved various quantities, and we find that the, as we change the cross-section of the copper, we make more and more winding, introduce variables into it. They've got various readings, and we find that they're mathematically interrelated with great regularities. And so that <coughs> we are able then to simply say to you that we get on very nicely with, with, the, with the algebra and, and the mathematics. We can express everything mathematically, and it gets to be highly predictable. If we make one more winding, we can predict exactly what it's going to do. <coughs> and out of this came Ohm's law and so forth. And these, math these humanists said, but you're telling us something goes through this solid wire over there to make this motor go around, and people is going to affect people's lives. And you've got to tell us is that really how it works. Because as humanists, I've got to describe something. I'm a describer. <laughs> it's got to be modelable. And so the Scientists say, we're terribly sorry, I can't do that. Then suddenly, with these scientists use, making energy experiment after experiment, now they had electromagnetic needle, they found that black body radiation produced a super, uh, superscript four, exponential four effect, what you call four dimension. And the scientists said, isn't that great? We can only make three dimensions, x, y, z coordinate. You cannot have another dimension that's together a perpendicular to the system that is not parallel to one of the lines already introduced. And they said you can't make it, therefore, because nature is using fourth power quite clearly with, with black body radiation. She is not using models, therefore we are exempt from now on from having to explain nature does not use models. This is the middle of the 19th century, and so for about a century and a quarter, we've had science flying on instruments, not looking out the window anymore. There's nothing to look at. For this reason, then, we have this extraordinary gap between the scientists who had less than 1% of humanity are a scientist, and the CP cells had the great gulf between the science and the human continually break. And, and that really the whole of our society breaking down because society doesn't really know what its science is. You have no conceptual participation. Therefore, I, I'll tell you what I've been working on and giving to you here became very interesting to me, back in, in the, even before World War I, I concluded that nature, I said, doesn't have a department of mathematics or physics and, and chemistry, so we have to have a department of meetings to know what to do. We have, she only has one department, and she has a beautiful coordinating system, and I see the chemistry shows me she associates and disassociates in a whole rational number. It's H2O, not H pi O. So I said, I think of, all the irrationals that have appeared in man's in, in the XYZ uh, uh, centimeter gram second so forth systems have all occurred because man came in the attic window instead of the front door and been trying to measure everything with an attic window or the wrong edge of it instead of the diagonal of it, whatever it's doing. So I said, I think it could be we might find nature's coordinate system. And if we could find it, we might really be able to bring together the chasm between the human, human and, and the scientists. So that's the very essence of all the things I'm really communicating to you all here, that we've stayed conceptual all day. I really had to go to the board very, very little here. <coughs> and that was highly conceptual. Now, I introduced the word precession to you. The effect of bodies in motion on other bodies in motion producing 90 degrees. When the man, when man took a magnet, had a coil of copper wire, that's a coil of copper wire, and he has meters on it, there's no current in it, it's just a copper wire. It, it takes a bar magnet and approaches the coil and immediately, precessionally, he's going this way, produces at 90 degrees a, a circuit, and current in it. And that sets up a field 
and the field resists the magnet, so don't come any further. <laughs> if he starts moving the magnet, the juice stops. If he starts pulling the magnet away, it immediately starts to curl. The juice going the other way and um, sets up a field, so don't go away, so it pulls it back. That's a pure precession. Just as accurate as you stop, drop the stone in the water and start to circle out that way. And the, and, and the precession is regenerative, so it starts this way, which begets this way. And this way, because that way, and there's your wave going out of it. Whereas you get into precession and conceptuality, very much that seems very obscure, suddenly begins to be, seems very, very uh, utterly acceptable to your, to your personal experience base. <coughs> I'm now going to uh, pull away from this, this vectorial geometry and I want you to have a sense of hierarchy and then the transformability and understanding that all the basic structures are transforming one with the other and go into, we come back to the earlier part of the evening trying to think in, I want you to think of the biggest patterns. We've gotten into ability to think independent of size, which is even, even better. We have generalization, conceptuality, independent of size. <coughs> and I'm going to come just to looking at our own little planet. And I spoke earlier this evening about it taking my father two weeks, two months to go from Boston to Buenos Aires and three, three, three months to go from Boston to, Bang, to uh, Bombay. And I'd like to introduce some maps for you because, again, I find we have very powerfully conditioned reflexes. So I'm going to now introduce the, ne the next basic slide. And this next basic slide is something you're very familiar with. We call it the Mercator map. This is what they have in all the schools and all the colleges and keep on having it. This is the world. And in that picture of the world, you find the, look, look at the, I'm, I'm a little in the way of, of uh, Australia, but uh, I want you to look at Greenland and Australia behind my neck. Greenland is apparently three times the size of Australia. My God. And uh, any tax handy? That is very good. If we could. Oh, that's fine. So we see on the left-hand side, Russia, and then 25,000 miles away over on the right-hand side, we see some Russia, only five miles apart, but they look to be 25,000 miles apart. And it has no Antarctic at all. And there's this absolutely enormous amount of water up in the, in the northern section, apparently, as there is in the south. This is, a, this is the way man has really been, he used to sail east and west in an water ocean world. He, he, had, he could not transfer cargoes at sea. He had to go to harbors. There were not many harbors. And this is a, really a pattern of harbors of the, the East Coast with the New York and, and Philadelphia pretty good, and, and uh, but New York by far the best, Boston fairly good, and Chesapeake. And the West Coast, San Francisco, Seattle, <laughs> approximately nothing else. And he, and he had relatively few ports on the other side. So all the great traffic was between those those, those, the integration of the earth was by water to the harbor cities and the east-west world sailing pretty much within the tolerable latitudes. We don't get too cold and so forth and, and using much of the trade winds. May I have the next picture then? I think that comes up in the, on the chart there. This is an entirely unfamiliar map to you, but it is a true map as far as distortion and shape goes, relative size. This is a map of the whole world, but it's a water, water ocean world. 
And the, I think if you don't mind, would you evolve it once more for me? With the, turn it one, one, one corner more, right. That's it, once more. Excellent. In the upper right hand corner, you see Asia. You see India, China, and Asiatic Russia. And the upper left hand corner, you see Europe and Africa and, and, the, and the Middle East. The lower, this is a propeller blade, and the lower, you have that South America and then North America at the very, very bottom. That doesn't, you know, uh, the vanity of people in America makes it look sort of, we're upside down, as they say, because there's no upside, up and down in the universe, so we're not upside down. And it happens that the upper right hand corner there, 52% of humanity. And the upper left-hand corner, there are 29% of humanity, and down here, we only have 6% in North America. So the big show, the upper right-hand corner is what Kipling called the East, and the upper left-hand corner is what he called the West, and he said, East is East and West, West. they never trained to meet. The Americas were not in the, in the show at all. They, was, they were more recently discovered, and then they were not really counting in that kind of a, a way of thinking about things. This is a very much more important map than you can think about. It happens that, that 85% of all the land is north of the equator. Three quarters of the Earth is, is water. 85% of it is north of the dry land, is north of the equator. 90% of the people are north of the equator. We are very much a northern hemisphere population world. And the southern hemisphere is just all this water. Now, we used to think of the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, separate oceans. And what we have here is the Earth is always revolving west to east. And as it revolves west to east daily, we have also the atmosphere we have a northern jet stream and a southern jet stream revolving very much faster than the Earth. They sometimes get up to 400 miles an hour faster than the Earth is turning, the gases are turning. Then we have the waters of the Earth trying also to turn faster than the dry land. But in the northern hemisphere, there is a mountain range across here, so the waters do go around west to east in two different groups. There is a Bering Sea west to easting, and, and there's a Greenland, west to easting. But in the southern hemisphere, the waters go west to east unimpeded. They get most choked at what we call the horn, where the waters go through the horn. And you can see the shape, look at the Antarctic there, and between the tip of South America and the, and the Antarctic, there's this horn for the, where ice and enormous waters going through it, cha channeling through it. Now, this is and the picture of the, this is the water ocean world in contradistinction to the land ocean world. And this is the, and the people who learn then that the water leads between all the countries, the people who then exploited the remoteness of humanity, the great, what I call the, I call them great powers for a very simple reason, that the, the laws of the lands could not be enforced out on the water any further than human beings could throw projectiles. And, and that was sort of a little distance, like three mile limit, so forth, was about it. The laws of the land have never been forced on the sea. Therefore, the sea, which is three quarters of the earth, is outside the law. And the people lived on it without laws. And the top ones are called sovereigns, and the lesser ones are called the pirates. The ends are, are the sovereigns, and the outs are the pirates. And it's uh, often reversed their position. So, the great exploiters then of the remoteness of humanity, the integration, the synergetic wealth that is generated by bringing resources remote from one another. This is the pattern of it because there was around the South then the merry-go-round. I say not a very merry-go-round, but it was a, it was a the enormous dynamic go-round from west to east. And you got down on that water and the, if you could stand it, your ship could take it. You get zooming from the Pacific into the Atlantic and zooming from the Atlantic into the Indian Ocean, and vice versa. It was a great turntable, 
and it became then the most economical way to get from here to there. Because once you load your ship, you, you, you can go to any place in the world. This, this, was the, this was the key to going anywhere in the world. The, the English called the British Empire, this is a map of the British Empire, with 90% of humanity out in the tips of the fellow there, not knowing what's going on at all around here. They guarded the tip of South America, the tip of South Africa, and they guarded Australia and New Zealand, they guarded the Mediterranean. This is the, this is the pattern that Admiral Mahan discovered, getting very famous American Navy, because he was suddenly introduced to the American Navy, the fact that the British discovered long ago there's only one ocean. And the key of it is, is the great medical around here. The what I call it the polar ground. And so that is the remoteness of the humanity when I checked into this picture, when what was natural to me, and east is east and west, where no trains for me. May I have the, the next one, please? These are the same map pieces. And these map pieces, as you can check by floating them on the edge, and they make the Icosi, they come around, you find it in complete agreement with any globe that you can, you can, you will find no visual discrepancy whatsoever in relative shape or size or interrelationships. We're now looking then the same pieces rearranged to be what are called the land world. Now the land is at the center, the water is at the center before, now the land is. We have here all the dry land of the earth without any break in any of the continental contours that you had in the, the old the Mercator, without any distortion. And on it, then, we have a very interesting set of conditions. If we would rotate that once more and have, a, have North America at the top. North America at the top, sir. Uh, once more, that's it. I'll just call this, then, the Mercator was an east-west world, and that East to, uh, the east is east and west west, the traffic was east westing. This is suddenly a north south world. And on this map, you'll find that something very fascinating happened. In 1961, utterly unpredicted by anything in history, three jet airplanes suddenly carried more passengers across the Atlantic than did the Queen Mary in a fraction of the time and a fraction of the cost. In 1961, the ship became the obsolete as the way in which man got from here to there around his world. And this is not as yet really serious. So those ships looking for cruise ships, whatever it is, it's all over. And with it, all the railroad, the east-westing railroad is gone. So we have great ports like New York, where humanity used to come in, enormous real estate investments there, San Francisco, so forth. And now there's nothing there except to try to get conventions to try to keep going. And the people left the farms, they're all piling in. And so we have a momentary great mess of, of really no raison date whatsoever. We have then suddenly this north-south world. And on it, that map you're looking at now, 90% of humanity can reach each other on the shortest great circle routes without going near the Atlantic, Pacific, or the Indian Ocean. They're obviously for our interest now except a place to cruise. They're also very, very important when we come to, the, to, to food supply, but the point is that as far as all the traffic goes, this is the way it's going to go. But we have such powerful investments in the real estates in those cities that want to be east and west that they, they try to resist this. But what's going on is Canada is suddenly becoming really important because they are, what is Canada? They, they have a contact with Russia and China. No distance at all. And... I wanted to give you a very abrupt picture. Now, I, we have it, and we'll show you on, uh, you'll see it on the screen. I'd like to show the slides of the population. We have 3 billion, 600, pretty close, set about 700 million people on our planet right now. So 1% would be 37 million people. Can you see on the screen, all of you? There is the water ocean world. And on that water ocean world, each one of those white dots is, is 1% of humanity. Actually located where the people are. The, by far the greatest concentration of people is around Bangladesh. You can see in there. There's enormous 
that whole subcontinent is just extraordinary. The number of people there, China and, and India, Pakistan. So. Excuse me. May I have that picture back again? And upper left, you see your Europe. Then, in, if I get myself out of the way here, you see North, North America, very few little lights there, and very few, four of them in, in South America. These are, this is the real emphasis of humanity. We have an integrating humanity. Yesterday, man inherently divided. Now, man inherently integrated. Nothing could be more abrupt kind of change historically, coming in the big patterns I've talked to you about. So, may I have the next picture again? There we'll see the the land world and where the people were all deployed and, and remote from one another. Suddenly, see how close they really are to one another. And you, you, you really see how swift this integration is, is just simply bound to be. I, I feel that I have given you now enough for, for tonight, it's 10.30. But our main thing was to introduce enormous big patterns that evolution and the universe is at work. The universe has an a priori integrity, it's an a priori mystery. The you and I come in, in ignorant, helpless, naked, finding our way whether we have gained enough understanding of experiences to discover that, as the Oxford Dictionary makes it very clear, about 100,000 nuances of common experiences, that so unique a, a nuance that they really need their own special describing word, that we've agreed on 100,000 words for those, those unique experiences. It represents one of the most extraordinary memorials of humanity to me, that, that we have those tools that I can sit here using thinking out loud, use those tools of gained by humanity over all those millions of years of communica communicability. So I see then these very beautiful big things happening, and we will pursue it from, from there. But I think I've introduced to you a grand strategy of problem solving. I want to think about why are humans here, and why do they have that beautiful mind, and why do they have access to the great principles of the universe itself, of the great design, nothing else we know has access to. I say we common to all human beings in all history, completely independent of any ethnic difference, whatever it may be, problems, problems, problems. That we are here for problem solving. Not to have problems out of the way, some stupid, sublime, something called peace. We're here strictly for problem solving. And, and the better you get at it, the, the more problems you're going to get to solve. And we find the games played by humanity, they knock out a fly, get randomness and misconvert it, order just quick to be. The whole game is convert to order, to comprehend, understand. And in this transition we're going through, we're going to agree to that in the further sections of what goes on, what is politics and what... what. But I, I think tonight, then, we have the, the, the prime ingredients. Of the, I think I've introduced a good problem strategy solving capability. What systems really is, we have, we have a, a system which we don't have any, anything, any parameters are going to get accidentally left out, and I, I, I think I've introduced enough to you have confidence with me in seeking more and more of these big patterns, all the time really then being able to exempt man, not, not taking him too seriously. I'm quite confident that the, the star sun is not saying the other stars are not going to keep life going on that planet They haven't paid their bill. I don't think that the universe is talking any such nonsense, and, and what, I, what we are out to really discover we can is how the universe really does operate, why we are here, and how we begin to participate in, in the big game of the universe itself rather than a game of, of we've been playing on our planet Earth, but which is, is really quite unrealistic and been highly, highly distortable. Thank you. I think it's important for all of you to share very intimately with me what I do in the way of conscious disciplining myself as we meet. I am 
an experientialist, as my grand strategy, which I'm discussing with you, of coping with problem solving, is one which has an important name, operational. The word name operational came to be applied to science, I think, by on the it was the invention of uh, Percival Bridgman at Harvard, a natural philosopher at Harvard, who invented the term early in the century when Einstein made his first announcements. And Percival Bridgman at Harvard, a natural philosopher, said he was deeply interested in how it happened. Science, in general, was, was caught so out, off guard, so unexpecting of Einstein's kind of a pronouncement and, 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 and the, the viewpoint that was demonstrated by Einstein. And he became a great student of how all the circumstances surrounding Einstein's developing the thoughts that he had developed. And he, and he then found that Einstein was concerned with all, not just some data discovered in the experiment, but all the circumstances surrounding that faithful reporting of the immediate, local, intimate conditions under which the discovery was made. And I will uh, come back to that but give a working demonstration of why Einstein felt, felt, felt it was so important to record all the circumstances as well as that which was especially isolated out and discovered. The, the example that I'm going to give you is, is my own invention But I did include Einstein and Einstein's philosophy and my own interpretation of how he came to develop his equation and other of his strategies in my first book, Nine Chains to the Moon. And because I had three cha chapters on Einstein, my publishers who were Lippincott of Philadelphia at that time, this is mid-30s, mid about 1935, said that they found that I had three chapters on Einstein, and they, at that time there was a sort of a general myth that only there were only nine people in the world who could understand Einstein. They said they looked at all the lists of people who understood Einstein. I was not on any of the lists. In fact, they didn't find me on any list and of any authority, and they felt that for me to be writing three chapters on Einstein would make them live and cut be accused of being a partner to charlatanry, that I was just a fake. And so I was a little stung and was still quite young and I, so I simply wrote back, in a sense quite facetiously, to Lippincott saying that Dr. Einstein had just come to America and was in Princeton at the newly organized Institute for Advanced Study. and. Uh, I suggested they send my typescript to him, that he would be the best authority. I, I really did not think they would take me seriously about that, and I forgot all about it. And it was about six months later that I had a telephone call from a doctor in New York, and he said, my friend Dr. Albert Einstein is coming in, in to spend the weekend with me, and he has your typescript, and he would like to talk to you about it. And could I possibly come on Sunday evening to his apartment in New York? So I, you can imagine I didn't have any engagements that would interfere. <laughs> and I had very few engagements in those days. <laughs> Nobody wanted to talk to me. And I did come then uh, to the apartment, and it was a wealthy man, and he had a large living room. And in more or less Germanic kind of style, they were people were sitting around the walls of the room, and he was sitting pretty much in the middle, and I think later on he might have played music for them. 
And when I came in, I, I was brought there to this long room up to meet him. And I really had, I don't know how much was psychological within me, but I really had the most extraordinary feeling of being in, in a presence of, of almost an aura of him. He immediately uh, excused himself from the company and took me out to, the, to a little library that was just off the main hall of the, of the apartment. And on the library table was my typescript and, and under the light. And he, we sat down on the other side of this desk and he said uh, he'd been over my typescript and he uh, was writing to my publishers to say that he approved of my interpretation of his thoughts and the way in which I had explained his, <coughs> his translation of philosophy. A philosophy of his which had been published in the New York Times Sunday Magazine in New Year 1930 called The Cosmic Religious Sense. It was a very, very inspiring piece. And I had I'd asked the publishers, publishers if I could quote it in my book, and I did. Having then this chapter on his philosophy, I then <coughs> had another chapter on the way I felt that he interpreted in, into how he applied that philosophy to all of his his own grand personal strategy of his life and how he came about developing his thoughts on the, on the equation. Then I had a third chapter, which I said that historically great scientists, individual scientists make discoveries. The, the academy doesn't accept right away. Later on they do accept. Then it gets to be in the schools and this gets to be into the, in, in the general atmosphere of the, everybody's thinking. At this point, engineers and inventors within that atmosphere of thinking make some invention. And then gradually some industry takes on that invention. That takes quite a while. There's a lag. Finally, various things are being produced and which bring about a new environment under which social changes have to occur. And politics then has to take care of the take up on, on the new orientation of man all brought about indirectly from the original side of thinking. And I said, I, then my third chapter was, I, I developed a hypothetical picture of how humanity would be living. It was called E equals MC second power equals Mrs. Murphy's horsepower. And then I then was looking at the everyday life of Mrs. Murphy under the circumstances of everybody really being completely convinced of the validity of Einstein's thinking. His equation had not as yet been validated as it was later by Fission at the time that I, that I was writing. Anyway, he said he did approve of my two chapters, of my chapter explaining how he, his philosophy was interpreted into his, in his action, his thinking. But he said this third chapter about Mr. Murphy's horsepower, and his words were, I'll, I'll, I'll imitate him because I remember this so, so very well. And he was very gentle and he said, uh, this third chapter, young, young man, you amaze me. I cannot conceive anything I've ever done having the slightest practical application. And he went on to explain that he had evolved his thoughts as possibly being useful to the astronomers, to the astrophysicists, to the cosmogenists, the cosmologists, but that it have any practical application or nothing. And, uh, and right, he did approve, and they did go on with the publishing of the book. This is very interesting because this meeting occurred about a year and a half before Hahn and Stressman and then Lisa Meitner discovered theoretical fusion. And then there was a whole set of events of which followed, which most people are very familiar with. And then the, the German scientist, Jewish scientist, getting the word as quickly as they could to out of, out of Germany, because they thought it would be used immediately for armaments in, in, in Germany. And the word did come to, to America, and there were theoretical studies. And, and then came the conclusion of the scientists that the fission was, was actually possible. So uh, there was the quandary of the scientists and how, because politicians don't listen to the scientists, on how to get word to 
the, to Franklin Roosevelt. So they all decided that Einstein was by far the most highly accredited of scientists. So they asked him to go to see Franklin Roosevelt, and Franklin Roosevelt did appropriate what at that time was an incredible amount of money, $85 billion for the Great Manhattan Project. And then ensued then the Enrico Fermi pile, with all of which the history most of you know. But what it was interesting to me that I heard from this man two years before the theoretical fusion is envisaged, that he, he did not have any slightest idea that anything he had ever done would have any practical application. Because the first practical application, the, the Enrico Fermi pile, it completely validated his theory of the amount of energy that was being stored in the given mass. So the very essence of what was going on. So the first th practical application was Hiroshima. And having heard that from that man just before this occurred, I, I realized the unhappiness and the consternation that he experienced when, he, when the first practical application was Hiroshima. In fact, his, his last days were spent greatly devoted to trying to get the scientists to realize their responsibilities and how they were being exploited and brought about his consternation brought about the development of the there was association of atomic scientists and the public publishing of the atomic scientists bulletin and so forth and uh, he expressed himself very vigorously uh, uh, his great unhappiness about this but to have heard from that man before he realized that it wouldn't be a practical application. It would come in the political field. It was, it was a very extraordinary experience. But I do have then the personal confidence that when I interpret Einstein and talk about him, of which I do very frequently, I do ha did have his personal approbation of my capability to do so. So I'm giving you then a hypothetical example of what Einstein employed as a, a strategy of thinking which brought about Bridgman's development of the word operational. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you then a man in a railroad train going west across the desert. And his, his train is going very fast. And he leans out of the window and drops a flaming apple. <laughs> and he has, and he has a friend with him and so forth, they have a sextant to measure angles, and they have stopwatches and so forth. And he observes what he sees in the, in the, in the total azimuth of observation of the angle at which this light forms. The, the, obviously, the framing apple goes the opposite direction from him. <laughs> and he sees, it do, he sees it doing that, and he records his stopwatch exactly what angle of motion there was, some totally, as he looks back at it here, going, going back like that and a little back towards the track. And he has a stopwatch reporting exactly how long it was in each of those positions of the various azimuth observations. Then we have another man who, at the same time, was standing way to the north of the train, was going west in the desert. And he had his observation instruments, his, his angle measuring device in the stopwatches. And he sees the apple go, flaming apple go west <laughs> instead of east. And he sees it in gradually go then down a little towards the track, towards the land. And he makes all of his measurements exactly what he did, and, and he describes that in the total, his total frame of reference. Then we have another man who was standing on the track way to the west as the train, train approached. And all he saw was the, this, this flame go hesitate like this and go in towards the earth. It's just a straight line going like that towards the center of the earth. And he measured everything with his angle, azimuth, and his stopwatches. There's another man standing under it. As he, this happened, it, the train was going over a trestle. And there's another man standing below the trestle, looking up at me and seeing this whole thing. And he makes his observation what he sees. You'll find out the total angles of the observation, all the timing. Everything came out. Each one was really very, very accurate. And they all come out completely differently. And for this reason, Einstein then felt that all the circumstances must be reported, <laughs> and not just what it is you happen to find on, on your scales there as you weighed the phenomena, how, what, the, what went on within the test tube. This brought about 
Bridgman's feeling there should be a name for the inclusion of the unique circumstances which the observation are made. And he again gave the name operational, which he used to <coughs> differentiate from a school of, of, of uh, philosophy that was then been in, in operation coming from a man named Pierce at Harvard called the uh, School of Pragmatism. In other words, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was pragmatic, <laughs> but he wanted to, uh, to use another word than, than pragmatic, so he, he was operational. Since that time, the word operation has come into very popular use in military ways and everything else coming from scientists, but that's where the word began. I am, in my geometry explorations, you see me getting into structures and so forth, discovering that the process of thinking produced a geometry. It was just a process of thinking about our experiences and then our experiences were omnidirectional, so when you divide your experiences, all the ones outside, ones inside, it created a geometry. It just automatically produced a polyhedron or some kind of definition of what produced the insideness and outsideness. So a geometry has been, been developed by being very careful to remember at the outset, every way I can, what I personally was conscious of in doing when I, when I participated in what I call, what we call thinking. And there are many other things I'm sure that went on that I am not conscious of, but the point was, uh, these are the things I was conscious of, and they led to a great many clues. So those, that's, uh, that's all operational, operational procedure. So all of my geometrical exploration from there on is what I call really, op it's all operational mathematics. I have an absolute no axioms. There's nothing that's said to be obvious. Where, where, you, where our eyes are too superficial. We now know how small the spectrum of the electromagnetic range of, of frequencies that you and I can tune in. So we, we, uh, we just cannot see adequately to say that's self-evident. Well, I find mathematics can play, and pl mathematics can play games assuming certain conditions to obtain, but I will not play. Now, I am an operational and I often like to use the word experiential. <laughs> I find that experiences can be inadvertent, they happen to us, <laughs> and then there are the experiences deliberate, so I call one, is it, it is experiential when, I, when it's happening to us and then I make it experimental when, when you, you, we do make it, we set up, we manipulate the conditions arbitrarily. Now, in my carrying on with you, doing what I'm doing on this particular occasion, I am, I'm almost 80, within a few months of 80 now, and I am operating completely uh, extemporaneously. I do not have any notes, and I have made up my mind to, because it, we have tried it on several occasions before at, at, at various schools around the country quite a number of years ago where I was asked to exhaust my thinking, <laughs> my spontaneous thinking before a class of, of students and, and where I would not repeat myself except to do important reviews to bring back in a strand of thought which I'd introduced later that needed you had to be conscious of tying it in. And I was asked to exhaust my thinking, all the thinking which both the class and myself agreed was not in, in the general way of thinking, where I had a, any sort of unique viewpoint as a consequence of my, of my operational procedure in, in uh, developing my, my, my thoughts and self-discipline. In the previous experiments we've made, we, we had one that came to 52 hours, and because I am, or am older, though I may be able to condense things a little more, I probably, we are all having such an acceleration of experiences, as I opened with you last night, the input of information is so great that I probably have, will take a little longer now than I did before, so we made an allowance of about 60 hours. But I also have arranged out my affairs in such a way that I'll have the least possible intrusion into this pattern while I'm doing this. 
so that I will be able to really remember from day to day everything I've said over the total 60 hours. So I'm going to be really working on a, I'm working on a mental tapestry. And I'm introducing thoughts and so forth, and I'm bringing in threads, and you, you'll find me continually weaving. But working on the grand strategy I introduced to you yesterday, working from the whole to the particular, the synergetic strategy, and requiring statements then of the whole, and then some of the known known inputs, and finding out other things as we go. This is the, is the grand strategy. So I, that's enough about the, the sort of operational statement of, of, about what you find me sitting up here doing. And because this is, is a very unprecedented affair, an unprecedented affair to, just to have this beautiful videotape. I don't know, you, you've, you've been looking at the quality of the picture. That they've, it, it is really superb. And now videotape is able to do what you do with just a tape recording a voice. You can, you can run it over again. We can come back later on where I've been talking about some object that's not, we don't have models of or pictures handy. We can superimpose it back in the film at the right place. It, it is very mutable and, and a lovely medium. And so we're getting a really very faithful recording of a, of, a very, of a completely live experience of you and I. And I had to have faces in, before me, human beings before me, so that I could really deal with their eyes. And I could not have people who came in and out. If somebody new appeared in the audience, I would then my spontaneously, I want to bring him up to date with what the rest of us were thinking, so that we, we've had to have fairly clear-cut plans of, of how we would carry on here. I think all this is important to have in the picture, because that's operational, operational information. In other words, personally, I, I do not look upon our undertaking such as somebody trying to create a beautiful moving picture, <laughs> but they're just interested in the photogenics, whatever it may be, uh, and and certain dramatic moments, getting the audience to feel certain ways. Therefore, I I do not go by protocol or, or the, the any things that try to over to erase anything that seems to be any any kind of, of a small marring item. I think all of those things are going to be very important in, in our, operationally in whatever goes on here. I, I this is this is because we 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 are all dealing. In, in, in that extraordinary phenomenon called reality. Now, today I'm going to do some more reviewing of things in fairly large ways. There was something that is very much in evidence in the room here, and I have not talked about, and that it relates to our word structure of yesterday. And that is, you see models around here with the, which uh, these compression members do not touch each other. If you triangle, you find these are these are flexible cables between them. They're not stiff little wires. They are they're not rods. They are literally completely flexible threads, and they are high tensile threads, Dacron, so they will not stretch. But we see then a complex of, of compression struts that do not touch each other. And the only thing that's continuous is the tension. Now, I became very fascinated as in my, my early days getting into structures and actually building things, and particularly dealing with boats and, and the very great strength of the rigging and strength of your ship compared to the kind of strengths that were usually exhibited in houses. And the differentiating of the rigging of a ship into the compressional spars and the tensional cables and, and, and stays, halyards, all the things you operated the, the ship with. So I'd like to think a little about any, any structural system. We introduced those words yesterday, so now you know what I'm talking about there. We find that there is in the structural system, there was a complex of energy events which interacted inter with one another to produce a stable pattern. <laughs> but some of them were trying to explode, some are trying to come to get, get escape the system, and others are containing the system. 
And I find then there's this phenomenon of compression and tension that is always and only coexistent. I think lots of people say, I have just a compression member. Well, that compression member is, is at high tide of a compressional aspect, but does have radial tension in it. And they say, I have a pure tension member. It's not so. You find that tension is also coexistent with compression. To make that clear to you, I'm going to then point out to you, first, I take a piece of rope, it's very flexible, and the only way that can give you any, any dimensional positioning stability would be when you have it tensed. So we take this piece of rope and uh, our two hands and start tensing it. And the tight, tighter I pull it, the more vigorously I pull it, the tauter the, the rope becomes. When we say taut, it means its girth begins to contract. That's so, as a consequence of my tensing it in, in this, these, this direction, pulling uh -huh, this way, it is contracting this way. That is, its girth is getting less. It's getting harder, you find it, tighter and tighter. <coughs> that is, the more I pull it, the more it goes into compression at 90, in a plane at 90 degrees by pulling. <coughs> that sounds familiar to you from yesterday. That's precession. In fact, the pulling is, the result of this is at 90 degrees. Now, I find that I'm going to take a number of, of rods steel rods and you find that they're very flexible. <laughs> if I push it this way, they want to bend. I'm going to take <coughs> a bundle of steel rods of eight, eighth of an inch in diameter. They're four feet long, so that they're so long they're very slender and, and readily bend if I push on their hands towards each other. They're all the same diameter and I'm going to bundle them together in parallel one to the other, a whole lot of them. If I'm Two of them will come into contact. I make cross section through them. They come into contact like that. They and now they can't get any closer to one another. They're, they're actually tangent. The third one will nest in top of the two. Makes it a triangle. I find that I can get six around one, making the hexagon form. We went in that pattern yesterday. I can get another row around and another row, and they get into this hexagonal pattern of closest packing. And I take a very large number of these bundles, of these rods, and I've, I've counted them out so they're going to come out in even hexagons, not just partial rings at the outer, outer set. And taking them, bring them together, enough, and finally, we keep doing this to them, they finally get, they get in that closest packing, very much tighter than they did were at first. Now I put a tensile strap around them to hold them in the closest packing. So hold it, wrap them all the way around uh, the whole length of this. Get absolutely tightly bound together. Now, I made so many of them that we have a, a total bundle about six inches in diameter and it's four feet long. So its, it's length to diameter ratio is 12 to one. We find there's something in, in columns compression columns we call slenderness ratio. The Greek stone column, they found they could go 18 diameters high before the column wanted to collapse one way or the other. That is the slenderness, slenderness ratio, ratio of the diameter to length. And the we have the steel columns could get up to date some of the very good steels can get up as much as 36 to 1. Before they, I would see what happens when you load a column in compression. It wants to banana like that. It tends to go to arc of decreasing radius. Now, 12 to 1, I made that bundle of 6, six inches diameter and four feet long, so no, it's an eight, eight to one. It's a very, a very short column, it'd be called. has really no tendency to, to, to banana at all. It's pretty much like the, that there's a stone, stone section, one section in the, in the Greek column. Now, I'm going to put this column 
under a hydraulic press, <laughs> in the hydraulic press between the top member coming down, fantastic power being exerted here. And, and as the pressure comes on each one of those car, each of the rods is in there, you know they want to bend. But because they had closest packing, they can't bend towards each other. They can only bend away from one another. That's the only possible freedom. So that's exactly what they start to do. So they keep loading it, and they, they, they want to go out like a cigar quite evenly. We have something called the neutral axis of a compression member. If you can load it very closely on the neutral axis, then the load doesn't try to make it banana one way or the other. The, 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 the slender, slenderness could make it go in almost any, any of the directions. A little tiny force goes that way. Now, <clears throat> we find that very evenly loaded in the center and being a, a short column, it tends to just become like a cigar. All the rods can, on the outside can bend away from one another. That's the only direction they can yield. Therefore, as they do so, they put an, we had a, they were bound together, so it puts an enormous strain on the, on the binding because they work against that binding. So that while we are deliberately loading in, in compression this way, the, the result is it goes into tension in the plane at 90 degrees. It's exactly the opposite of what we did with the tension member going into compression. Here again, our friend, precession. <coughs> in engineering, that is called the Poisson effect. Now, often a, 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 some name being used really obscures a function, and it'd be better to say precession than Poisson effect. Then you really have the generalized principles covering all of these. Now, having recognized these proclivities of, of compression members, I saw them, a tension member, when I, when I do tense it, tends then to go to arc of greater radius. Here we have something really quite different from the, from the compression member trying to go to arc of lesser radius. In fact, the tension member tries to straighten out and tries then also really to get all this effectiveness within, within the neutral axis. He tries to get in his own neutral axis to be, in a sense, most effective. Tension members really tend to gain strength as first use, and build up quite a lot of strength. Now, I found that whereas there is a slenderness ratio in compression columns, there was no limit length to cross-section. There was no slenderness ratio in tension members. If you had a better alloy, they could be thinner and thinner. Yesterday, I went into mass interattraction with you. This beautiful discovery of, of, of t team play, really, of going from the Kepler, Kepler to, to and Galileo to Newton, and we have then there is that mass into attraction. And when we get to alloys of metals today, we know that the atoms are literally not touching one another; they are just simply in closer proximity one to the other. I gave you the word synergy yesterday and behavior of whole systems unpredicted by behavior of any of the parts considered separately. Chrome nickel steel <coughs> is a very beautiful demonstration of synergy in physics and chemistry, alloy. We have a, a, a rule of thumb of, of a man of yesterday saying a chain is no stronger than its weakest link, and that seemed to be very obvious. By the same way, then, if I mix together a number of different chemical elements, our candy making would suggest that as when you could melt the sugar then the, and, the, and the whole thing comes apart, the nuts come apart, the nuts didn't fail, but the sugar comes apart, whatever is the, the, the weakest element would be that in the chain would be all you have to look at, the, the sugar in that peanut brittle, and, and so the, the, the sugar is the weak element. So, and peanut bread will be no stronger than sugar. <laughs> now, when we come to the metallic alloys, things do not happen in that particular kind of way. I'm going to then take the chrome nickel steel, and we take the, in, in the testing materials for their strength, the tensile strength per given cross-section area, some kind of cross-section area, in, the, in, in America, uh, square inch. The tensile strength of a square inch of material, so PSI, pounds per square inch, 
What is the cohesion of that material before it gets into two pieces? And that is the most prominent of all the te strength testing testings that are carried on to learn about the structural strengths of materials. So I'm going to take the there as and when you're out testing, there is a point where the material will yield, and that's considerable time before it still it'll still carry quite a lot before it fails. So. But the engineering usually then deals in that. If you want to get to a yielding point, then things are going to be in trouble. So <clears throat> I'm going to take then the, the, the one is called ultimate and the other is yield. Stones, masonry, for instance, have only about 50 pounds to the square inch tensile strength, the masonry itself. The stone is... 50,000 pounds to square inch compressional strength. So stone has had an enormous ability to carry loads, but no, no strength at all in, in cohering comes apart. We have then um, metals taken out of the stone that have brought then tensile strength from the 50, 50 pounds per square inch of masonry up to something like mild steel, primarily the iron, which is some carbon, the, this is, has a tensile strength in, in the commercial, commercially available materials, relative purity, that we, that we ever get an ultimate in the mild steel of about 60,000 pounds a square inch as ultimate, yielding maybe around 50,000. We have the carbon, manganese, and so forth in there, in chrome, nickel, steel, the three prominent constituents are the iron and the chromium and the nickel. The chromium has a tensile strength of about 70,000 pounds per square inch. The nickel, about 80,000 pounds per square inch. So the, the weakest is the iron of the 50 to 60,000. And you say then, well, let's put these things together and the weakest adulterates the whole, like the sugar, and it can no, never have any more strength than the weakest c component. That, that has been the, the everyday thinking. And for this reason, alloys have really surpri surpri surprised man tremendously because that society does not think synergetically. It assumes that all you have to know is about the parts they add up. Now, chromium, chrome, nickel, steel, if I then get to the, that I'm going to, I find that it does not come apart tensely in the tensile testing at the, at the weakest or where the iron yields. We find then that, <coughs> we, let's try the chromium side, well it doesn't come apart, try the nickel, 80,000, we're going to say a chain is now as strong as the strongest link. <coughs> and we find that 80,000 it doesn't yield at all. In fact, we don't get it to yield until we get to 350,000. Supposing I say, I want to try and understand this extraordinary phenomenon by saying, I'm going to say a chain is as strong as the, as the addition of the strength of all of its lengths. Which, but everybody would say that's absurd. So I'm going to take 60,000 plus 70,000, that gives me 130,000, plus 80,000 gives me 210,000, but it doesn't yield till 350,000. Now, how does that happen? Well, this way it occurs. I want you to think then about geometry that I gave you yesterday of, of structural systems like the tetrahedron. I can take two tetrahedra of four stars each, and I can interrelate them symmetrically so that they're now eight stars in critical proximity, and they take position at the eight corners of the cube with eight, a cube having two tetrahedra in it, because each square face had two diagonals. And you could, you could take the, the cube and, and, and have the red set of diagonals. You'll find those are the successes of the red tetrahedron. And you have the other diagonal of each face, the blue set. That, that's the blue tetrahedron. you find the two come together with eight points. Now, remember our mass attraction. <laughs> mass attraction. These atoms are now in, there were only four, and, they, and their distance apart was the edge of the of the tetrahedron, which is on the cube is the diagonal of the 
face of the cube. Now each of these eight stars, the nearest one is the leg or the edge of the cube away, not the diagonal way. Therefore, the critical proximity has been very greatly increased. So each one, each atom now has three other atoms in much closer to them than the original three. So we have, have four cases of each having three, and remember that the, the interattraction increases the second power of the relative proximity. So the coherence has gone up enormously. Then we find that we have that cube now with the, the eight corners. We find that there are six faces. So I can take the, an octahedron, which has six vertexes, and they'll exactly match the mid faces of, of the cube. So each one of these elements coming in are just one of the such beautiful symmetry, symmetrical structural, structural systems of atoms. So I then finally have all the interpositioning of them all in the same distance from the same common center. And we find the mass interattractiveness has just gone up in this exp exponentially. That's how we got the 350. In other words, <coughs> here we have an alloy is like the Milky Way. <laughs> I take two stars in the Milky Way and I'm going to have another star intrude halfway between the two and the interattraction is going to be four-folded. But they don't touch each other. Now, I want you to then understand how that alloying is, is highly synergetic and really appreciate that word. So I find then his chrome nickel steel with its very high synergetic effectiveness of, of tensile strength. And these, these things really began to fascinate me very much. So I saw that tension members were not limited by cross-section in relation to length. If I could get a better material, I could make them longer and longer and thinner and thinner. That's exactly what went on in the history of, of suspension bridges. The first suspension bridges were actually made with great iron links, very great cross-section, very short span. We came to the Brooklyn Bridge, the first one where we were using cable, and used piano steel wire, which was, very, it was one of those alloys. At a time when the mild steel was only about 50,000, and he got 70,000 with, with his piano wires. So we had relatively delicate cables carrying all that extraordinary traffic, but there's enormous span, enormous span. Then when it came to <coughs> George Washington Bridge, we've gotten very much finer because the, the alloys had so improved. And each one of these bridges getting up Golden Gate and then finally Verrazano. We're down to very delicate cables. For, so you, you not only have greater loads and greater lengths, but actually less section of materials per, per given load. I saw that we are approaching, because there's no, there's no limit ratio of length to cross-section and tension, that we were approaching infinite length and no cross-section at all. And I said, is that talking nonsense? I said, let, let, well, because tension goes in, tends to occur arcs of very large radius, I better then think about some very big systems. So let's think celestial here. Let's think in, the, for instance, just the Earth and the Moon. And I see we can fly a little airplane right through the, the line between the center of gravity of the Moon and the center of gravity of the Earth, and nothing happens. You don't sever anything. In fact, this, this turned out then to be the scheme of the universe where nature did, was using discontinuous compression and only continuous tension, which was invisible to you and I because of this extraordinary mass interaction which is invisible, which made it so perplexing what those, what those <coughs> planets were doing to, to the early observers. <coughs> now, <coughs> now, may I have some, some water? <coughs> Can you bring me a piece of paper? You're going to have to have a little blemish here. <laughs> So, there's a piece of paper. I'm sorry, you better make a cut. Thank you.
badly than the great structural scheme of universe I found these enormous masses interacting one another, the Earth and the Moon, with these enormous distances between them. Then thinking a little more about what you and I have just reviewed about compression and tension, I will notice then that when I lope a column, I must try to stay on neutral axis, so it will not tend to bend one way or the other. And I see that loading that compression column, it tends to be more and more of a cigar. And finally, if I keep loading it on the press, it's finally going to get to be a sphere. And the spherical moment, something extraordinary happens because any any axis is neutral axis. Up to this time, there have been only one neutral axis. But suddenly, any axis is neutral axis. So that we found that ball bearings, <laughs> spherical, seal balls became the best compression members man had ever invented. So they carry these enormous loads and just continually distribute their loads so any aspect is neutral axis, so any aspect will do. And they're continually serving as they roll them around. So I found that nature was compressionally optimal and in the spherical. So then I said, here's the scheme, here's, here's that earth, is a sphere, and the moon is a sphere, and the moon is, the sun is a sphere, and again, the atoms, all of the, what nature has is islands of spherical compression in a sea of comprehensive tensions. So we have then what we call discontinuous compression and continuous tensions. There's the scheme of nature, and man was not building his building that way, man was building tally Compression on compression, brick on brick. <laughs> Didn't see anything of any other kind of logic. This made me wonder whether it would be possible to make discontinuous compression, continuous tension structures. That's really what opened up this whole field. There are great many people now dealing these structures, but I call them tensional integrities. <laughs> the integrity is, is, is in the tension, because it is continuous, comes back to itself. It's always closed system. If they open, it, then it'll make trouble. There must be closed systems. And so, and then I shorten the words tensional integrity down to tensegrity. So these, we call these tensegrity structures. Absolutely even distribution, so they t they sound the same sound when when you're trying. If you tighten one of them, they'll all tighten absolutely evenly. And that's like any pneumatic ball. <clears throat> when you when you fill the whole ball, all the loads distribute absolutely evenly to all all the pencil enclosure. Now these are the uh, these are balls, <laughs> but you can see the holes in them. <laughs> all balls do have holes, and they're too small for the gases molecules to get out. <laughs> they're full of holes. Uh, so this this is simply a, a really a pneumatic structure. We'll go into that just a little bit more. But mainly I want to get to nature's scheme of discontinuous compression, continuous tension. Nature is tense, uses tensegrity. <clears throat> and I find then, and nothing could really make clear to me the degree of inefficiency that is imposed by man's non-synergetic thinking and his feelings you have to have brick on brick, the stone on stone on stone. This taught me that I could possibly do much more in closing and be much more effective structurally employing the omnitriangulation, paying attention to all the things I've gone into with you about quantums of, of energy in the structures, the six vectors doing that, which of each one being push and pull, that the 12 are always there. Because they're both positive and negative, each one of those six. So there's a fundamental twelveness there. Yeah. Now, I'm going to go into another mental exercise with you regarding schemes of, of structuring of universe, and I'll. I began to think then about, for instance, just the, the I, I always find social 
social insights that seem to accrue to to terminal con information such as I'm giving you. Where we, we do find out what is the optimum that the sphere gets then to be the optimum for compression. And the tension going unlimited to no, no cross-section at all. <laughs> and this is really the whole scheme of our universe. That is our gravitational interaction. Uh, I find that, first it's, it is very interesting that in the regeneration of human life, the general design of the of the human beings of the female and the male. I find the female having then the eggs within her, and the eggs are fertilized within her, that the new life of the female continually comes out of the female. She she opens up and then, and a new life comes out of that life and a new life comes out of that life. This is not undissimilar. In fact, it is, it is the same principle that was discovered by. Goethe, the German poet, scientist, very much of, a, of an expert in a number of scientific subjects, but he, he was the first to point out that the <coughs> vegetation, that the tree, is a wave phenomena. Phenomena. I'm going to bring together several things now that Goethe did not. <laughs> But you and I can do, put together from the experiences we've already had in this room, where we came to the discovery of a tetrahedron being the the simplest structural system in the universe. And I want you to think now about, for instance, a Greek column, and think about the, putting this piece of stone on a lathe and ro ro revolving it in order to get it round. They had different tricks of making them round. So the top of the column is the same diameter disc as the bottom of the column. I'm talking about any one piece of that stone. Now the fact is, the, that stone has very high compressive capability. And we found that it had 50,000 pounds to the square inch. Supposing our 50,000 pounds, that is 25 tons. I would like to carry a 25 ton load and I have a great section of, of, a, of a column, one piece of stone has been made in, even, it's a cylinder, a cylinder of stone. And I find that what I can do is to, I have a load of 25 tons, so if I just mark off in the center of the top of the cylinder a one inch di a diameter of an area that has one square inch. Then I'm going to take that stone from that top and, and then going down to its base. I can keep shearing off till I get a cone, <laughs> cone of stone. And there's, there's at the top there enough cross section to take care of the 25 tons. All the rest, the rest of it gets stronger and stronger. But because it has keep the base, it is stable <laughs> as, as, as the tetrahedron is. The three, the three point landing. This is very important. We've got to think about that row. Think about that row. If I have this standing by itself, it tips over like that. If I have two of them standing, they can tip over towards each other. They might tip anyway, but I can let them tip towards each other. And if I do that, I wish I had another stick. I'm going to just do it with my arms. Here's a column and another column on my knees, and they fall towards each other. Now, they have two points on the ground that act like a hinge. <laughs> they can fall this way, that way, but only in a plane. Before, they could fall any direction. Now, they can only fall, articulate in a plane. Now, I'm going to have a third column. The <laughs> third of them are loose like that. Two of them fell together, and the third one fell towards them, and suddenly they come together and get that tripod. And for the first time, we have stable. As they, we have the, we cannot have the stability until there are the three of them. Those are then the three legs by tetrahedron, but they, as you load them, they want the thrust to come apart. So we find we have a tension, three tension members are, are a finite or closure. You must actually be close, close the ring at the bottom, and they can't come apart anymore. So we have the three compression thrusts and the three tensions keeping them trusting. trusting. So we have in the, that stone, Cone now, I have enough compressive strength for the 25 tons, which is a whole lot. We could be a big 25 ton truck, a very big truck. And we can carry it, and I simply chisel well over us, that stone is unnecessary. 
the, the base was wide enough then to give me that three-point stability. So it's a cone, and I find I can go even further. I can pick three points on the base, 120 degrees apart, and I can then massage away, cut away the, the cone to less than a tetrahedron. And I have all the stability and all the compressive strength. It finally gets down to a tetrahedron. Now, the Greek column, they roll out, and it sets empirically that's deep in with you. <laughs> and human beings are just fooling around with sticks and coming to tripods and so forth, they did long ago, and campfires and so forth, and what they can do with pieces of wood, and these twigs, twigs. <laughs> then there's a necessity from time to time for the, the load that you're going to carry is more than just that 25 tons, so you want a wider section. <laughs> so we really can get that with an octahedron. Remember, the, oct the tetrahedron then had a the beautiful wide base for its stability <laughs> this way, but the octahedron has an equal triangle at the top. <laughs> so if we had a, a full load which we want to be used this much as a cross-section, we could use the octahedron and it would take care of both because then we find the octahedron a very interesting set of conditions. Here's a load. These two are fallen towards each other. We have all those set of hinges in there. And these, everything is in an optimum position of comfort about the thrust so that we really have two cones or two tetra point to point <laughs> producing this kind of instability. <clears throat> now, I want to introduce then the this stabilization of columns and the tetrahedron and, and give you a little feeling about, I said, the poet Gilbert introducing wave phenomena into concept in a tree and the Goethe didn't talk about the tetrahedron. <clears throat> but I I've, I've point out to you that if we all trees grow, there is actually then the top of the tree of this year, and we have the cambium lower. So each one is a, is a cone around. So the next year is a cone on the outside of that cone, series of cones. And in fact, we find that if, they, if you still do a pair away, and the tree does, many of the trees you find is literally the tetrahedron there. There are three main roots going out like that. And there's three facets here coming really to a cone. So the next year is a little larger tetrahedron on top of it, and another tetrahedron on top of it. We then get to where the branches <coughs> are also tetrahedral, have something called the wing root. And the, the bottom of the wing, you have, you have the two points at the top of the, of the, the hinge part, and then this, the member coming down near the bottom, and the wing root. This is just a tetrahedron, <laughs> one point down and two on the top for the hinge. That is wing root of all, of, of all, of all great branches of trees. So we have a, a cone split, coming out from a cone. <laughs> so we have <coughs> coming out of the, out of the, this, this total surface here, the cambium layer, suddenly breaks open into a new tetrahedron going out of this branch. And on that branch, breaks open a new tetrahedron again, keeps opening up. The inside is coming out. <laughs> And it gets to be a twig. And then on the end of that twig, you see the butt. And the butt keeps opening up, and the leaves coming out. And out of it comes on the, the blossom. And then center of the blossom and gets fertilized. There's a fruit. Finally, out of the fruit comes a seed. And finally, it goes off. But good to point out, this whole thing is a wave thing, opening from inside out. I'm out. I want to bring back then, I spoke about the female. And the new life is on the inside, continually coming out. And the new life comes out of the next female. Is a continual opening up wave. I, I also then point out to you the difference between the male and the female. Because <laughs> the male then <coughs> becomes disconnected, discontinuous. He comes islanded. He's a hunter. The female and her young, so forth, are in great continuity, that family. But the, the male get, goes off to be the hunter, the fighter. He's islanded. She, she is central. It's really very fundamental in, in social behavior. <coughs> now, I just, I just personally find that the woman is tensive, just, just fundamentally, just the, the, the act, the sex act. She, she pulls in, and the, and the man is, is compressive. 
he thrusts, she pulls. And it's just very fundamental to what we call being female is to pull, to walk away, to, to attract. Find the, the, the male tending to, to do this, to, 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 to punch. She, she does the other way. I, I, I can't help but find it very important to make notice, notice these things this, this way. I, I don't see any pure males or pure females in human beings, so there are all kinds of, the, uh, 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 often males can get be quite attractive as well. They, they do have the attraction, but the point is that there, uh, it, it, there seems to be a predominant predominance of, of, of this time and has something to do with the great great integrities of the fundamental complementarity I gave you yesterday where we only just learned in, in, the, in, the, in our last less than a, less than, a, than, than a 20 years less than a score of years that the complementarity is, is, is dissimilar it is not mirror image mirror image <laughs> so this, this, the unity is plural and at minimum two I began to find to be a very fundamental way of thinking and that was a phrase I began to adopt long, long ago. And I was told at the time of World War II when the Manhattan Project came along and physics was, was trying to understand a great deal that my use of the words, this phrase, that your, your, plural, your unity is plural and minimum two, was then ventured into by the quantum physicists and they found it suddenly opening up all the doors. They had to get in that fundamental tubus. Fundamental tubus. Now, <clears throat> you must be experiencing, you are experiencing with me a sense of the incredible interrelatedness of our, of our total experience. And yet the, the apprehending, comprehending, incisive comprehending of, of the differential, of the inner complementations. I'm going to go a little more into that tensegrity and think about it. I find <coughs> it, it's been extremely interesting to me in my experience with, with the structures and humanity and their building that the only reason that geodesic domes do what they do as they carry they get in enormous pans that we've not been able to get into before <coughs> the largest clear spans of, of man have been way transcended by the, by the geodesics and they apparently can go on to any size because they are tensionally cohered and compression is discontinuous in the fundamental principle of, of the structuring itself so that tension has no limit to size, just that we can have the interrelationship of the, of the galaxies at, at the, those millions, billions of light years even apart, and still have the, the tensile integrity. So there's no limit to size of tensegrity structures. All the engineering of society built then on brick, on brick is entirely a compressional strategy. strategy. Engineering as taught, structural engineering as taught, is a compressional strategy. And we, they, it is thought in the terms of the Earth being a compressional unit. You dig a hole in the Earth and you take a solid compression column and you put it down the hole and you fill your Earth in again. Now you simply have sort of formalized compressional extension. And you find that that mass that is standing there can also, that if you got to hold the ends of it, as the wind will, acts like a lever and can pry it loose. So what man then did, having developed a compressional continuity of the earth and a compressional column, he then took tension stays, a minimum of three, and suddenly found they, they could offset the wind with that tension, tensional member come, making the, our friend the tripod with intention, intention. <coughs> and we find then men building boats, so they had a solid, they thought of the boat as a solid compression continuity. They stepped the mass and they then put tension stays. Compression is primary and tension is secondary, a helper. The mass will stand up all right by itself, but if you can really put wind loads, take great wind loads in your sail, then you have to have the tension stays to give it greater advantage. 
So the enormous numbers of those stays at, at every level in the great square riggers, you see, set of stays get, making short mass sections because between the sets of stays is a full column length. <coughs> now, as you look at square riggers, then you begin to feel, feel the, the tension and compression logic that I've been giving to you. Giving to you. Now, in thinking about then the engineering that I have experienced where there have been a number of large buildings to be built with geodesics. And I, all of them have to, if they're big buildings, they all have to be processed by engineers. I have to bring in consulting engineers who are certified for that particular purpose. And I've been able to get some extremely good ones in, in, in Boston, Cambridge. That, and they've gone through a great many buildings with me. And we have to then go through building departments and meeting with the engineers who check the, the work that's going to be installed. But the, the engineering logic then requires a complete, pay no attention to anything but a compressional continuity. As I said, tension can be a helper, but it's a compressional logic. It is not a tensional logic with, with compression as local, help, local helper which is the way the universe is put together, both mac microcosmically, macrocosmically. <clears throat> the engineers who work with me now really finally come to realize that, that the 10th segment structure is, a, is the explanation of the geodesics, but it's not in the engineering teaching as yet, it's not in any of the codes, and therefore it cannot be participated in. This made, made me realize I could get into very much lighter buildings, lighter buildings. But I wanted to get the engineers into a strategic position to be able to take advantage of the ten segregate. <clears throat> and I have recently written a paper, and here's the paper that I think will greatly help, because we can go over to another form of engineering, which is called pneumatic engineering, hydraulic engineering. Some fundamental qualities now that we're going to find again regarding structures and, and our minimum or basic structural systems of universe of yesterday. I want you to think of our, our tetrahedron again, our friend tetrahedron. I'm going to take two tetrahedra. There could be an octahedron and a tetrahedron. They could maybe join something like that. I could have then two of them. This is the hinge. This would be a universal joint. <laughs> As long as there's not enough, some kind of pull between them, there's a massive fraction, so they can't come apart, so it acts very universally. Now I have a hinge that can only do this. If I have three of them touching each other, now it becomes rigid <laughs> for the first time. Lin Linus Pauling, great chemist, received the Nobel Prize twice, once at Peace Prize, but the, the first time was as a, as a chemist. And no, the, Linus Pauling's Nobel Laureate paper reviews the history of chemical structures, with chemical structures. <clears throat> and he goes back to the first one of the chemists who had noted certain, just like the early, early human beings noting that five lights in the sky behave a little differently from the others. We have chemists then noticing in the in organic chemistry, certain things going on, where there seem to be an abundance of numbers one, two, three, and four in relative proportions of the way things are associating, disassociating. A man, Frankland, and and it was he he was a relatively short time ago, just the just the end of the 18th century, and early in the 19th century we then have and Kepkele and Cooper, and they make a little more of a discovery of the relation to that oneness, twoness, threeness, and fourness. Then there comes a, a Russian scientist operating in France <coughs> named Butlerev. Butlerev was the first to ever use the words chemical structure, and he related them to the oneness, twoness, threeness, and fourness. And he spoke about these as bonds, and being in France, the bonds were the word valence. And they were single valence, univalent, and bivalent, and trivalent, and quadrivalent. Now this valency, then incidentally, there was a 35-year hiatus, no more progress in chemical structures after Butlerev. Suddenly, a man named Van Hoff, uh, a Dutchman, 
came along, and he said he thought that the oneness, twoness, threeness, and fourness had to do with the tetrahedron, four, four, four points and, and four faces. He was called by all the chemists and other scientists, Charlton, a, 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 a rogue. He was called every horrid name you could call a, a human being. And he was, he was not daunted. He went on. He was able to give optical proof of the tetrahedral configuration of carbon as the first chemist in history to receive the Nobel Prize. Uh, we have then the tetrahedron suddenly entering into our chemistry here and, and our phenomenon of bonds and valences. So I'll simply give you then, this would be univalent, this is bivalent, trivalent, of all four of them together, the two tetrahedrons nesting in one another, congruent with one another, and that's quadrivalent. And really the difference between a carbon, I gave you yesterday, it took the vector, the vector equilibrium and turned it into four tetrahedra congruent with one another, do you remember? It was quadrivalent, and this is like the difference between carbon, soft carbon, and carbonous diamond, when it gets to be quadrivalent. We have then, I mentioned yesterday, in, in the grand synergetic strategies of the known behavior of the whole, the known behavior of some of the past, finding about others and going through the Greek triangle, and then Euler's beautiful topology. Then I said, Willard Gibbs introducing in chemistry the phase rule where, the, where he has a relationship between chemistry and its liquid, its crystalline, and its gaseous state. And we found that Willard Gibbs' phase rule had to do somewhere and same, it looked like the same kind of a formula as Euler's. This plus this equals this plus two. <coughs> and I'll then give you that the liquids, I want to go in the, in the, in the gases. I'm going to take the number of tetrahedra, the same size like this, and I'm going to fasten the tetrahedra together corner to corner. So this tetrahedron touches one another. And then the next corner here goes to another tetrahedron. They're continually interlinked as each tetrahedron touches one other, each corner touches just one other corner. If you do that and make a model, you find there's a whole lot of space in between them, and 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 they will flop around as a total aggregate, and and they will fold into one another. They're, they act very much the way these are the way gases. Gases are highly compressible. There there is an interlinkage, there is a viscosity, there is an integrity, but highly compressible. But the the gases distribute their loads, do the flexibility. All loads are immediately distributed. So they have air in a tire, or air in a balloon, or air in a football, and just punch it one place, and that air immediately distributes the load to all of the tensile enclosure, absolutely evenly. So a great truck can have only very few pounds of pressure in the air inside, because it distributes it so perfectly to the whole load. And the bigger the casing, then the more tensile surface it distributes to. So <coughs> we find then, Pneumatics consist of these univalences, univalences. I'm going to say take the tetrahedron and fasten each one to, to another tetrahedron, but two of them touching, the hinge between them. When I do that, I'm going to go and get the, the tetrahedron in the corner. I don't know that I can reach there. find each one of these tetrahedrons in here, the tetrahedron in here, are touching another tetrahedron at two points. They are edge to edge with to one another. Here's a tetrahedron in here, and it's edge to edge with this tetrahedron here. When you do then, when it's edge to edge, then it makes a fills all space this way and seems to be very stable. <laughs> this is exactly like the liquids. The liquids are non-compressible. They are already in the form of the closest packing, so it can't be compressed any further. But because they are hinged together, the hinges transmit loads. <laughs> so liquids transmit any load at any one point is, as with the pneumatics, distributed to all of the tensile systems. They've been closed to the liquid. 
<coughs> then when we get to trivalent, then for the first time, they, there's no hinging, no union versus joint. They're absolutely rigid. <laughs> they no longer distribute loads. Now, these are the fundamental qualities. The crystalline just absolutely rigid, does not distribute loads. The liquids distribute the loads. And the gases distribute loads. But the gases are compressible and the liquids are not. This brings about a very important way to, important way to think. But I've got you now thinking about a tree as a set of, of tetrahedra, <laughs> coming out of tetrahedra <laughs> as basic structures. But also then we find what makes a tree able to do what trees can do. If you ever try to pick up any great weight, let's say, let's take a, a 30 or 40 pound suitcase and you try to out, hold it out horizontally <laughs> and you just find you can't do it. And yet you'll find a tree holding out a branch, and some of these branches, if you weigh them, get up to as much as five tons. Five tons horizontally in a great wind and, and yield to the, to the wind and not break off. It, it's fantastic structural capability. Man has never done anything like it before. Well, it's done by a very simple way because nature then has, in the crystalline, you have triple bond, therefore you have the greatest tension. The liquids have two bonds, they're a little more viscous, more tensile strength than the gases, only one bond, the compound. So that the greatest tensile strength is accomplished by, by the crystalline. Therefore, nature ships in a seed the instructions for further crystal production. And you produce the local crystals with the local waters and, and atmospheres and the local chemistries. So these crystals grow, and the crystals act as then sacks for liquid. And so the tree is just filled with the liquid. I gave you yesterday the tree also having to have roots so that it could not blow away when the, when the, when exposing all that leafage to, to, to take on the, the sun energy impoundment through photosynthesis. So that we had osmosis, and the water comes, it goes only one way, valving, both of the roots, into the tree to fill all these sacks. So the tree is using this, the, the, the crystalline entirely in tension to close the liquids. And the liquids then completely distribute the loads throughout the tree. They, they, they valve it out in the sky just bit by bit to turn it into more rain to come back and more trees to till more, more, more of this process can go on elsewhere. But the water is entrapped in there, therefore it distributes loads locally. So there's, there's then this absolute non-compressibility of the liquid and distributing those make that tree able to do this extraordinary task, do this extraordinary task. We get an ice storm, off comes the branch. It can no longer, goes crystalline, and cannot distribute itself. Men have not built any buildings in that way. They've used entirely as that crystalline continuity concept of, of, of compression on compression. So as yet, our building is incredibly inefficient. And so I'm now trying to understand a little about what goes on in tense security structures. And I will come then to the analogy with hydraulics and pneumatics of load distributing, because we do have continuous tension and discontinuous compression. Why don't you think about what goes on inside a sphere when you blow it up, <laughs> let's say it's a basketball be a balloon. You keep introducing more air. There are then molecules of the gases, and you're getting them crowded in there. Now, all these gases are full of fundamental kinetics, kinetic, and they, they continually going like this. Remember, every action having its reaction and resultant. So every, every little atom, molecule of gas that is going somewhere in there does it by shoving off from another molecule going the other way. Think about two swimmers. You probably have done swimming in a tank or rise and you dive and you get the other end and you double up your knees and shove off from there for the wall, go out again. But two swimmers can meet in the middle of the tank and shove off from each other's feet, like that, double up and then off they go, using the other one's initial. This would be typical with the way molecules are behaving in pneumatic structures. structures. Now, we find that the <coughs> molecules then are not simply going, they don't go to the center of the sphere and then explode outwardly. 
this would be a pulsative affair, take time and get it, and, and the, the thing would be vibrating like that. They're not doing that, they are ricocheting around inside. So if each one is starting to go this way, another one goes that way, and the two hit the wall. And they can't go any further, they push the wall outwardly, and then they bounce, ricochet off, and hit the wall again. So it came acting like little cords inside of the sphere. Of the sphere. Now, also they introduce another principle, which is dealing in great circles and spheres. And the word geodesic. Geodesic means the most economical relationship between events, between any two events. The great circles on spheres are geodesics. That is, the shorter distance between any two points in the sphere on the great circle than it is on any of the lesser circles. A great circle is defined as a line formed in the sphere by a plane going through, cutting through the center of the sphere. The equator is just such. Each of the planes of longitude go through the center of the sphere. So those are great circles. Circles. I want you to, we have then on here also lesser circles. We have the latitudes. They're not great circles. We come up here to 80 degrees north latitude. I'm going to take my dividers and open from the pole to the 80, 80 latitude. And I find that I strike this little circle. I got my dividers fixed in that opening, and I go down to the equator and put it on here and strike the same circle. So we have then the equator running like this and the circle superimposed on it. Where the circ little circle, the lesser circle crosses the big circle at A and B. And you find a much shorter distance between A and B on the equator than it is going off the detour at 90 degrees and then coming back this way. I just want you to, to visualize quickly the, how great circles are most economical between points on spheres, and the chords of great circles are even more economical. And nature always does the most economical. So we find that the molecules bouncing around inside the sphere will not go around in latitudes or lesser circles. They just automatically have to get into bouncing into great circles. That becomes very exciting to discover. So they're not just going around in layers. If they're going around in layers like this, this whole thing is flattened down very right, easily that way. And it has all this omnidirectional stability due to the fantasies of great circles. Now I get one great circle around here. And we find that every great circle crosses every other great circle at two points. So that this great circle longitude crosses then the other longitudes at the North and South Pole, always 180 degrees apart. I got a great circle here and another great circle there. Then I got suddenly a third great circle, the equator. And that makes a triangle. North Pole, crater, crater. Now we found two is unstable. And I, something I didn't say to you yesterday about the necklace and the triangle that I'd like to introduce right now because it's very, very relevant to the understanding about that triangle. I said, why and how did that necklace, consisting of three compression members, rigid, and three flexible tension corners, how and why did it stabilize this pattern? I find that any two of them coming together <laughs> are fastened one to the other. They're like a pair of two knives of a, sh of a pair of scissors with a common fulcrum, a lever. And the further you go out on the lever arm, the more effective those shears are. Therefore, if you want to have bolt cutter, you can come way out very long arms of good strong steel. So we find that each side of a triangle, compression member, is taking hold of the ends of the two levers, and with minimum effort, because it's on the end of the lever, stabilizing the opposite angle. It's very, really, very exciting to see how beautiful, again, this least effort that is being demonstrated by that that nectar's triangle. Coming back then to triangles and understanding it is the third side that stabilizes the opposite angle. So I had two great circles crossing each other and an unstable angle at the pole here. But the minute the crater crosses it, triangulates it, and immediately stabilizes it, because we have the, 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 these uh, interference patterns going on here, and this 
sets up a triangle. Then the fact that there's one triangle, then you find that automatically then makes I said I had the equator and I had these these two here and then suddenly got the equator. Suddenly you get the octahedron that shows up. It automatically makes the octahedron. So you get four triangles, eight eight triangles here. And these triangles, even though the first the first two may have been some odd angle like that, not not full ninety degrees, and the second is where the equator crossed maybe not. But because there's a very high frequency interference, here, they keep trying to average their whip back towards the, the octahedron. We find then this exact same thing happens with the icosahedron, where we have six great circles instead of the three uh, of the of the octahedron. And these six great circles, here they are, and they here here are the triangles where you can see them getting to the point they can't get any closer to the triangle can't go that way any further and it can't go the other way because here's a here is a triangle up here see this triangle and this triangle down here and these are gone spreading to the center of each of the center ground each of those triangles all the variables are in there these would then represent the ways in which I said the icosa gave you the most volume with the least energy investment so again this least effort to find then fundamentally the molecules of gas inside of a pneumatic structure get to doing exactly the pattern you're looking at here. This thing you're looking at incidentally is called in the British Museum the oldest toy known to man. This particular one came from from uh, Rangoon <coughs> and through the Thailand and Rangoon they, these are used instead of pneumatic balls and they, they play they play the right big and they hit the balls and they this, this, this bounce beautifully. Distributes those incredibly beautifully. So now I have here a very fascinating matter because I found that the pneumatic structures are producing icosahedronal great circle interaction patterns. <laughs> this hit me very hard in the end because it was a pure geodesic structure, and I received a letter and some photographs from two scientists of general dynamics quite a few years ago, and they were two scientists who were working on re-entry cone problems for the rocketry and, and space vehicles. And you get in this enormous heat of so re-entry, the frictions and so forth, they were trying to get into a, They were making experiments with titanium, which is where we know, you know, we get the greatest lightness and very, very high strength. And they made two hemispheres of sheet titanium. One uh, about a half inch less in radius than the other, or the other was an inch less in diameter. And they, uh, they, well, they had one concentric with the other. And they sealed up the base between the two, so there was a half inch space between the, these two hemispheres. Then with a pneumatic pump, vacuum pump, they pulled out the air existing between the two thin shells. This meant that uh, the bottom, the inside, the smaller shell, the atmosphere was able to get inside of it. And it came, coming inside of it, it then pushed the inner sphere outwardly, because the atmosphere came inside the sphere and pushed it out. But they exa exhausted the air between the two, therefore the same atmosphere on the outside of the outer sphere pushed it in. <laughs> and it dimpled in under absolute just this pattern, the, the pure icosahedron. <laughs> And they found that the, what we call the frequency of the modular subdivision depended on the relative thickness of the metal. If we increase, made the metal thinner, we got higher and higher frequency, tensegrity, icosahedral geodesics. They thought I'd be able to put it please. And of course it was. Now, what I'm coming to then, the way we, way we really explain geodesic structures must be hydraulically rather than, than as crystalline, because the crystalline structures do not distribute their loads, and, and these, these do. The, the very beauty of it being the fact that, that as I say, if you tense any one of them, they'll come out the same tuning all over. Next. We've got quite a lot of interconnection here today. We can then think of a universe in which there are great potentials for humanity, and we immediately have great insights that man is then 
accomplishing tasks it needs to do, building such as we're in here today, looking at our great cities, where I now know that, actually experimentally, that I can give you 300 buildings to run for, for, for the tasks they have to do against the best known alternate engineering strategy than just the one thing, 10 segregated spherical structures. Where spheres in their own right enclose the most volume with the least surface. You have to pay attention. <laughs> now, I, I hope, and I'm saying this right now in our meeting, because I want you to begin to feel with me as we explore more and more. Do you find openings all around? Because problems have been, you, you know, that are facing humanity. We begin to see there, there are options and outs that he is not employing. And you begin to add up those options and outs that it's not employing, you suddenly discover it's highly feasible to take care of all humanity at the highest standard anybody's ever known. And I know, and this is when I'm talking about big patterns, a little man on our planet, not working on cosmic accounting, but having started naked, helpless, ignorant, finding his way by trial and error, is still at a level, sort of average era of, of viewpoint, which is perfectly logical. There's no bad or good man in here. You can't get anywhere in your thinking if you, if you impute malevolence to, to, to individuals and so forth. I find then that he is, it is, it is then still assumed by humanity as self-evident that there's no and nearly enough life support to go around. So people are always worrying about that population of people are ends, worrying about all these other people coming around to jeopardize their, their, their peaceful stability or enjoyment of, of, their, of their advantage. We have then, because of the working assumption there's nowhere nearly enough to go around, this is why we have politics. Each political and politics are inherently biased. They simply say there's nowhere nearly enough ground, but I have the the most logical and fairest way of coping with fundamental inadequacy. It's a horrible matter. But if you come along with me, you're going to get a better chance of carrying on, and your family have a better chance of surviving. That's the only reason we have politics. And you're automatically take an absolute lethal bias is going to be your side or the other side. Gradually find man can do a little more, so he said, well, you and I get together, apparently both of us can get on all right, so we get a little larger groupings. And all of humanity finally enormous blocks of, of now th possibly three or four major groups saying, it has to be you and me. But, 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 but beginning now, even two great big ones, you and me. And for this reason, we do have then the great nations of the earth annually, for the last two decades, the United States, China, Russia, NATO alone, their appropriations annually, some total more than $200 billion a year, getting ready to kill. All the highest capabilities of man being focused on how do you, how do you kill. <coughs> the working assumption, there's never enough to go around for everybody, therefore there's no use in having social legislation. It, it, there's no expenditure you can make, you're going to take care of everybody. So you don't try to spend it that way. That way. <coughs> I wonder why. Politics can sometimes seem to be so cruel in, in not taking care of, of, of the, the public. So they say, there's just not enough. Well, well, <coughs> I now know, I really know very well, and I'm sure when you, you finish with me, you will, you, will, you will go out and do a lot of checking, but you, you will have gotten many, many insights in the direction where, where you could see what I'm saying could be true. I'll just give you something very simple in the relation then to that structure and environment controlling, man developing environment controls for humanity. Where you don't want to have something as an insulator, you want to have a prison. You don't want to have that Greek sphere and there's no traffic between the two. You want to have some kind of environment control through which what you need can come through when you want it. It's a sieve must be a valve <coughs> to them um, not try to insulate you. You need water to drink, <laughs> but you can't drink it all in the rain. So you want to have a holding pattern where you then in in interrupt, shunt, and hold, hold and valve into your presence in the magnitudes and frequencies that correspond with our needs, while also being utterly thoughtful of the rest of the ecological balance of all the other things that have to go on if life's going to, if human, human beings are going to go on. 
so that water can be very, very well handled. And just a holding pattern, because gravity is pulling it in, so, so you just don't let it move that fast. You run it through all the, the useful channels necessary. So I see then environment controlling is, is a valving phenomenon, which we I think is coming at us in all directions, like to have an omnidirectional environment valve that can cope with the various frequencies and magnitudes of the various of all the things we want to intercept and, and turn to advantage. It's a very different way of talking from the old architecture or something that's going to give you a distinction out on, on, on Main Street, whatever it may be. Or something you're going to make money out of. We're just talking about how do you make life work and, and trying to find out why humans are, being, are here and what we ought to be doing to abet why we're here and how we employ the principles we're discovering in the most effective manner. I think it's a good time for a break. We'll, if you don't mind, another just ten minute, ten minute phenomena. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start again at uh, two minutes after eight. So I <clears throat> talked about the grand strategies of all political systems, assuming it has to be you or me, and the enormous commitment towards the negative of the killing. And this really non, it's, it's opposite of synergetic, and it, it is really me or you, rather than realizing there could be something when you and I get together. It doesn't, doesn't make any such allowance. And <clears throat> I'm also gradually exposing to you grand strategies of nature's way of solving problems, showing that she has principles that are operating in the universe, that she always does things the most economical, she uses the most and the most efficient. And you and I, having been born naked and helpless and, and finding our way, d doing many inefficient things as we go, simply because we do have a prime built-in drive of hunger, procreative urge, thirst, curiosity, all these built in. We're giving this program so that we'll do it. And so we, we, we were, I say, quite clearly designed to make those mistakes, but also then designed to be able to discover principles and to discover that you can be more efficient and nature is using the most economical. So that as we begin to get a little closer to nature, which unquestionably means of getting considerably happier, that we're going to find ourselves getting considerably more efficient. And I just want to be aware of that as I talk. When I talk about the biggest kind of patterns, I introduced you yesterday the idea that nature is doing some very big things. Even uh, the society didn't know were going to happen. I've introduced you to society having a vanity, and once it happened, not really having the beautiful lesson it really could learn if it realized how completely it did not anticipate that. Therefore, it would, society would not be assuming it was having to find all the answers right away, that to realize the universe is getting along pretty well, and, and we may be able to check in. We may become members of of an operating system that where, where we begin to really consciously participate, employing our higher faculties to really get on with the universe. We may have such a function ahead, but we have not qualified yet. We're, we're, we're embryo, and I'd like you to keep feeling that as we go along, that as we go along. Also then, I'd like you to keep thinking about, on your own part, your own life, <laughs> what you begin to feel you might do with the, with the information that, that I'm finding you can do things more efficiently, more effectively. How can, what could you do to contribute to the total evolution of, of, of humanity and getting him ready for his, to operate competently in, in a high function in the universe by, by helping him, each individual, to, to, to a higher advantage, to be more efficient, to be spontaneously more efficient make it logical to be more efficient, to be enjoyable to be more, more efficient. Right, the more we really learn about big patterns and the more comprehensive we are, and the more we learn how these patterns operate, the more we can really anticipate how we could take advantage of the principles that are operative to bring them 
to ad advantage of, of humanity, to try to make human humanity a success, trying to make the whole ecological system a success, to begin to participate in what apparently nature is always doing, eternally regenerating. regenerating. So I finally have to use these words, comprehensive, anticipatory, design, science. I gave you science as setting order the facts of experience. I gave you give you design as as against the happening it happening to you where you do it deliberately, where using principles then employing order, we try to anticipate the needs of humanity, anticipate the needs of nature in general, try to anticipate the accommodation of the total intercomplementarity. And using these principles then to actually begin to participate in the evolutionary formulations of nature. But we don't just have to wait, have to take it for granted that somebody else is going to provide these things for us, somebody going else to invent. That each one of us has then an increasing intuition of an obligation to employ these principles in, in an effective manner on behalf of, of all of humanity and on behalf of, of, of the total integrity of the universe itself in its eternal regeneration. Now, Obviously, deliberately thinking about my strategies, and I'm operating entirely intuitively and spontaneously. And I'm really looking around to see if there's anything that I feel that just small points to make before going to another large scene. I'm now going to do a little reviewing of, as I did yesterday, what is it that I'm conscious of when I say I'm thinking. I'm now going to come down to, as I said, if we try to find one word, just one word alone that identifies our experience of phenomena called life, I'd say the number one word would be awareness. And I then also say no otherness, no awareness. There has to be something to be aware of. I find this very, very fundamental. And, and, and it relates very much to the, to the complementarity. And the otherness would be not exactly the same. <laughs> it could uh, bring about a, a tendency to differentiate as observer from the observed. I find it fascinating to think about awareness and say, no otherness, there's nothing, nothing to look at, there's no, 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 nothing to sense. <laughs> So uh, there would be no life under those circumstances. I want to think about a rather simple model here of I'm going to have an entity and I'm going to make it a spherical entity at the moment. It's an island, islanded entity. And it, 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 there's no aberration of force operating on it, so it tends to be spherical. And there is a, there is otherness, but it's, it's for the moment not aware of it. <laughs> Gradually, suddenly, there's mass into attractiveness, and then anotherness gets attracted. So we have another sphere <laughs> being pulled <laughs> towards the sphere, and there's this sort of a, a, aware that something is different in light that you're experiencing. There's something going on here. I think it'll be different. There's no shadow or anything for the moment. <laughs> I don't have any source of light. <laughs> but this otherness um, is mass attracted. Because the two spheres trying to come as close as they can together, the tangent, they begin roll around in one another. 
I seen, if you and I could see this from a distance, they would look like a dumbbell. It's just two spheres tangent. You would not know whether they're rolling on each other or not. <laughs> but you and I know if we take two spheres and put that, they just can roll around each other very, very readily. Now, a third otherness <laughs> is in the universe, and it gets attracted to the first two. And it is a third sphere, and it comes in. I just take a couple of spheres here to get this feeling. Let's run, get, get a feel of these, how they can roll around on each other. And now there's a third sphere that gets attracted. And it comes to touch one of these, and we have to roll around on it, and it gets into the valley between the two. And now it's suddenly equally attracted by both of them. And suddenly we have a triangle. And triangle, remember, has basic structure. So this has extraordinary stability. No longer can they roll anywhere around here because we find sure you've had experience with gears. <laughs> you have two gears of the same diameter, same number of teeth, and the part, you have one turning clockwise and, and they mashed and the other one's turning counterclockwise. They, they go along very nicely, very nicely. If we have four gears, <laughs> touching the train of gears are called, positive and negative, or positive and negative, everything just goes great. <laughs> but if I have odd numbers of gears, three for instance, these two, these these two can be going like that, <laughs> but then the one that comes in touch with here can't gratify both directions, going this way and that way, and they lock. <laughs> when we have odd numbers of gears in a train, they lock. <laughs> so we find these three spheres can no longer just roll around, each, but the one thing they can do. Notice this one touches two others here. So it, it can roll, it can roll in that valley like that, rolling around here. <laughs> what happens is that if this one does something, it, there's a friction here and makes the other one do it. So fine, all three of them begin to, like a ro rubber donut, they evolve like that. <laughs> they can do that very well. So the top is evolving outwardly and the bottom is turning inwardly. <laughs> So I could just call it kind of like a rubber donut can keep a going, donut can keep it going around. Now a fourth sphere appears in the universe. And it'll make a difference exactly what size it is. And it lands on here and rolls around here and gets this valley and then suddenly goes in the nest between the others. And once that fourth one is there, it locks it so it can no longer evolute in blue. So suddenly we find the fourth sphere is making the tetrahedron again, and suddenly it is structurally stable as the four interact to offset any 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 other freedoms of motion here. I just fun. I was asked about eight years ago to go to University of California at. Los Angeles, where they're having the art departments of all of the University of California branches along the coast annually have, choose one of them where they'll have an art festival they all come together at. I was asked to the art festival in Los Angeles and then they asked me, after having had a lecture, to, they want to have a happening. So we went into, they, they got a big field house and I brought a great many Spheres, the styrofoam spheres, uh, skewers, toothpicks, and, and rope <laughs> string. And I started by having this, this in the universe. It doesn't see any other than this. It doesn't even know what it's doing. It's running around. I, I ran it was running around the floor of this thing like a, with one of the balls. And then the other one appears, and, and they get together. And had three, and then four of them locked together. It was a little 
child of a couple of the about two years old. And this child saw me doing this and ran out from her parents out on the floor and I was running around all these balls and the little child started picking him up and doing exactly the same things. It was really very interesting. This little two-year-old had, had found just what I was doing <laughs> to be just the way that his own curiosity made it behave. And <laughs> after the show was over, there were NBC had a team of cameramen and directors and so forth, and they, and they, they said, we've been waiting to over, so we, we're not, we want to make a movie picture of you. And I said, did you take, a, did you take that picture, the episode of that little child? <laughs> I said, of course not. And I said, well, you can't make any picture of me. <laughs> I'll give you an idea of my feeling about recordings, because I, I do care about the live and the way things really do happen, and, and I, I care a great deal about the way things go on in this room right here now. Now I'm going to point out that I was dealing here in spheres, and, and, and when, when I did the tetrahedron before, I, was, I had some points, and the four points had inter-attractiveness, inter and they did give me a system. Mm -hmm. They would find an insideness and outsideness. But we really came out things a little different way here, <laughs> way here. And then I can also, finding there's really sort of fundamental two-ness, I could really have had this sphere and this sphere could interconnect, and this sphere and this sphere could interconnect. And these spheres are just a little too large for my hands, that's the trouble. I'll but I have to now I take two of the two spheres and two spheres. <laughs> They're touching each other, the pairs, the dumbbells. What I want to do is to bring them together, <laughs> not to make a square, <laughs> but we have precession. The inner pull makes this precess actually makes it rotate. <laughs> 90 degrees, and suddenly these two then nest on these two. And you, as you look at the tetrahedron, made those, you've got two pairs of spheres, and there's a positive and a negative pair that really do this to each other. And they do this precessioning. And we'll learn later on that the, this is very important, this precessional association, things come together rotatively like that. Now, I'm going to also then come back to something I did talk a little about yesterday, the, the, the six edges of the tetrahedron as acting, uh, the six re represented one unit of quantum, these six vectors. And I made an experiment with my own personal body in relation to degrees of freedom, being brought up in a good community. I'm in a good school and I learned considerable about physics and so forth, chemistry. I was very intrigued by the concept of the interattractiveness of the masses and so forth. And I, I said, uh, also as I got into navigation in the Navy, if I'm looking at something like the Pleiades or looking at Andromeda, it's approximately just one little point. But you learn that that's a whole constellation that you're looking at incredible numbers of stars. But they're so far away that they appear to be one star. And, and thinking about then mass interattraction, so what I said, I, if they're pulling me, I don't think each of those stars separately, a million or a billion stars in there are pulling on me separately. They really would be, they're so far away that parallax sets in and they really in fact only one pull. We do have then in astronomy this phenomenon of parallax, and then it's continually operative where things do pair together. So I said, I wonder how many lines are pulling on me in the universe. <laughs> Though it's pulling on our Earth a little more so, but how many are pulling on me, or even say pulling on our Earth? Are they are each one of those stars that pulling separately, or do they do they group up <laughs> possibly in in the poles? And due to the fact that they're non-simultaneous, possibly the, the interpullings do, in, do integrate in some extraordinary kind of timing way of, of coming from different periods of time. So I, 
I said, uh, let me think about, I'm going to look at those stars, and I look out, can I see a hole in the stars, some place where it looked like I might, when I took, accelerate, I might go out and get away from all the stars, and I go further and further away from all the stars, and they finally just get, look like one. But there still would be mass into attraction. So I would be very much as if, like a ball on a, on a string, like we call a tether ball. We have a mast and a string and a, and a tennis ball on there, and, and you can hit it. That ball can go all kinds of ways. But the one thing you can do is get away from the universe. So there's just one restraint on us. But it, you can find it could make all kinds of shapes, and spheres, all kinds of, describe anything else. Yeah. Now, I'm going to say, I don't think, experience doesn't suggest to me that we really will find a hole through those stars, because I find when I get to a billion times a hundred billion stars that surround us, <laughs> that we now know of already. <laughs> if I were to take the numbers of atoms in this room surrounding me, it'd be in this pretty thick world, so you get into that kind of number. <laughs> so that I probably wouldn't find any hole on those stars. So much more likely that I might be able to take all the stars in the heavens and divide it, like looking, there is this, the Milky Way, I might take two halves of all the stars and sort of divide them into two teams so they pulled on me kind of evenly, kind of evenly. So I took my ball that had a string and I put another string on it. <laughs> and I fastened, got, got you to take a hold of one and I take the other. And so the ball is in the middle of it. It's like a ball in the middle of a violin string. <laughs> It could still move, but it can only move in a plane. You can make figures of eight and, and clover leaves and so forth, but in a plane. So I said, I don't think I really can divide those stars up even in that way. The more probably, I have to get more teams. I'm going to take three pulls on me. So I took a third string on this other uh, the ball is the middle between you and I. You take the third string and you pull it and pull it over there. Now I find it's, it acts. It can still move, but it's as if it's a ball in the middle of a drumhead. It can, it can oscillate only in a line. But for, interesting. One restraint allowed me to have sphericity, two restraints that made me a plane, and three restraints produces a line. So then I said, I'm going to pull, pull the drumhead one way. I put a fourth line on, on the ball, pull it vertically, and it suddenly seems to be immobilized, as if I muted the drum. Uh, pulling the, the, the uh, skin just one direction. But I made a model where I made a steel tetrahedron with four corners and had the four rods, thin steel rods, come into a central ball at the center of, of the center of gravity of the tetrahedron. And the steel ball, and I pulled those rods tight, they were very thin, so the slenderness ratio, and I found that the the, the ball, if I put a Stilson, a, a plumber's Stilson wrench on, on that ball, I could rotate it in place. It can, I could not move it towards, away from any of the four corners, but and locally you could rotate it. In fact, put it on several ways and kept rotating. So it was locally rotatable. Why? Because you found that any two of these rods were coming into the surface of the sphere, they were not coming to the center of the sphere. You couldn't get the center of the sphere. You're bound as long as there's any sphere there at all. You want one coming like that and one in here, so it made a trapezoid. There's a distance between where they hit the sphere. And a trapezoid is unstable as a four-sided figure. So I found that in order to stop it from doing any rotating like that locally, I had to take each of the four rods that came in and turn each one into three rods from four corners, and each one had to come in, tan the three came in tangentially, making in effect four tetrahedra coming in tangentially, and then for the first time it could not move, so some totally found 12 rods were necessary to, to, to completely, uh, to eliminate all degrees of freedom. Uh, I wanted to confirm that in another way, so I then began to think about a bicycle and a bicycle wheel. And bicycle wheels are fascinating because bicycle wheels manifest man getting into tensegrity in his structures. The old-fashioned solid wooden wheel, that's just a number of plates 
brought it together like that, one thing. Then we began to get what you call artillery wheels. You found you could put holes in the solid wheel. And instead of having us hold, you could deliver it. They have columns, a series of columns running between the outer rim and the hub. And the columns had to be then a, what you call a stout column, a short column, so they not get the, in the critical slenderness ratio, or they're bent, or they're bent. So each one is a pole, like pole vaulting, and as you go over, pole, pole over the bar, they'll give you another bar, and they keep going along on, 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 these, on these columns. Then we came the wire wheel, and the wire wheel is very different, because the, the load is the, the wagon, and the wagon then goes out to its, its, has its, its uh, spindles here in the hubs. And you want to support them at the hub. The wheel is there to do that. So in a wire wheel, you hang the load by a thin wire, which would otherwise bend with any compression on it, but you hang the load from the top of the wheel down to the hub. So if there was just one spoke, as the wheel went along, then you suddenly would, the whole thing would crash, would crash. We find then the, if you want to have your bicycle wheel with while light, you want it, you have an awful lot of weight to pump as you pump your automobile, you know, so you'd like to have the wheel weigh as little as possible, so you like to have the rim good and thin. And the thin, the rim is a mass, it's over a bent mass going around, coming back to the south, so that if I want to, what I want to do is to shorten up the unsupported length of rim. So I'm going to have a hub and one tension from the top down to the hub, and you have then go 120 degrees on the, on, the, on the wheel and have another spoke over here, another. So you've got three, three spokes now. They're, they're just wire spokes to the hub. But I find they act like that drum head. It, they'll oscillate, the whole thing will oscillate in the, in the wheel and completely unstable, unsteerable. So that won't do. So I see what I could do is to, if I had two, two skins on a drum head and I put a spacer in between the two, then you, you mute it, you can put, put it positive and negative, so I can have six spokes now, and three come from one side of the hub, uh, of the rim, into the hub, and, and three from the other side. So the three emanating from the end of the, out of the hub, but instead of having like this, have them turn like that. So they then have more, shorter sections of unsupported rim to stabilize it. Well, I found that that didn't work because as the, as the Six came into the hub. Again, they came in the way I have shown you the circle before. They came in forming a trapezoid. So there's a little section here, and the hub could could talk locally. I found I had to take each of the six came in there and break each one into two and have each one come in the pairs tangentially. One taking care of the rotation this way, and one taking the rotation that way. That way. Now it is perfectly possible to put of those six that I could only take two of them and, and cross them to take care of this talk, you say. But then you find if you do, you, un, uh, you unbalance this, the, the wheel has to have symmetry of, of, of structuring all the way through. And if you have an oddity like just one, one pair across to top this, then you find that she, she's going to wobble like that. She builds up what you call dy dynamic instability. So that it takes a minimum of 12 spokes <laughs> for a while. It really took a minimum of 12 restraints to, to immobilize me in the universe. So I find that these seem to be the, the six positive and the six negative of, my, of, the, of the same our old friend, the tetrahedron. But the tetrahedron then, can, as we saw it yesterday, can turn itself inside out. And so then this is the positive and the negative side of the same, same tetrahedron. I gave you yesterday the dimpling in of the, that this tetrahedron can turn itself inside out if it's a rubber legs. But I just move one vertex. Just one vertex I had to move, the legs are rubbery, it'll do that. Then. We looked at the octahedron and found the octahedron simply one half it nested back into the other half. And the icosahedron, there was a local dimpling, the local dimpling. As we get to even larger numbers of a... Could, could I have, have that, sir, please? I get to higher and higher frequency of triangular subdivision going beyond the icosahedron, which this does.
Then you find this gets to be what I call local dimpling, and the higher the frequency, the more local the dimpling. So we begin to understand then the tetrahedra turns out completely inside out, and here we're going to having less and less the fact that you get the positive and the negative here of, of the of the dimpling. Now, I want you to think in the largest possible context of our universe, and our universe which is continually transforming everywhere, but everywhere transforming at different rates. And I gave you the importing, exporting of energies of the, the Boltzmann effect, where Energies given off by this begin to form new, and they begin to be new, new local systems in the universe, new stars, and then they begin to gradually get to the point where instead of being, I use the word syntropic, in contradistinction to great second law of thermodynamics, entropy, entropic, where they're giving off energies, they're places where energies are being imported, and and not only imported but sought in and put into increasing order. And now I'm thinking about things in, in, a, in, a, in a very big kind of pattern and thinking about our own, our own, what it is you and I are experiencing. Recurring that, that yes, a year ago we had the Copernicus celebration of the 500th year since he realized that we were also on a planet where not and a platform in the middle of the universe, everything going around us. We come then to <coughs> the realization of the up little planet. It, it, there really is, a, and this is very important for you, theoretically, we now know then this is a little planet of the sun and many things that I talk about, very familiar to all of you. This is a well-known data. <coughs> but I want to point out to you that also, then there are these conditioned reflexes of humanity, where we've had explanations from people who love us very much, we love them very much, and we get to being told by the people who love us very much, you're going to find this very pleasant and so forth, it's going to be bad, developing all kinds of, of <coughs> prejudices and so forth, and fixities of reflexing. I have tried, I've had the advantage of speaking to bodies of, of distinguished scientists on, on a number of occasions. And I've always asked those scientists <coughs> if any of them can raise his hand and, and say, I do, I do not, I, I, when we, most people say they see the sun setting, that they do not see the sun setting, that they, that they, they see and feel the horizon of the earth to be rolling around to obscure the sun. All of them agree that they see the sun setting. And we all agree that, that science is known for 500 years that that's not what's going on. What's going on. So I want to point out there's a theory, complete difference between the theoretical knowledge that you have. So science and all society has greater theoretical knowledge, but the sensing is the way they reflex. And they've been told and conditioned for a very, very long time that the, the, the sun is going around the earth. And they also were thinking of, uh, they know they notice a sphere today, but we find humanity still talking and thinking flat earth. It still uses wide, wide world. It's, it's, to each local, local person, it's still really feeling this is a flat out here. And and there's some, some I know the people out in China are not upside down, but the point is, I feel this way. And because of it's a flat, it goes to infinity, therefore, what goes on locally is very important, and, you, and there's room to get rid of anything you don't like. And man's been operating that kind of way, in that kind of way. Has also been part of the experience of dealing infinity. Infinity's going to have a lot more resources to take the place of the ones you've already wasted and used up. Man's been very t tightly tied up to those conditioned reflexes. 
And as you begin to go along with me during these, these few days here together, I want you to always be deeply aware of those conditioned reflexes that are working against the, 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 the man's taking advantage of, of the theoretical knowledge we have, because I've been going to expose you to more and more discoveries of principles that are operative that could make it possible to make a man a great success, because I really, I really have now taken inventory of some totally of how much you need to have environmental control. We've taken inventory of how much energy we need to really carry on, enjoying having all humanity, enjoying all the earth, continually looking out for all the generations to come, and we find it highly feasible. But, but we, we see that humanity is tied up in, in patterns that do not make it very clear whether they're really going to, going to break through, whether they're going to overcome the condition of reflexes. Maybe there's a great many older people going to have to die before, before we really free ourselves. Maybe that's the evolutionary rate. We find nature does have her checks and balances, and she has gestation rates. She doesn't have any immediate anything. And each one has, and the, the bigger ones take the longer. The most important ones take the longest. So that what, what is going, the biggest way is you and I are trying to be as conscious as we can about how, how we participate and, and what, uh, what are the challenges to our employing this information on behalf of the others. Now, in this kind of a big patterning, I want to today to try to think about something I've mentioned two or three times, how and why, why human beings are here, why we're designed the way we are, why the biosphere and the, and the greater ecology system is, is designed the way it is, and why this little tiny planet with all this great complexity on board of it is, is present in our universe, and why the invisible you and I are an <coughs> incredible complex of, of beautiful technology. And that's a point that we, you might as well think about now and think about all through my talk, that technology is then the integrity of inter interrelationship, uh, interoperativeness of principles and the ability to accommodate the transformations and the, and the ability to complement and, and to it is it is a great enormous complexity of interaction of generalized principles which make possible an eternally regenerative universe. Where the principles are then always characterized by these degrees of freedom, with now known ninety-two regenerative chemical elements, and having discovered just in in, in, these, in this century that each one of those chemical elements, when incandescent, we said yesterday has a unique set of frequencies, electromagnetic frequencies they give off. These are invisible colors to you and I, invisible frequencies or that we don't have the tuning capability for, but they are, they are tunable and recognizable by photographic emulsions so that we have been able then to identify each one of them. And, and we have then these incredible behaviors of incredibly high frequencies, way beyond any sensing on your part or my part. And with every one of the events of the intertransformings, there are always six positive, six negative degrees of freedom. There, there are an enormous number of options of nature. Because I, I want you to just think about that pattern. I said with every event, there are always these six positive, six negative. If I were to make a drawing of that then. This is a game of chess, but it's an omnidirectional game of chess. And every time you get a move, you get six moves. And it's going to be in, in respect to a, an orderly universe. But so you have this move, and you can make, you go like that. You can go like that, that. And come back where you started, because you had six. <laughs> or you could, same six, you go like that, 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 that. You might be over here. There are extraordinary number of varieties of consequences. With every move, you can you go six. And they're not in a plane, because they can also then be this way. <laughs> As a consequence of the universe, having these 
six positive six negative degrees of freedom with every move, we have differentiation of positioning. And the very fact that there is differential in positioning and entities in our, in our sensing is, is, is accommodated by this. It means then there's so many of the varieties and options of choice of, uh, these are equally economical because nature is always most economical. These are the most economical vectors. So there's, there's the six positive, six negative, equally economical options at every event. <laughs> this, so it's anything but a yes, no, stop, go. Man tends to think linearly that he's going to get chopped into red light or a green light. But it's not that way at all. This is, it has so many degrees of freedom and you, the, the frequency at which the next move comes is so high that you can come out daisies, you can come out elephants, you can come out galaxies. This, this to me is, 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 is incredible that it has so much freedom that it seems to be absolutely free. There's a tendency man then talking about sort of a free will, but he, he does have all, all his physical options, he in effect can do anything. But some of the things will take longer than others. In effect, he can do anything, but any, they just take longer than others. Now, here's this human, here are we human beings in this kind of a pattern, and, and with the minds discovering those pits rules, and discovering that there's a plurality of them, they're all interaccommodative, and that they are, that a plurality of interaccommodative behaviors are, are designed, that we human beings discovered we're given the faculty to have access to some of the design of the un universe itself that we don't know any other phenomena having this capability makes me have to really pay a lot of attention to that human being here. I want to think a little more about those human beings. What do we know about them in relation to other living species? All other enormous number of organisms, botanical and, and zoological. And one thing I can say is the following, that all the other species have a, an evidence, very important integral equipment built into the organism, which gives special advantage in special environments. So maybe this particular kind of a vine that grows superbly in this particular area of the Amazon, but some kind of insect could do just extraordinary little, little things locally on special environments. There's just special equipment for it. So there's a very strange looking creature kind of that special equipment. So we find the bird then designed with integral rings for his real, his mate then is the air. He can, in gases, he can fly beautifully. But when he's not flying, he cannot divest himself of his wings. So the wings then, when he's trying to walk around, are quite encumbering. We find then all living species then having some of this integral equipment for special environments. We found a number of the, of the creatures with brains the way human beings have, and those brains are also sensing mechanisms, and they're, they're feeling. And the brains, as I said yesterday, always correlating and, 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 and integrating the information of the different senses. And human beings have larger brains than any of the others. They, they, can, they, can, they can put away and store information regarding more special case experiences than the others. But then they have, the human has that mind. We don't have any, any knowledge of any other creature having that kind of phenomenon. We don't find any evidence any of the creatures are deliberately employing principles. They are flying, they're low pressure, their wing is beautifully designed for them to do it, but they have not designed it that way. Now, what I find then that the humans are then given the capability to get enormous amounts of information and this ability to discover principles and to be really then very much at the center of things where the individual then discovers the principle of pressure differentials in gases, Bernoulli principle about the wing foil with the pressure difference, the negative lift. And human beings then in, can invent wings and they can make, produce those wings using other principles and alloys and so forth. They're able then to fly, put on wings and fly many times faster than the bird. 
and then when they're not using the wings to take them off and not be humble and let somebody else use their wings and they go wings can go from generation to generation the same organism can be used by others otherwise they begin to develop their own organism they they're given the we are given the capability the prior principles and actually participate in some way in the evolutionary events of the universe because we do produce these artifacts they do alter, alter the, the, the environmental behaviors but we're given that capability now again I said all universe is technology and uh, the technology is going on all the time and you don't know what makes your fingernail grow but it's a beautiful technology the fact you don't know or not familiar with that technology doesn't make it non-technology and um, I find human beings using the word technology today as if it's something very new and something just been introduced by a man and they find it bad simply because it, the technologies employed by man so far have in the ignorance of man thinking it has to be you or me been used selfishly trying to get special advantage from my side and particularly in developing weapons for just the killing but it's been used very very negatively this does not mean technology is, is bad so this, this hand can then do some very superb work, very advantageous to you and I, all the people here, I can do this terrible thing of, 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 of killing and breaking. So that it's the way human beings have used the technology has brought, that has been some inadequate and fearful, powerfully conditioned reflex misinformation that has made human beings misuse the technology. So I want to be sure we don't get caught in any trap where we say, I'm against technology or something like that, and I'm going to go back to pre-technology. You never will. As long as there's going to be a turnip growing there, that's incredible technology. And so that, that, that there simply is a matter of how do we employ it. Are we really thoughtful? Are we consider about all the other reciprocities that have to go on ecologically. Those are things. Are we considerate when they talk comprehensive anticipatory design science? We pay attention to what the universe is trying to do. Are we conserving the universe? Are we using the income energies? Are we using the permitted? Or are we, we really uh, trespassing and using up some of the equipment? It's a very different matter to, to use the, the energy and use the lever rather than burning the lever up in the fire. Fire. Now, next thing. Thinking about humans having these capabilities of using principles and being really the center of things, this also brings me to a very interesting realization that human beings are, being at the center is very different from being on some place, a position on a line or in a pipe. You could not really improve on the center. I hear people talking about possible genetics, uh, possible uh, uh, bad experiments be made by scientists in trying to alter the human being. All I know is there's no way you can really improve on the center. You can, if it's linear, you can make the man go, I jump a little higher. But uh, you, you could not get closer to the center than the center. And I, I really, our function is to be at the center of the information to, to discover the principles and deploy those principles. That's absolutely the way we function, we're at the center. And our whole, our whole thinking is that way, this omnidirectional observation. If man, if universe found it expedient to have human beings really specialists, she would have had them born with some, have a microscope on one eye and a telescope on the other, they could get on great. But uh, th that's not, we were not meant to be that way. We were meant to be then omni, omni medium, uh, omni direction, omni environment operative. And uh, we were given principles then to uh, permeate and, and occupy larger and larger environments to finally get off the board of our little tiny planets and get over to the to, to next uh, operating, that moon going around, the, the Earth like this going around, the sun together. So we got a ferry across between these fast moving objects. And we've been able to do that, and we're going to go much further. We're getting probing information much further. Quite clearly, human beings are some kind of a local universe operator with, with a mothership to operate from. And 
Now, putting together all I can about all the total information I've received, I've come to the working conclusion, as Einstein did, that energies given off here reassociate there, and we have to pay attention to the fact that the physicists have no experimental evidence of energy being either created being lost, which apparently is eternally regenerative, does go through negative and discontinuity phases and reappearing there. And we're dealing in t not in things anyway, where we discover we're dealing really in pure principle. <laughs> Where the physicist admits that there is no particle, he is dealing in events, and events in pure principle. And we get to where the information on, in the physics really gives us then positive and negative weights. And when we take the total of all the weights of physics, positive and negative, they're clearly identifiable today, they, 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 they all add up to zero that we're really dealing in absolutely pure principle. And there's some, something goes on in the, in the design of, of, of this universe, these principles are operative, that do, do give seemingly positional aberration by virtue of which there does seem to be difference of, of view of you and I, that each of us might, might be some kind of, of one way in which the universe may have come out, because the universe had all those options. Each one of us may be a very fast running hand, one way of playing the game of the universe. And so each thing does look, look a little different, each one of us. Then when I come to thinking about the thinking and about all the information we do have, I have to come to something I gave to you yesterday, that there are lags and rates of recall. Not only are there lags and rates of recall, but there are lags and, and rate of, of, of apprehending. You know, there's this double take. I did see something. That your, your sense it told you something first, but then turn there and see a little more and look a third time. Sure enough, there's somebody I know. But it, it, there's, there's lag in here. <laughs> lag in here. <laughs> the fact that there is lag <laughs> means we were never really right on <laughs> with the extraordinary velocity of things we were operating. That is, we're always a little out of, we're always a little out of phase with, with, with whatever the, 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 the really great principles are themselves that we are inher inherently aberrated. <laughs> and that we find uh, what begins to become very fascinating to get into, into synergetics and the, which are, are all the geometries that we have that we're, you'll be expecting with me here. And, and our book is, is just about to come out with, with the synergetics. Is synergetics is to discover that really nature has, has aberrational limits and she pulsates from the vector equilibrium <laughs> Uh, that's the absolute zero when uh, our aberration will never let us stay at the center. We cannot get to the pure center, but nature pulsates through the positive and negative from it into, into various degrees and, and all these different kinds of into transformer builders with very, very high frequency of doing it. So that our, what we have as an awareness is really one way of being sort of aware of the universe really checking up in its own principles. <laughs> And I'm trekking up in their own integrity of, of its holding together while it can aberrate. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a really quite a fascinating piece of thinking here as we come to the, that kind of a challenge, kind of a challenge. Now, in big pattern, we have the Boltzmann concept of the energies exporting and importing fortified by the Einsteinian feeling those energies are actually collected and bring about the scenario universe of the new new formulations of the and the dying off of the old, the, the comings apart and the comings together. In that such a pattern, which the science and particularly astronomers, astrophysicists have been very aware of for a long time, they have realized of course that all the stars are visible to you and I optically by virtue of being in trouble with all the energies they give off. <laughs> so they give us high notice of, of their presence by virtue of giving off. Then this would mean then that where energies are being imported and collected, <laughs> give off nothing. And there would be nothing for you and I to see. So we are only aware of the giving off parts. <laughs> but they assume there must be collecting parts in order to, to have the eternal regeneration. So, so well, the only possibility would be we'd bounce something off something, but everything's such motion that by the time the information comes back, you bounce something off something that that's, it's a, it's a many generations have gone by and somebody forgot to ever set something out there. But suddenly it became 
very interesting to realize that when you don't think about Earth as standing still in the, in the middle of the universe, when you really get your senses going along with your knowledge, that we are then a, a little collecting, we're an importing center of the universe, where the sun's radiation and this other star radiation is being impounded by the photosynthesis. Just think of that extraordinary matter, the energy is given off by the sun as we've been able to see in the most recent photographs we have from space with the least aberration of, of optical aberration. These extraordinary flames that are going out incredible distances but enormous irregularity. And the, you and I on our planet just far enough away so life doesn't get dehydrated and burned up by this enormous radiation. And the, the radiation coming through the atmosphere we would be burnt up if we get outside of it just nakedly, so they have to have all the spacesuits when you do go out there. But the the, the sun radiation is, is then refracted and bent by the by the Van Allen belt and by the ionosphere, bent enormously by the, uh, the atmosphere, and bent, in, bent into red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. So that then we get the, the they get the non non lethal <laughs> concentration, so the energy is being separated out and getting bent more by the waters of the earth. And and so many bendings that finally the sun radiation, instead of being bounced off reflectively off a polished ball, getting bent, 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 and impounded on, on our planet by that energy being caught as heat and heating up the waters of the, of the ocean. Three quarters of the earth being covered with water and water taking on heat and losing it Get letting it off more slowly than any other substance. So it's very stabilizing energy impounder of the water, stabilizing the heat operation around our Earth to such an extraordinary extent that the annual variations that you all know do not really add up to, to one degree Fahrenheit over, over, over very enormous periods of time. If it gets such little variation, you work towards an ice age, a little rather away, away from the ice age. Ice age. And so the we find then that the, within this extraordinary thermal balance, all that beautiful sun radiation would, would say the clouds there that get in the way, so that there's great irregularity of the of the receipts, and yet they get bent in the bent and get in this beautiful orderly heat. <laughs> Absolutely, so, so superbly balanced that you and I consisting very much of the same ingredients as, as the sea water that you and I, if in good health, no matter what our age, no matter what clothes we're wearing, no matter where we are geographically, if we're in good health, bipolar heat, 98, 6 tenths degrees Fahrenheit. That we're in incredible energy balance there. And just not only did nature make the tree hydraulically, but she makes you and I hydraulically. And, and so the, the beautiful firmness of our flesh is, is then that hydraulic pressure which is not compressible, so, and it distributes its load, so you know, I can run into all these things and not get hurt. And we're given them bipolar heat, that 98, 6 tenths degrees, so we won't freeze, so the, the load distributed can go on. And we're given, a, just think of the delicate balance we really are in here compared to the, the temperatures that are operative when you get, once you get out, outside that biosphere. Incredible piece of design. Now, finding us then, impounding the sun radiation and the vegetation impounding it for the human beings because the human beings can't do it, the mammals can't. And what they do is to take those random receipts because there's a cloud going by and so forth, different kind of intensity of the sun today. All those random receipts converted into beautiful or molecular structures. Incredible. This is exactly the opposite of entropy. Entropy is the increase of random element and here we are, syntropy, Syntropic, I use the word sin here as they do synergy and energy. There's syntropy and entropy. There's entropy coming apart in disorderly ways, syntropy coming together in increasingly orderly ways. We apparently had a syntropic center in the universe where then the vegetation having powers made this beautiful hydrocarbon molecules, then other biological could take it on. They continually multiply those beautiful hydrocarbon molecules and they get buried more and more deeply in the earth. You and I call it fossil fuels, but nature is bearing energy in an extraordinarily orderly manner, such a way that, as, as we find, you take out that petroleum, turn it into petrochemicals, you make incredible, absolute order, orderly controllability to come out any way in design. All this being impounded here. So we're, we're at a syntropic center of the universe. 
where sometime the energies would be being pounded against possibly becoming a star. And that would probably take, say, by the, by the general records indicate certainly another 10 billion years from now. For, as by this time, whatever you and I are, as local information handlers, we'll probably be very remote from, from, so it's difficult to rightfully become a star. The, in, in the general scheme of things, the, the rate at which we are learning to get around, this, this seems perfectly reasonable, perfectly reasonable. Now, I want to then think about we're on board of a syntropic center where energy is being collected and where the energy is being randomness is converted into orderliness by the biosphere, by everything around us. We keep finding, turning into order. And, and the biological growth is to make more order, to make more orderly babies, most extraordinary organisms. The, 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 the credibility of the beauty of all those designs, whether it's the atoms or the multiplying the atoms in pure principle. And all the behaviors are absolutely reliable here. Now, amongst then all the biologicals, as I said, the mammals cannot impound that sun radiation, and they can multiply the hydrocarbons and get to be pretty big and pretty fat, a big tree. Then the hydrocarbons don't get lost, even though the, the particular operation of that particular organism, we call it, they call it as life, meant to be there, but the hydrocarbons don't get lost. There's this syntropic process is really going on and going on in an extraordinary way, making better and better topsoil here. And we find that the, when we get to the topsoil of our Earth, the, the chemical elements that are present in the topsoil are not present deep within the Earth, but we find that the 92 regenerative chemical elements, 91 of them have been found on our Earth, but most of them are near the surface of the Earth. The great, the great large abundance of the high variety, relatively small ones, are near the surface. Apparently, as, as star recedes from, from, from the rest of, of the universe. When we go through the tail of a comet, we get as much as 100,000 tons of stardust a day being, being deposited on our surface of Earth. So here we are, a syntropic center, receiving some extraordinary inventory of equipment from the rest of the universe, and, uh, and gradually discovering about principles that are operative. And amongst then all the biologicals, we don't, we cannot multiply the hydrocarbon molecules as fast as trees or elephants. But what we can do, we have this extraordinary mind. And I said you last night, as we finished, what, what is common to all human beings of all history? Problem, problem, problem solving. We're here for problem solving. And we're able to solve it in principle, and none of the others can solve it in principle. That we have this access to the, that extraordinary design capability of the universe itself, gives us very, very, we, as far as we know, by far the most powerful syntropic function in the universe. Well, that is, that's, quite a, that's quite a responsibility. And that we, in our ignorance and our fear, looking out for two sides, get, can get into the negative of trying to kill, this seems very paradoxical. But I would think quite clearly we're getting to the point where this is not, it's so paradoxical it's about to cease. Otherwise, otherwise we, I spoke to you about our all coming out of some common room of permitted ignorance with enough cushion of resources by, by which, by trial and error, to make mistake out of mistake, to learn what we're learning. And, and this is, is a very extraordinary moment, I, I find, who suddenly there is all around the world literacy. This wasn't there when I was young. When Russia had its revolution, just, just yesterday, I, I, I was, I was, uh, see, I, I was, I was 22 years of age when the Russian revolution occurred. And, and they, they were more than 90% illiterate. They couldn't get anywhere without licking that literacy, first thing. All around the world, that literacy being licked. <laughs> And nobody knew we were going to have this radio and, and, and the beautiful diction and you have and, and gradually leveling out of words. How do you do say the words? So we get co the common speech is just proliferating everywhere. So we have an extraordinary intercommunicability and we, in, at the rate of which we're all processing information, learning about this principle is just incredible. It's just incredible. When I, when I was young, kids rarely got on into high school. <laughs> it was very, 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 some 1% could get them in high school. At times, they had to go off to jobs. See, 1929, and I'm, by then I'm, I'm 34 years of age, we, we were getting where something like 1% was getting into the high school and going on graduating from high school. 
There was a very small percentage of getting college. This all changed. We're getting where everybody is entitled to go in the, and to get all through the school and get into college, get a PhD. It's absolutely new a moment of a, a man on our planet. You should say, you're going to have to go to work just as soon as you can stand up down. <laughs> and then to, when, when I was young, there was still, in, in, in many places in the world, they were, kids are going to work in the mines at six, are going to work in the, in the, in the mills at six, or eight. But it's all changing. <laughs> now, just in my lifetime, we doubled life expectancy. <laughs> The, the, all the things have been said that are going to be absolutely fatal when I was young, probably all absolutely fatal. Never, another way to clear it. Mm -hmm. uh, meningitis, no way to cure it. Absolutely incurable. All these things have been incurable, and I said, we find we can cure <laughs> So I, I find an absolutely different set of conditions obtaining, and instead of then uh, a pharaoh being informed by a grand vizier and everybody else just follows what the whip does and tells them to do, we suddenly, then we got to nobles in, in, on the knowledge, then we got to where middle class in the, now everybody's in on it. This is a very extraordinary moment. That's really what, what our being here together is about, that, that I really feel inspired to do what I'm doing, that, the, that our host inspired, say, use this equipment to make some recording. This, we're supposed to be doing what we're doing here. That's what I feel, but an extraordinary reality of, 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 our, of our being here together. So thinking about then our, our function in the universe for this beautiful mind, I want to find a good working example of an analogy at a scale that you and I can comprehend. Because when you talk about an eternally regenerative universe, and of which we, you and I just in a very short amount of time have been able to take, get, it's just, I, I, remember when, I remember when Harlow Shapley first discovers a, a galaxy that there are galaxies other than our own. That's, this, this is, I was fully grown. And suddenly that we have now in over a billion galaxies actually photograph them. Incredible thing going on here, going on here. Now, it's trying to, and, and you and I just can't think. And, 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 and I was like, well, one reason I showed you last night, this, this, this picture of the, of this expanding f flame phenomena. Do you remember expanding at a rate where just a little over one day, it, it, its rate of expansion is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And yet it looks like st it stays absolutely no motion there. So we, can, we, we cannot really get the feeling. Our, our reflexes are not allowed to participate. If we really could, then we'd burn out if we got in there, that, that kind of information. So here we are in this extraordinary, beautiful biosphere with the operating conditions with a great delicacy and balance where you and I are then are hydraulically designed and so forth. I want you to think about a complex design accomplished by human beings. And I find the carelessness with people talk about a Boeing 747, you know, I, I, I've, I've flown that, they, they're no good. But a Boeing 747 is a very extraordinary device. And it goes through the sky, through the air, at a velocity equivalent to 10 times the velocity of a hurricane. Now the resistance in the air increases as a second power. So the ferocity, the actually engineering ferocity of interaction of that, that Boeing 747 with the environment is 100-fold the ferocity of a hurricane, as you and I experience it. Just multiply that 100-fold. And yet so superbly designed to say nice and shiny, nothing's even going on. No the man has been able to understand principles enough to really develop the alloys of those aluminums, uh, using those mass into attractive principles. Of, uh, to get to the point where he really doesn't know what a ring root is. When the Boeing 747 goes, they say it's a little bumpy, put it fast in your seat belts. It's a pretty big thing there, weighing 200 tons, and you say it's a little bumpy, 200 tons doing this. The fact when we go through, we're going through thermals, and, and the airs do not move horizontal to, to the earth, but they're going up, up and down, positive and negative, like this. We've got enormous columns. You're going through a thermal rising about 100 miles an hour this way, another, or we're going out 100, 200 miles sheer effect, because we're, it's a little bumpy. The actual stresses that are involved are equivalent to taking the Queen Mary over Niagara Falls and say a little bumpy at breakfast here this morning. 
that a man's been able to handle those kind of forces competently, to really master that much of information, Mr. Duke says, is incredible to me. Now, he's going to then bring this out of the sky, he's going to have 150 tons hit the earth at 150 miles an hour. That usually smashes the eggs, all right. When it comes down, there's music all playing, and everybody putting on their coat, and everybody paying no attention to the incredible capability. Now, the, that contact is something that goes on here. What goes first? The pneumatic tie is here first, distributing the load. <laughs> and then what happens? We got, we got hydraulic struts, <laughs> and, the, and the enormous pressure on the pushing water through an enormous system uh, using the frictions of the fr system. We distribute that load. That's the only place where man has really done the design, as nature has done, the designing a tree or a human being with, with hydraulics, only in the landing gear of that airplane. But by virtue of the hydraulic distribution of the loads and pneumatic distribution of the loads, we can do it. We can do it in that beautiful way. Now, That Boeing 747 flying through the sky, getting people safely from here to there, up at five, in order to be able to do it, you have there's almost a thousand instruments up at the phone. And those instruments are showing you, giving you every critical piece of information on that ship, exactly where, where all the stresses are, where the heats are, where the pressures are. Anything is going to be not to be even mildly critical where there could be any variability, that information comes up in the, on the dials. And alongside them are usually the second dial, where you can just move something and balance the needle in that one, and automation takes over where the beautiful metering going on, done by again man learning about the invisible kinds of behaviors of, 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 of atoms that they'll give us any, all kinds of electronic behaviors. So we get this under control. But every once in a while, there's a lack of information coming on in those dials. And the captain, chief pilot, got all this secretary, engineers and pilots, but the captain say, the, the information I come in, something's really gone wrong. <laughs> Go off automation everywhere. I've got to take over manual. And it takes over. And only by virtue, as a human being, having access to principles of the universe, can he save that ship. And every time, very often he does. I would then say, if I were designing an eternally regenerative universe, in contradiction to a little Boeing on a little planet Earth, an eternally regenerative universe with absolute disintegrity, so all the incredible technology that is operative, I think you would need local instrumentation, getting local sensing of what are the critical information. And you certainly need locally a monitor, like that pilot I've fired, who has access to great rules themselves, in order to be able to solve critical problems. And I think that's just what we're here for. We're here, and we're just at the point where we can really talk about it this way. It seems to keep merging. That's why we're here. We're used, we're meant to use every bit we have of these faculties of apprehending and comprehending and employing principles. That's what we're here for. Now, I want to, to go jump from that to thinking about something you spoke about earlier, humanity then committed to the concept nowhere nearly enough around, this is the non-thinking, bureaucracies, great governments are great bureaucracies, and great corporations are great bureaucracies, and there's a struggle in there of, of they call it in the company politics, bureaucracy politics, who's going to get the job, whose family are going to eat? whose family is going to be safe. And, you know, this is the rules, and you know how the boss thinks about that. You don't do your thinking. You just say, how, how do I play it safe? Safe. So I have an enormous amount of humanity on, on our end bureaucracy and not thinking. So this thinking capability we have is not being generally employed except by little children. And little children spontaneously start thinking ask most beautiful questions. And then they get they get told down in their mind, you better not do that, it's going to get the family in trouble, etc., etc., et and, and, and they get negative until... But each child is, is little less put upon in this manner because the information that is coming in is so absolutely contradictory to the 
traditional way of looking at things that the older world just can't explain it with, with conviction anymore. Yeah, you are wrong. And so the child is beginning to think freely, that freely. That, that really is typical of, of your generation. You are, are really doing your own. You're not endowed with something that the generation before didn't have, but the generation before I was brought up, my mother, my father died when I was very young. My mother said, darling, this man's saying a lot of trouble to talk to you. He's a great friend of your father. And I say, I didn't like what he said. My mother said, never mind what you think. Pay attention to this man. He does know what he's saying. He's taking a lot of trouble. And I was continually being told, never mind what you think. Pay attention. And I was being sent to the school where they're going to really show me. And so I continually found what I was thinking a little out from what I was being taught. So I assumed that I was just a freak. And I have to get on to myself as a freak. So I don't know how many, how many of you have really had to often think that way about yourself. But I said, I guess you had to live with a freak. With a freak. Now, you're just, just not being told anymore, uh, uh, never mind what you think. <laughs> and and you, you have the thinking capabilities always there, <laughs> and just not being discouraged so much. This, this is my, my biggest hope that we're going to make it here, is, is that this thinking is being manifested and, and really employed by, by the young world. And uh, it, it, will, it, will it get going fast enough to overcome the inertias and the bureaucracies and, and the fears and, and operative in those bureaucracies? It's, it's, it's a very touch and go question. Even though I now know that we have the option to make man, I really know how. I know what, the, what all the things we have to do design-wise to get there. That we'll do it. I have the slice idea. But I'm deeply moved as I begin to see one more manifest, a little more out for us in, in the, the newer freedoms of that young world. Because each child being born is being born in the presence of less misinformation. Each child being born in the presence of a lot more reliable information. And they're paying attention. So they're, 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 they're thinking with very good, good inputs of, of data. The, the, operation, the operation conditions are very, very much improved all the time. And each child a little better off. I can go at any point, the way, I, the way I'm talking to you, talking to the big panels, I could really digress and get in great details. you find me on structures, for instance, just getting down to the way the tree is designed or whatever it may be. I'm really quite deliberately avoiding going in any depth in, in these first days. I'm, I'm trying to, as I can, keep out the bigger concepts. And I, I hope you begin to share with me this concept of, of the function of human beings. Whether I'm really right or wrong, I don't have the slightest doubt. Of course, I don't know. But it is, does not seem to be, I don't find any argument against it. And I find it to be a very, very good argument for it. So that for the moment, I, I feel I can accept it as a hypothesis that it's reasonable that we are here then as problem solvers and, and that we're given particularly metaphysical problems to solve in principle. Therefore, we ever have to get more and more courage to really go along with principles and have, have less and less fear of upsetting the, the, the tradition and, and the game and, and be, be less and less afraid of those who are afraid. <laughs> now, I'm going to bring in one more that, that uh, I, a principle that I talked to you about, and this goes back to 1927 in, in, in my life when I was 30 years of age. And I became... I'd had, by good fortune, really an acceleration in finding out a great deal about what doesn't work. And I'd really been so enthusiastic about the people who love me and would tell me how to play the game. I tried to play the game, but I was not thinking. I was playing the game. And I learned to play the game very well, but then it came to really head, head on crash. And so that 1927, I had a, we had our second child born, our fourth, first child having died five years earlier at the age of four. And the loss of that first child was just an incredibly uh, sad matter. So suddenly a new child entrusted to us, and, and uh, we were penniless. And I really felt very strongly many of the things you heard me talking about here. I hadn't anywhere nearly the time to make the nice models that we have, uh, but, but my feelings were pretty strong in pure principle about these things existing. And I felt that Quite clearly, all my contemporaries were had on highest priority in their lives 
that they had to earn a living. They hoped they might earn it in a way that would be pleasant to them, but pleasant or not, you got to earn a living. That was very hard. Your generation is not, not all overwhelmed that way, but we were really overwhelmed by it to such an extent I didn't hear anybody even think of contradicting it. It seemed to be so obvious. It just took it that way. And it began to occur to me that this is really not so what we all ought to be doing is to say, what does my experience teach me needs to be attended to, and if not attended to, humanity will be in great trouble, and if attended to successfully, will bring great advantage to humanity. And what would I need to know more than I already know, other than having enough experience to realize it is so, what more do I need to know in order to be able to do something about it? And what, if I am going to do something about it, what is the nature of what I'm going to do about it? Am I just going to try to tell people it's there? Am I going to try to reform people? Uh, and I said, number one, here, here I am. Fact is, I am absolutely penniless. I have no credit. <laughs> and I, and I feel, feel and see these things. How do you carry on? I said, it could be that the little individual, the human being, really has a very great advantage over great corporations and great states. What can, the, what can the individual do that this corporation can't do? Corporations are legal entities. They can't, they can't do it with a human being. Number one, a corporation can't think. You know, only human beings can think. And I said, a, only a human being then can really operate on his own. He doesn't have to have anybody say yes or no. If he, if he really thinks and sees that so, he can act like that. And luckily he can. The time again, he can save the ship. But boy, he has to go fast. <laughs> and he has to operate in a very enormous confidence and principle. principle. Now, so I said, all right, I see then this earning a living is in the way. And one of the principles, but I, I was deeply moved by having been in regular Navy, been the early flying, so forth, really, of the employment of principles. I really have enormous confidence what you can do with principles. The principle of leverage, or the, and the absolute count on that mass into attraction, whatever it may be, attraction, whatever it may be. So, I've mentioned to you earlier the fact then that the human life on board of our planet, as mentioned earlier today, the concept of man possibly having a very important, really a very central function in the universe as a local monitor. Of problem solving, and in those terms, assuming that human beings are then necessary, needed, not here just to be pleased or displeased, not to do things just from the viewpoint of the ignorance of little man, but something to do with the great, great, the great wisdom of, of an extraordinary integrity of the universe. Then, assuming then that that pattern of human beings being necessary and useful to the universe, and the ability to have them on board, requiring then that they do be take on energy and take it on in socially with certain extraordinary ways, we would call it digestion, very coarse, crude words, what really goes on when we put energies inside and what goes on very rooting to glands, we don't know much about this. But the point is that in order to be able to have that carry on, to re-energize us and carry us so forth. We do have to have all this great ecological phenomena because we need radiation, we need energy to start off with, and mammals can't take it through the skin. So I've talked about that with you before. Vegetation having to impound the sun radiation, and vegetation having to be rooted, I give you all those reasons. And so then, with the vegetation all rooted, and this is then the vegetation rooted there, and the chemical process of the photosynthesis giving off various gases making other gases, but giving off gases. And the gases given off by the vegetation would soon occupy the whole of the atmosphere, and the vegetation would be able to carry on them more, because we'll have, it needs another kind of input gas. Therefore, all the mammals are designed to take in the gas that's given off by the vegetation and convert it, in, and we use what we want, and then we give, what we give off is what the vegetation needs. So this is incredible reciprocity design that human beings pay no attention to as they begin to open up real estate developments and knock down trees. Nobody's talking about this, about the, the respiratory gas-gas exchange 
It's not, not an end of calculating at all, or any town planning or engineers. Nobody. All right, we find then that vegetation rooted. And vegetation being rooted cannot reach other vegetation appropriately. And because it then can't reach it, then we have all the insects, butterflies, extraordinary creatures, worms, crawlers, flyers, swimmers, going back and forth between the vegetation, which do all the energy impounding, and going after something in that vegetation and inadvertently cross-pollinizing. So in order to have the whole thing regenerative, we had to have then all those creatures given chromosomic drives so that honeybee is designed to go out as honey. It goes into one flower after another and inadvertently knocks off pollen. Again, precessionally at 90 degrees. He goes this way and the result is this way. His, whether he gets honey or not is absolutely in Nature gives him that so he'll do, the, do this little trick. But the honey business is not. The big thing is to regenerate the total system. I find that the human beings being given hunger and thirst and all in, uh, go after them, their honey. And they inadvertently didn't mean to, but they, we had side effects again, 90 degrees to make babies over here. So then they got a responsibility of the baby, and also given a, a, an urge to look out for that young. So they got the side effects here bothering them a lot, and they got to get out more of that honey. And so they learned then, I can make grow peas, and he makes him shoes, and makes more shoes than he and I can grow more peas than I can eat. We want to exchange them. Get looking out for these side effect kids here. It makes an enormous amount of interchanges. So finally we sort of invent a, a unitary honey called money. So we go money bee. Everybody's always money bee and getting out earn that living. And inadvertently do some logical things. And because we are so preoccupied with fear, looking out for our young, and really I find primarily the fear of human beings is not for themselves. Human beings are really very brave. It really is is for those that they love and they, they really depend on them. That, then, they, then they really get very fearful. So we have then this fear in those human beings and doing this. And then, so then they produce guns, and that's not a very good idea. But in, in producing the gun, they really learn how to develop production capability. So they can produce non-gun, they can produce life support. And they begin to do some, being able to take care of a lot more people. All the great changes, the numbers of people really that has been advanced and the breakdown and the death rate, and the enormous increase in longevity, all these things are consequence of his doing the right things for the wrong reasons and, and this negative. To get, you had to get him going. So I, I, I have, don't find anything for any of these things that human beings have done and, uh, because, because I really see nature is in the fulfillment and that's not the, the, the eternal way of carrying on. It, it, is, it is part of the due process of humanity getting to where it can really function here. So then I see that what nature is really doing then is really precessional. <laughs> it is 90 degrees. As I said the other day, the effect of bodies in motion on other bodies in motion is to make them go into orbit and not to fall in. <laughs> fall in. <laughs> so this sort of going after, if you're falling into flowers and so forth, is at that 180 where the big thing's this way. So that's what, what man called this side effect that's the main effect, and, and, and this is a side effect. I said, for, what I see is now that nature is trying then to maintain a regenerative system. If then I give up altogether the idea of wasting my time, money, 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 honey, m m hunting, and I really commit myself to what needs to be done and begin to employ the principles, I may really find, since that's what nature really wants to have happen, I may find I'll get on. But I can't make bargains and nobody to write in a contract with me. <laughs> I've got to go on my intuition and my sense of the truth. I've got to really go on my mind. And I've got to continually say, is this as far as I'm supposed to go? I get frustrated. <laughs> or maybe that's as far as I'm supposed to go with this particular one. What is the next high priority? What are the to Learning then to, to move this one and move that one. And I've had to make incredible mistakes. But in 1927, I did deliberately undertake to carry on from there on, forget to ever again earning a living. And I had an absolutely, there's a new child. I assure you that my family, my friends, my wife's friends and family thought I was a really a, 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 an incredibly stupid and, and treacherous character. 
But but uh, and and it's not easy to get people to understand. It takes quite a lot of time to get to understand that precession, and to understand the kind of confidence I really had in it. But I said, if I can prove that the little, I'm just the right one to prove it. I want to prove what an average healthy human being can do with the fact that we are all given if he's really disembarrassed this nonsense of earning a living. In view of this sudden accumulation of information, which was very different in my day from what had been my father's day. I thought we're probably at a critical moment when we're supposed to be behaving differently. So I, we need to have somebody who is penniless make the experiments see if we can get on. So that's exactly what it did. That's exactly what it did. Uh, I, I, when I find myself being introduced to many audiences, because I do really meet thousands of them, and often be usually being introduced in very generous ways, being called names like genus. And I hurry to point out that everybody is born genus, and that if there's anything important about me at all is that I am a demonstration of what an average healthy human being can do if he's disembarrassed of the nonsense that he has to end a living and really commits himself to what the universe is trying to do. I'm, I'm now so confident, having been gone through this for almost half a century, and, I, and I'll show you that getting on was really di difficult, but it's a big, s slow cycle, and, and there's no place where you can ever say, that I'm being supported now for what I did there. <laughs> it's it absolutely, completely disconnect. <laughs> Simply a matter of acting in integrity, and you find somehow rather you get on. <laughs> there are a set of complete inadvertencies that begin to happen where somebody asks you, you were talking, you didn't know they're going to want you to talk, and they have very surprising fun to do it, so that takes care of this particular... You never had... You, you can't... It, it's anything but a capitalist kind of game of building up, but just that I find I'm willing to take care of more and more activity. My and income has increased and increased through all these years to really quite a large amount that goes through our books today, but I spend every bit of it. And I, I'm, I, but I must continually be spending it, what, trying to make judgments that this really might might get humanity somewhere. And, 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 and there are enormous numbers of young people who have very important ideas and, You've learned enough about is that one that really might 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 get humanity somewhere. So it, that's the kind of game I, I live in. Therefore, at this point in my life, I'm not. I don't feel that I'm being precious to a young world when I say you can really forget altogether earning a living, provided you really commit yourself to the other man. If you're doing something that's sort of make you feel good, if if, if you're really if you're playing an ego, you were like Mr. Paul, no, don't do this. You can only do this here. Really commit yourself, come, truly, syntropically, the idea, and, and synergetically. It has to be everybody and nobody. And really, uh, out and out. Well, I've, I've introduced to you lots of patterns, and I've then tried to explore principle, and, and I hope you. I think uh, I think I've had enough experience with what I'm talking about to say I can now eliminate this as being just a, a coincidence about this. Because, but I'll tell you, in learning, in being able to say that, I had to make many, many mistakes any number of times when I did get cold feet or somebody else getting cold feet on my behalf said, come over, take this job. And I Things always went wrong when you went off there. You had to really commit yourself absolutely to, to the complete deep end or, or it doesn't work. So you have to work in, in an incredible faith in the integrity of our universe. And, I, and I, I'm, when, I, when I began to have to do my own thinking, the number one question I had to ask myself was the following. I said, you've been taught to believe this and that. Your grandmother loved you the piece that she told me about somewhere down in Mesopotamia 2,000 years ago. I said, Don, you're too young to know. But, but I, there's been a relaying of people who do love and do want to be truthful, and this is the way it seems to be. And... I said, if I'm going to do my own thing, I've got to give up all the beliefs that I ever had. And I don't want to be unkindly to my condition reflex towards my, my mother, my grandmother, or people I really love to pieces. But I'm going to have to really question everything, come back to my own experiences, or to the experience of, of somebody who, it's my experience, is faithful and telling me about his experiences. Not what he believes, or what he asks me to believe, but what do we experience? We experience. So I said, all right, you have experienced all around you, all around the world, a fervor of human beings, a, a sense that there are all those churches and synagogues and, and enormous numbers of human beings who really feel apparently that something's going on, there's something going, something operating in the universe that's more important and more competent and more reliable than that. I said, if you're going to do your own, in your own experience, do you have any reason 
to have to assume there's a greater intellect and integrity operating in the universe than that of man. I said, if you want to really ask yourself that, I'm all around by it. Because I really have learned about leverage. I really have learned the mass attraction. I'm, I'm, and it's all whelmed at this because it can only be discovered intellectually. <laughs> it is entirely intellectual. <laughs> There's quite clearly there's a manifest of an extraordinary intellectual integrity operating in the universe. Nothing to do with any shape or form or anything. Completely, complete abstraction. It's, it's, it's just and that I, you and I can never quite get to the truth. We can say it a little better. Be, and the, but you don't want that. So you and I know of it, and we can be inspired by it. But so I, I, I made complete commitment then, back to 87, to this intellectual integrity of the universe. And I said, if I really shoot the works, the, the, uh, I don't know very deeply, if you keep your sensitivity, whether you're really on or not on. You're supposed to go this far, but when you stop and go, and what next may take up. I think this is, a, this is a very good time to, to stop tonight. I'll tell you that as we go on, I'm going to get in really quite depth. For instance, I, I gave you exposure to map. I don't show, didn't tell you how I designed this map and why it does not have the aberrations and, and the misinformation and, and the other, other methods of projection. I'll be able to show you exactly why it has the least possible Deformation. In going from spherical to flat, there is there is is, is aberration, but this has the the going again to limit case. It has the mm, mm, the most evenly distributed error. It's so, so much so, it's absolutely symmetrical. It's just that there is a there is there is no visible distortion in in this map. There is distortion, but it, I've been able to keep it in, in magnitudes that are sub visible. I have no, the principle to. So I'm I'm going to to say good night and and uh, I will I will keep searching and and uh, I didn't know how I didn't know what I was going to say the first time I haven't known really what I was going to say all I want the, I want the, everybody to realize the reality of this and I'm sure hope the picture doesn't take out a moment of thinking because I was thinking very hard in there and you were thinking hard. That's very much a part of this picture. And I am going to be able then to hold, hold this tapestry together. And now I've said enough so I really begin to see and think about other things that I know, and, and I will not be quite as slow in introducing them, but things are going to move really very rapidly as we get into details in various areas. I will then get over to this comprehensive and, uh, anticipatory design science and get into what it is you and I, what I've learned are the strategies that human little individual can employ to be, and how it can be most effective on behalf of his fellow human beings. So, good night.